Welcome to Old Time Rewind. I'm your host, Raven. Get comfy, get cozy. Tonight's rewind is Dragnet. <laughs> Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, this is the story of your police force in action. Dragnet. It was Tuesday, March 25th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. Detectives in Los Angeles work in pairs. My partner's Ben Romero. He's a sergeant, so am I. My name's Friday. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. I was on the way back from the record bureau, and it was 13 minutes past 11 when I got to room 42. Homicide. That's a hot shot. Somebody grab it. I got it, Ed. At 1245 East Ohini Street, one, two, four, two officers shot. At 1245 East Ohini Street, Ohini Street, two officers shot. What have you got, Friday? Read it. Two officers shot. Where's Romero? Right here, Skipper. Okay, you've got one to roll on. Get going. Both Ben and I knew where we were heading. We'd recognized the address. It was the Trapdoor Cafe, a joint in the south end of town that did business with a pretty rough crowd. Thirteen minutes later, we pulled up in front. Two patrolmen had the crowd pretty well pushed back. There was a cruiser car in front of the cafe. The car door was open, and an officer was sprawled across the seat. He was conscious but weak, and one of his pant legs was pretty red. Hello, Sergeant. Hi. How you doing? I've done better. Yeah, well, what happened? Williams and I were cruising. We've been keeping an eye on this cafe lately. Tonight, we decided to take a look. And just as we went in, two guys left in a hurry. The back door. We followed them out into the alley. It was dark out there, and I called to them. I said, hey, fellas, just a minute. I want to talk to you. They stopped? I'll say. One of them whirled. He had a gun in his left hand. He shot both of us. Left hand, huh? Williams went down and out. I went down, but I took a shot at them. No effect. Then I started crawling out here to the car so I could call in. You started crawling? Yeah. Wait a minute, Emerson. Weren't there any people around by that time? Oh, uh, yeah. Quite a few ran out after the shots. You mean nobody would help you to the car? That's right. Huh. Did you get a good look at either of the gunmen? Well, one of them was... Tall, I think he was a redhead. There was something funny about his nose. That's all I saw. It's too dark out there. Williams was closer. I think he got a good look. Joe, the other officer, Williams, he's in pretty bad shape. Is he breathing? He's still alive, Emerson. I don't know how much time he's got. Ambulance? On the way. Okay, let's round up all the men who are in the cafe. We're taking them in. We took all the men back to the city hall. There were 23 in the Trapdoor Cafe at the time of the shooting. We questioned all of them. One of them said there had been a redhead in the place, but he couldn't describe him. Ben and I left the interrogation room, and we went back to the squad room. Friday, Romero. Got a minute? Yeah, Ed. Come on, Ben. Uh, sit down. Okay. You got anything from those people you questioned? Nothing we could use. No. How's Williams? Pretty bad. When do they operate? As soon as he comes out of shock, probably in the morning. You boys will be there. Yeah, we will. When the surgeon digs that slug out, get it and mark it for evidence. Yeah. Skipper, them two men shot without asking any questions. They must be hot. Yeah. Same thing occurred to me. When we get that slug, the ballistics can tell us whether that gun's been used on other jobs. We got enough of their modus operandi to have the statistician give us a run through on the IBM now. One of them is left-handed, and he shoots quick. Okay, be in surgery tomorrow morning at 9. <laughs> Neither Ben or I said much on the way home, but we were both thinking the same thing. I knew the chief was thinking it, too. Here were two men who'd shot a couple of police officers without asking any questions. I suppose you've heard a lot of stories about what the force thinks of cop killers. 
Sure. We don't like to lose our friends and partners any better than anybody else would. Why not figure it this way? If these two guys would gun a couple of armed police officers, do you think they'd hesitate to shoot you, the unarmed citizen? The next morning at 9 o'clock, Ben and I had scrubbed up and we were in surgery. Williams was on the table. And the surgeon started in. A lot of minutes later, he got the slug. As for Williams, they took out seven feet of his intestine and said he might pull through. Joe, here's the report from ballistics. The slug they took out of Williams come from a 44 Smith & Wesson. The same gun was used in a liquor store killing about a month ago. You call the statistician? Yeah, uh-huh. She's running all the cards on previous shooting through the IBM machine. She ought to be through about now. Let's take a look. Okay, come on. Hi, Helen. Just a second. Okay. Well, that's it for it. These cards will give you all the shootings pulled by two men on foot who shot quick, one of them left-handed. Right. They're all yours. You sure can tell a lot from just a bunch of little holes in these cars, can't you? <laughs> I can't, but this IBM machine can. It never ceases to amaze me. Okay, shall we check the cards out? Huh? Yeah, sure, sure. Wait a minute, Ben. Here we are. Huh? Yeah. Here's that liquor store killing ballistics tied the Smith & Wesson in on. Same gun that Emerson Williams was shot with? Well, it checks out. The liquor store was in the same neighborhood as the Trapdoor Cafe. Same gun, huh? Got to be. How long ago? A month ago, yeah. Ben, take the DR number off this card and let's pull the crime report on that job. We pulled the crime report out of the files. It said that there was only one witness to that liquor store killing a month ago. That witness was a woman. Miss Forbes, I'm sorry to disturb you like this, but we'd like to ask some questions about that liquor store killing you witness a little over a month ago. Well, well, I told the police everything I knew about it then. Yeah, we know, but maybe you wouldn't mind telling us again, huh? Oh, no, I guess not. I, well, I've been trying to forget it to tell the truth. It was pretty terrible, and I really didn't see so very much because I was awful scared. I understand. But try to describe again just what happened, will you? Well, it was about 10 o'clock at night. I was walking down the street toward home when I re realized I was all out of cigarettes. Well, I was right in front of the liquor store then, so I went in. The clerk was behind the counter, and there were two men standing there arguing. What's the idea of changing your mind? I thought we was going to get bourbon. No, let's get the wine. I want bourbon. Got too much. Wine's good enough. The rest of them want bourbon, too. We better talk to them. Well, okay. We'll be back when we make up our mind, mister. Well, two men walked out of the store, and the clerk smiled at me and shrugged his shoulders. I bought a pack of cigarettes and turned to leave. But just then, the two men came back in again, and each of them had a gun in his hand. There's a stick up, mister. The clerk just sort of crumpled to the floor. I couldn't believe my eyes, but that's just how it happened. The men said this is a stick up, and then they shot him right away. Get over against the wall, lady, or you'll get the same. One of them punched the no say on the cash register. I, I was shaking, so I almost caved in. He scooped the money out of the drawer and stuffed it into his pocket. And then... And the other one went over to where the liquor clerk was lying, face down. He knelt down beside the clerk and he put his gun against the clerk's spine. And they both ran out of the store. Oh, he was terrible. That clerk, he was lying there, helpless, and wounded me. They delivered Yeah, me. Miss Forbes, I understand. Oh, Miss Forbes, uh, you said that both of the men had guns? Yes. One of the guns was black and the other was sort of, sort of fancy looking. What do you mean, Miss Forbes? Well, it was real shiny. Nickel plated? I wouldn't know about that, but it was shiny. There were two guns, huh? Yes. Well, now about the men themselves. Well, I, I was so scared their faces just didn't register with me. The one who, one who shot the clerk in the back was sort of stocky. About the best I can do. Well, you mentioned in the report that one of the men was left-handed. Yes, I do remember that. Uh-huh. Now, look, Miss Forbes, this is very important to us. One of the men was a redhead? Redhead? Why, no, I didn't see any redhead. Skipper, me and Joe's run right smack into a stone wall on this thing. What's the complication? Well, there's more than one, Ed. 
In the first place, we know that the 44 Smith & Wesson was used in both shootings. But the descriptions of the men involved don't check. Police officer Emerson said he thought the man that, uh, uh, that shot him and Williams outside the Trapdoor Cafe was a tall, left-handed redhead. Said there's something funny about his nose. You think Williams got a better look at him? Probably did, but Williams isn't strong enough to talk yet. And a girl that witnessed the liquor store killing a month ago said that one of those men was left-handed. But she said neither of them was a redhead. And on top of all that, now we've got two guns to worry about. The girl mentioned two guns, so we checked the autopsy report on that liquor clerk. And, Ed, the bullet that actually killed him came from a thirty-two twenty, not a forty-four Smith & Wesson. That fact didn't get any publicity at the time, did it? No, it didn't. Okay. We won't give it any publicity now, either. Well, lot down, it's just the forty-four Smith & Wesson we're after. Because if whoever owns the thirty-two twenty finds out it's hot, we'll never get it. Anything else? Well, we sent teletypes to all outland stations in neighboring cities. Told them if they get any red-headed suspects, no matter what charge they got them on, to hold them for questioning. Yeah. Now, how about this thirty-two twenty, the actual murder weapon? Any leads on it? We've got one, Ed. We've been checking the records, and we discovered that four hours after the liquor store killing, a taxi driver in the neighborhood was shot and robbed. The slug was pretty well mashed, but there was enough to tell it was from a thirty-two twenty. So we're going over to question the taxi driver now. Good. Well, I think you boys are on the right trail. So far, what we've got is mostly unrelated facts, but sooner or later, those facts have all got to tie in at some point along the line. Find that point. Yeah, find the point. Find the tie-in. Well, Ben and I went over to see the taxi driver, a guy who was living on borrowed time. Yeah, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning when it happened. I got a call to pick up a fare near 105th and Avalon, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I got there, somebody came over, pulled open my cab door and said, this is a stick-up. Then blow it, you let me have it. Just like that, huh? Yeah, just like that. Same deal as others, Joe. Itchy trigger finger. Yeah. Did you get any kind of a look at the fella? Look, no, no, it's too dark. Uh-huh. Hey, um, according to the report, you got shot in the chest. Yeah, that's right. Oh, you're maybe wondering how come I'm still alive, huh? I'll tell you, pal, it's like something you'd see in a bad movie, you know? You know, I'm carrying a few silver dollars with me, nine of them to be exact. So I decided to stick them in my breast pocket. Well, mister, that just saved my life. The slug hit them silver dollars. <laughs> the one for the book, huh? Yeah, you said it. Well, thanks very much. Say, incidentally, we had a little trouble finding you today. You weren't at the stand you operated out of last month. Oh, look, look, uh, I'm not only not at my usual stand, I'm not driving a hack no more. Uh oh? Look, after what happened, are you kidding? No, I don't want to push my luck any further than it's been pushed. Yeah, I figure I had it, you know? And about that time, Ben and I were beginning to figure we'd had it. We were getting nowhere fast. We had a few informants nosing around, but so far they hadn't come up with any leads. Well, Ben and I followed up all the teletypes that poured in. We just got back from Santa Ana where we'd been questioning a redheaded suspect, and we'd flopped in the squad room when Chief Backstrand's door opened. Friday, Romero. Got a minute? Yes, yeah, Kim. Any luck with the Santa Ana redheads? No, none at all. Hmm. I guess you haven't heard the latest. We just now got back in town, Skipper. Early this morning, another cab driver got shot. What? Yeah. Man came up to his taxi, opened the door, said, this is a stick-up, and shot him. Well, it went through one leg and into the other, but the driver managed to start his cab and drove over to a cafe. He called in from there. Uh, boys recovered the slug? Yeah. It came from the same 44 Smith & Wesson that was used in the other two jobs. The cab driver get a look at the gunman? Yeah, briefly. Was it the redhead? No. Oh, well, the stocky guy. He wasn't redheaded, and he wasn't stocky. That's all the driver knows. Well, that's great. Skipper, this is beginning to sound like a guns a month club. You reckon somebody's renting them guns out? Well, they're passing the guns around all right, but I think they're working together. The way they operate indicates that. Yeah, the trigger happy routine. The killing is apparently more than a business to them. It's pleasure, too. That's why we've got to get to them fast. Come over here. All right. Come on, Ben. Here. Take a look at this map. Uh-huh. There's the trapdoor cafe. And over here's the liquor store. And down here is where the first cab driver got shot. Mm -hmm. Right here's where the second one got it. Mm. All of the shootings have taken place within an area of ten square blocks. Okay. Tonight we're going to throw a blockade around that whole area. Good. It'll go into effect at 10 p.m. At 9.45 p.m., cars and officers started drifting into the area by twos and threes. And at 10, when Backstrand, Ben, and I arrived, the whole area was sewed up tighter than a tick. It's now code three. 
Davis? Yeah. All set? All set. We got a primary line and a secondary line. If anyone tries to make a break, we'll pick him up in the secondary. Okay. Friday and Romero here will cruise around the area with me. Go to work, man. Every car in the area was shaken down. The same process was also followed on all persons on foot. The blockade went on all night. By the end of that time, we'd brought in 217 suspects. 26 of them were redheads. What's your name? Henry Wagner. Where do you work? Lumber yard. Which one? For a start. What time did you get through work last night? About six, I guess. What'd you do then? At some dinner. Where? Uh, Harry's Grill. Then what? Shot a little pool. Look, I tell you, I ain't done nothing. Now, uh, let's go back to the day before yesterday. Did you work at... And that's the way it went all day long. We shot question after question at them, working them gradually back to the days on which the shootings had taken place. When it was all over, we got six men wanted in other cities on various charges. We got quite an assortment of guns and knives. But as far as the shootings were concerned, we got nothing. Well, I guess that's the last of them. Oh, I was running out of questions there at the end. You two boys better go on home and get some sleep. Well, I was kind of figuring on checking back over the reports to see if we might have overlooked something. I said go on home. You two boys have been at it for 32 hours straight. Look at you. You're both so groggy, you can hardly stand up. You need sleep. It's uh, 4 p.m. now. Don't come back until 10 p.m. When I walked into the squad room at 10, Ben was already there. An informant had just phoned in a new lead. He told Ben he'd heard about a gang that had been hanging out down around the DeVere bungalow court in the south end of town. We knew that the DeVere was close to the trapdoor cafe... So we went over to talk to the manager. Joe, I've been meaning to ask you. Uh, you checked on how Williams is getting along? Yeah, I did. I called the hospital this afternoon. It's going to be all right. Oh, that's fine. Well, here we are. Yeah, manager's office. Still got a light on. Yeah? I'm Sergeant Friday. Police, this is Sergeant Romero. Yeah? We'd like a little information. Why, sure. Come in. Thank you. What can I do for you? Well, did you hear anything about a gang that hangs out down around here anywhere? Gang? Well, no. Mm, how about your tenants here? Any of them ever been in trouble, to your knowledge? No. This ain't exactly the best neighborhood in town, but we try to keep things under control. Once in a while, one of them will get out of line, but when that happens, we heave them out of here. You heaved anybody out lately? Yeah, I did. Phone his wife a few weeks ago. They had a fight in one of the bungalows. She took a shot at him, but she missed. Party by the name of Stuba, Carl Stuba. What did this Stuba look like? Oh, sort of tall, skinny. Was he a redhead? No. Now, we'd like to take a look at that bungalow that he lived in. Sure, sure. Help yourselves. Down the end there, number five. Still vacant. Well, I guess that does it. Stuba didn't leave a thing behind. Matter of fact, we don't have anything to prove that this stube is tied in at all. We're only working on a hunch. Hey, Joe, look. Where? Up on the wall there, just for the window. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that plaster there, it's newer than the rest. You got a knife? Oh, I sure have, boy, and I'm carving. That manager would be awful unhappy with me if he is here. Yeah, he would. Yeah, it might. Hey, Joe, here it is. A slug. They plastered right over okay, it. Okay, dig it out, and let's hope it matches. matched. The slug from the wall came from the same 44 Smith & Wesson that had been used in the other shootings. So now we had a name to work on, Carl Stuba. But he'd done a good job of dropping out of sight. Well, the next day, Ben thought he had another lead. I've just been talking to another informant, Joe. He says he heard that there's a fellow down in that neighborhood been trying to sell a gun lately. What kind of a gun? Nickel plated with steer horn handle. Nickel plated? Well, maybe that's our 44 Smith & Wesson. Maybe. Did the informant know who this man was? Said the fellow's name was Alonzo. Yeah. Alonzo who? Just Alonzo. That's all he knew. So now we had two names, Stuba and Alonzo, but no men to go with him. So we went back to making the rounds of the substations, interviewing red-headed suspects. We took a few of them to Williams, who was home from the hospital by now, but... He couldn't identify any of them as the man who shot him. Still, we kept checking. Finally, we got around to the 77th Street station. 
We questioned the suspects they were holding there, and we just started to leave when one of the officers called us. Hey, Sarge, yeah. we're holding somebody else you might want to look at. Redhead? No. What's the choice? Suspicion of burglary? Small job. Oh, I don't know. What do you think, Ben? What's special about him? He lives in the same neighborhood where those shootings took place. All right. Where you got him? Down here. Did he admit anything? No. He's pretty surly. Here we are. Thanks. Hi. What do you want? I'm Sergeant Friday. This is Sergeant Romero. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Look, I already told the other cops all I know. I didn't steal no radio from that jerk. What's your name? We've been through all that once. Come on, what's your name? Jackson. Alonzo Jackson. Alonzo. I looked at Ben and Ben looked at me. This could be the Alonzo who'd been trying to peddle that Smith & Wesson. Ben and I both knew here was one suspect we'd have to be real careful with. Alonzo, um... According to the records, this burglary you're suspected of took place on the night of the 27th. Look, how many times do I have to tell you guys they didn't have anything to do with it? You got an alibi for that night? Sure, I got an alibi. I was out with a couple of friends, I can tell you. What's your friend's name, Lonzo? One of them's Cranley, the other's Stuba. Stuba, the guy who used to live in the bungalow court. Well, we told Alonzo he'd have to produce his two friends to give him an alibi for the burglary charge, and he bit. He went with us, and he pointed out where Stuba was living now. No wonder we hadn't been able to find him. It was a little shack at the back of a lot behind two houses. We thought it was a chicken coop at first. We took Alonzo back to the station, then we picked up Stuba. He was surprised to see us and not very happy. We took him in. Next, Alonzo gave us Crandall's address. Yeah? Mr. Crandall in? No. Will he be back soon? I don't know. Who are you? Sergeant Friday, Sergeant Romero, police. What do you want with him? Oh, nothing important, lady. We just wanted him as a witness. Oh. Well, I don't know just when he'll be back. Probably an hour or two. Okay, thanks. We went down the street away, and we staked out in the car. We sat there for about five hours, and then Ben nudged me in the ribs. Hey, Joe. Huh? Joe, take a look. Coming along the sidewalk. Yeah. And he's got red hair. Come on. Crandall. Huh? Your name, Crandall? Who are you? Friday Romero, police. Police? What do you want with me? I, I haven't done nothing. Well, then you got nothing in the world to worry about. Come on. We questioned Crandall for an hour, but he wouldn't give an inch. Denied everything. Then we put him in a car, and we drove over to Officer Williams' house. I left Ben in the living room with Crandall while I went in William's bedroom. Hello, Sarge. Hi, Williams. How are you doing? Yeah, a little better, I think. That's fine. Look, we've got another redhead outside. <laughs> Bring him in. Okay. All right, Crandall, come on in here. Who's in there? Why'd you bring me over here? Come on in here. How about it, Williams? That's the guy. No, I'm that's not. That's the I... guy that shot me. Well, Crandall. No. Yeah. I... It... it was an accident. I didn't mean to shoot him. It was an accident. Once Crandall got started, he talked his head off. He also admitted being in on the liquor store killing, but insisted he was only the lookout. We took him back to the station and got his whole story down on a tape recorder. Yeah, he was left-handed. Then we went back to Alonzo, who didn't know we had Crandall's confession. We met the chief in the hall outside the room where they were holding Alonzo. About ready to tie the knot? Oh, hope so, chief. But Alonzo hasn't given any yet. And we still haven't found those guns. We've got one of them. Which one? The Smith & Wesson. Stuba popped about that one ten minutes ago. Said he left it with his girl. A couple of the boys are on their way over to get it now. That's good, Ed. That leaves just the thirty-two twenty. You haven't mentioned the thirty-two twenty to Alonzo, have you? No. He still thinks we're after that Smith and Wesson, and that's the way we're going to play it right now. Go ahead. Look, how much longer are you guys going to hold me here? Didn't you check with those friends of mine? Well, so we got a tip that you've been trying to sell a gun, lady. A gun? Yeah, 44 Smith and Wesson. Oh. No, it's not true. That Smith and Wesson's been using a couple of robbery jobs this month, and we think it's your gun. That's a lie. Any proof of that? Why, yeah. Sure, I got proof of that. Uh, I used to have a gun, but it wasn't a Smith & Wesson. Look, 
If I tell you where it is, that ought to convince you, shouldn't it? It'll help things. Okay. I sold it to a neighbor of mine. He gave me seven bucks. I'll give you his address. You sure it's not a Smith and West? Sure, I'm sure. It's a thirty-two twenty. Yeah, it worked. We went to the neighbor's address, and he admitted having bought the thirty-two twenty, but said he'd lent it to a friend who'd never returned it. The friend had hocked the gun to a barber. The barber gave him fifteen bucks and a haircut for it. We finally got it from the barber, and we came back to the station. I'm all set, Joe. I'll be in the next room. Just give me the nod. Okay. Hello, Alonzo. Hey, you got the gun. Yeah, we got the gun. Well, now maybe you'll believe I'm on the level. Okay, if I go now? I guess we won't be able to hold you here much longer. You can say that again, brother. You could have saved a lot of time for you to listen to what I've been trying to tell you all along. I guess you're right, Alonzo. Sure, I'm right. You know, you guys would be a lot better off. You believe guys like me the first time we tell you something. Instead of running, I was on the uh, lookout. I was outside. Uh, it was the other two who pulled that one. Uh, Stuba and Alonzo. Alonzo killed a clerk. Quit it, Alonzo! Hold it, Alonzo! Dirty, All right, man. Alonzo, that's enough. Now, come on, how about it? Well, what's the use? All right. That's like he said. Okay, Ben, bring the recorder in here. Alonzo's ready to make a record now. <laughs> By playing back Crandall's statement that we'd recorded earlier, we got a full confession from Alonzo. We took the three of them out and had them reenact the four shootings, and we photographed it on sound film. Crandall, the redhead, was the one who'd shot the two police officers, but he was only the lookout for the liquor store killing, which explains why the girl witness didn't see him in the store. Stuba and Alonzo were the ones who pulled that job, and Alonzo, the worst of the bunch, was the one who put the 3220 against the spine of the wounded clerk. The three of them took turns at shooting the cab drivers and robbing them. That accounted for the mixed-up descriptions, including all that left-handed business. Two of the three suspects happened to be left-handed. Well, that was the crop. Crandall Alonzo Stuba. Four shootings, three robberies, four attempted murders, one murder. The three men were tried and convicted. They're all in the state penitentiary. Crandall's there for life. Alonzo and Stuba... I'll be executed next week. File it, will you, Ben? Case closed. Drag net. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> You have just heard the second in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of C.B. Horrell, Chief of Police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to radio officer Delmer E. Cook of the Los Angeles Police Department, who on the afternoon of December 6, 1948, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. There's a potential killer on the loose in your city. Eighteen women have been beaten and robbed by this man. The newspapers call him the werewolf. Your job is to get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files from beginning to end, from crime to punishment. Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was 
was Thursday morning, February 2nd. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the early morning watch out of robbery detail. Detectives in Los Angeles work in pairs. My partner's Ben Romero. He's a sergeant, and so am I. My name's Friday. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. I was on the way back from the teletype room, and it was 3 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Hi, Ben. What's up? Keep the coat on, Joe. Just had a hot shot call. Coming, Skipper? Right behind you. Let's go, Freddy. Well, what was it, Ed? Another woman robbed, almost beaten to death. Uh, well, how many does that make? About 18 in six weeks. Is that right, Skipper? Yeah, 18 too many. Come on down these stairs to the garage. Yeah. What about that suspect we had, Ed? You mean Martin? Yeah. Had to release him this morning. And I got a good tale on him, Henderson. Yeah. We got any reports yet? Nothing definite to hold him for. Here's the garage. Let's hustle it. Right. Then if this isn't Martin's job, Skipper, and he's not the right man... Then we start all over again, and we work night and day till we find the right man. Here's the car. Let's go. Ben, you drive. Yeah, all right. How do the victims describe this guy, Ed? Pretty sketchy. Supposed to be tall, dark, long black hair. Last woman said he had a face like an animal. Something like a dog. Or a wolf. A wolf? Yeah. She said... Something like a werewolf. Something like a werewolf. We almost had to be that, judging from the way he operated. He was either an animal or a raving maniac. One thing we were sure of, he was smart and he was dangerous. For almost two months, he prowled the streets in a stolen car in the early morning, usually between 3 and 5 a.m., and the victims were always lone women, most of them waitresses, coming to work or going home. He dragged them into the car, robbed them, beat them until they were unconscious, and then throw the body out into the street. That's just what we found when we pulled up to the curb near the corner of 8th and Grand. One cruiser car was already there, and so was the ambulance. About a dozen people were standing around looking at the crumpled figure of a woman sprawled out on the sidewalk. Two officers were talking to the only witness, a thin, sallow-faced newsboy. His story didn't give us much to go on. Like I was telling these cops, uh, or these officers, sir, I was walking up 8th Street on my way home as usual when I see this blue Chevy sedan pull up down the block there a little way and dump out the dame's body. Well, actually, I I don't know what to think. Uh, You got a look at the license plate? Well, well, no, I didn't. The truth, I could hardly keep from... Well, I was just plain scared. Mm -hmm. What did you do after you saw him throw the body out, son? I just stood there for a minute, and the fellow in the car drove right on past me. Did you get a look at him? I sure did. How close were you when he drove past? Well, no, he couldn't have been more than, well, eight or ten feet away. Uh. I was right over there by the street light near the curb. Would you know this man if you saw him again? I don't know about his height or his build or his weight, but, mister, his face I'll never forget. Why do you say that? It was just like the paper says about him. Right, Right here on the front page. Here, read it. See? Woman says attacker looked like werewolf. That's all the newsboy could tell us. The suspect drove a blue sedan. He had a face like a werewolf. We covered the neighborhood for clues, and we questioned a dozen people, but we got nowhere. We took the witness's name and address, and then we drove down a couple of blocks to an all-night gas station. 14-hour off the next hour. I'm going in here and call the office and see if Henderson's called in on Martin. We might still have a suspect. All right, Skipper. Mm. Looks as mad as a wet hornet, doesn't it, Joe? Yeah. Did you get a good look at that woman's face when they moved her in the ambulance? Yeah. Sure does like to mess him up. Oh, I don't know how we're going to get him, Ben, but we better do it fast. Next time, it'll probably be murder. Oh, here comes the Skipper, Joe. Uh, uh-oh. Doesn't look good. What is it, Ed? Just talked to Henderson. He tailed Martin to a bar in Long Beach. He hasn't been out of his sight for two minutes since yesterday. Martin's clear. And we're right back where we started. Yeah, with one more half-dead woman in the hospital. Well, how about that stolen car, Skip? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Get that radio up. Okay. Code 3, ambulance dispatched. Attention, all units. On Grand Avenue between Venice and Washington, a woman, victim of robbery and attack, Code 3... Ambulance to task. Code three, red light and siren. Come on, Friday, let's roll. We couldn't be sure, but it sounded like another one. 
Six minutes later, we were there. Same story. Werewolf. The next day, the chief ordered the number of cruiser cars doubled in the central district. This was for the early morning watch with plainclothesmen to back them up. Then the newspapers played it vague, and in two days, the story was on the front page of every paper in town. Maybe that should have made the werewolf lay low, but it didn't. Because at 4 o'clock that morning, while Ben and I were patrolling with the other cars, he got his 20th victim. Attention, all units. Whittier between Soto and Matthews. A woman, victim of 211, an attack. Code 3. Ambulance dispatched. Here's a report on that blue sedan he used the other night, Joe. Found it out on Anaheim Telegraph Road. Any luck with it? Not one fingerprint we can use. Anything else? Nothing. Well, how about the auto theft detail? Same old story, Joe. He steals a car, uses it once, and then drops it. Never leaves a thing behind. Well, that's great. We're sure moving fast. How about that big guy you picked out of the lineup this morning? Oh, I checked his alibi. It's perfect. Hmm. Now we haven't got even half a clue. Yeah. Well, come on. Let's check with Eddie. He's instructing the police women on a plan for tonight. All right. Now you've heard the reports. You understand how the suspect operates and what you're to do. Yeah, I think so. Remember, all of you forget you were ever police women. Change the way you walk, the way you carry yourselves. That's the part you're playing, all right? Okay. And be careful and don't take any chances. All right, Freddy. Okay, Ed. Now, just to make sure you look the part, we're spotting each one of you at different restaurants and coffee shops throughout the central district. And from 7 o'clock tonight until daylight tomorrow, each one of you is going to be a waitress. You got that? Yeah. Okay, Ben, you want to give them their assignments? Okay, Joe. Well, here's the way it lines up. Marge Kissel at the Top Hat Cafe. That's on 9th Street between Alvarado and Westlake. Okay. And Katie Wells, Joe's Coffee House, Brooklyn Soto. Right. Pat Fielding at the All Night Steakhouse on Figueroa Street between Florence and... No, the trick of using decoys to lure criminals into a trap wasn't exactly new, but, well, it was just one of the old tricks that we figured might land the werewolf behind bars. At 7 that night, Ben and I made the rounds and found each of the police women on her job as a waitress. Well, the overall plan was simple. The girls were to leave the different restaurants between 3 and 5 a.m. that morning and pretend they were walking home. We mapped different courses for each one of them to throw out as much bait as possible and yet not to make it look suspicious. Each policewoman, from the time she left the restaurant and stepped out into the deserted streets, would be pretty much on her own. We had officers planted all along the way at designated intervals, but a big element of chance and danger was still there. All we could do was cross our fingers and hope. How much more time, Joe? Let me see. She's doing two minutes. Yeah. Waiting gets on your nerves. And it won't be long. This corner doorway's pretty good lookout spot. Yeah. Wait a minute. Listen. Who is it, Joe? Can you see? Get back. What is it? Wait a minute. It's Marge Kissel. There's a man following her, a big guy. If it's the werewolf, where's his car? I don't know. Maybe he changed his plans. Get back. Here they come. You get a look at him, Joe? Oh, pretty good. Not too suspicious. Might be coincidence. Well, they got a pretty good lead. Come on, let's go. Stay back in the shadows. Hey, Joe. Hmm? So where'd the guy go to? I lost him. The little coffee shop up on the next corner. See? Take a look. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's opening the door. He's turning on the light. Yeah, looks like a false alarm, Joe. Well, let's check him anyway. Well, I didn't think we'd be that lucky on the first try, and we weren't. We asked the man a few questions, and it didn't take him long to show us he wasn't our man. He owned the coffee shop. So Ben and I went back and took up our posts again and waited for the next decoy. We covered that ten-block course six times that morning back and forth, following the bait, but it was almost as if the guy could sense a trap. Not once did we get a nibble. By the time our last decoy finished the route, it was almost daylight. Joe, I never was so glad to see that sun come up in my whole life. My feet feel like they're puffing right up out of my shoe. Yeah, me too. Come on, let's get over to the car and check on the other squad out in Boyle Heights, huh? Mm -hmm. oh. Hit the radio, will you, Ben? Yeah, Joe, there must be some easier job on the force than this. Yeah, you and me both. Now, let's see what happened to the others, huh? 80K to Unit 104K, come in. 104K to Unit 80K, go ahead. 104K, this is Friday. You do any good out there? This is Miller. I'll call Curtis. Stand by. 80K to 104K, Roger. What do you think, Joe? Maybe a buy? I don't know. Oh, this guy seems to work like a mind reader. Well, he can't win all of them. 104K to Unit 80K. This is Curtis, go ahead. 
This is Friday, Al. How'd you do out there? Any luck? Just checked in the last gal, Joe. Eddie Welch, not a sign. Okay, Al. Have the men check in. 80K clear. KGPL. Okay, let's go, Ben. When we finally got back to the office that morning, both Ben and I were ready for some sleep, but it didn't look like we were going to get it. We just about finished going through the overnight reports for some kind of a lead when the phone rang. Robbery Friday. Hi, Joe. This is Wilkerson, Auto Theft. Hi, Wilkie. You got something for us? Not much, Joe, but it might work into something. Just got a report in on a pair of stolen license plates. Oh? Yeah. I'm not much of a hawk, Shaw, but I figure there's just a chance it might be your werewolf boy. How come? I don't know. Maybe just a hunch. After 13 years in this business, you get to know thieves pretty well. Sometimes you got to even think like them. Okay, Wilkie, thanks. We'll check by in a couple of minutes. Right, Joe. What do you have to say? A pair of license plates stolen last night. Wilkie's got a hunch it could have been our man. Well, might be an angle, Joe. If that werewolf guy'd hang on to one car long enough, we'd have a chance at him. Oh, he's too smart for that. I don't know, Joe. Sooner or later, he's going to make a mistake. Yeah. Come on, let's check with Wilkie. Well, we checked with Wilkerson. We got the best piece of news we'd had in days. On the average, 95% of stolen cars are recovered or located within 24 hours. In the remaining 5%, Wilkerson, by a simple process of elimination, narrowed down the number of cars the suspect might be driving. Wilkie figured six cars. There they are. Now, I'll bet you if you picked up your man tonight, he'd be in one of these cars. Let me see, huh? Two-door black sedan, yellow convertible, another sedan, green, blue coupe, black coupe, and a gray convertible. Well, that's good work, Wilkie. At least we got something to look for now. Yeah, you're right, Joe. Uh, Wilkie, you got the numbers of those stolen plates you're talking about? Yeah, right here, Ben. They're already on the hot sheet. Good. Keep us posted, huh? Yeah, as usual, Ben. See you later, Wilkie. It's a good break, Ben. Something to keep us busy tonight. Tonight? What do you mean? We're setting another trap. Same thing as last night. Same police women, same everything. Well, only this time, let's hope he steps into it. You know, Joe, this werewolf character is getting me mad. That night, we followed in our own footsteps. We planted the police women decoys in three separate districts, and a few minutes before 3 a.m., our squad of men took up their positions. The same police women went to their waitress jobs in the same restaurants, and Ben and I and the rest of the men stood in darkened doorways or empty filling stations or whatever cover we could find. And we waited and waited. What time is it, Joe? Let me look. Half past four. Oh, thank you. Any sign, Joe? No, nothing yet. Come on, stay in the shadows. That's the way it went all through the early morning. The same plan over and over again until daylight. Ben and I had check in at the station, go over the late stolen car reports with Wilkie, catch a few hours sleep at home, and then come back and do it all over again. The next night, the next morning, the night after that, and the morning after that. Five days later, Ben and I were ready to call it quits. I'll admit it, Joe, I can't figure. The guy's either psychic or else he can smell a cop a mile away. Yeah, well, at least we got that stolen car angle left. Did you check with Wilkie yet this morning? I'll give him a call now. All right. Auto theft, Wilkerson. This is Ben, Wilkie. You got anything for us this morning? Yeah, I'm just going to call you. You fellas ought to let me solve your cases for you. Why? What'd you get? The boys picked up three of those six stolen cars since late yesterday. Great. Now, what does that leave us with? I hear the three still missing. Yeah. Four X ray seven six three. Yeah. Five six young three four two. Uh-huh. Six one Robert three eight five. Yeah. Got those? Yeah, thank you, Wilkie. Uh, check you later. Good news. Remember those six missing cards? Yeah. Wilkie says the boys found three of them since late yesterday. Here's what's still out the blue coupe, the yellow convertible, and the gray convertible. Yeah. Well, this feels like the right track for a change, Ben. Righty. Romero, got a minute? Sure thing, Skipper. Come on, Joe. What do you got, Ed? A woman out in Hollywood just called in with this. She said she walked down to the corner from her house last night to mail the letter. On the way back, a guy pulled up in the car and tried to drag her inside. Any description? Big, heavy, set, dark, same thing. Well, how'd you get away from him, Skipper? She said she started running as soon as he made a motion toward her. When he saw her run up the steps of her house, he jumped back in the car and took off. Well, how come she didn't call in before then? No, she hasn't got a phone. She's ready to leave the house again until this morning. Sounds good, Chief. You got her address there? Yeah, yeah. Mrs. Tom Burdick, 1237 Wilcox. 
Apartment 10. Come on, Ben. This might be what we're looking for. Who is it? Who's there? Sergeant Friday, ma'am. Police. Oh, just a moment. I'm Sergeant Romero, Miss Birdie. This is my partner, Sergeant Friday. We come out to check on your call about that little trouble last night. Oh, well, I don't know if I'm going to be much help to you. I was so frightened about all I could do was just run. Well, could you add anything to the man's description, Miss Burdick? I mean, other than what you told the chief on the phone? Well, no. Honestly, I don't think I can. All I saw was this tall, dark man jumping out of his car and starting for me. He had a heavy build and seemed to me, well, a large head with lots of long black hair. Uh Hmm. Uh, Miss Burdick, uh, would you recognize this man if you ever saw him again? Well, I think I might. He was such an unusually big man, almost frightened me to death. Well, just one more question, Miss Burdick. Could you describe the car this man was driving when he approached you? His car? Mm Mm-hmm. Why, yes. It was a gray convertible. Miss Burdick, are you sure of that? Yes, I'm sure of it. A gray convertible. Thank you, Miss Burdick. That's all we wanted to know. Sometimes when you're on a case, you can chase yourself around in circles for weeks trying to fit together just two little pieces of a yard-long jigsaw puzzle. And a lot of the time, you find the answer where you least expect it. But once you get that feeling you're after the right man in the right way, there's nothing that can shake you. When Ben and I got back to headquarters, we went straight to the chief's office with the story, and we had him stake out the gray convertible. In other words, if any detective or officer spotted the car, he reported it back to us, but he stayed away from it. We figured that there probably weren't more than two of the victims who could take the witness stand and identify the man who robbed and beat them. Not with a smart defense lawyer, anyway. So there was only one way to catch this suspect. Red-handed. Here they are, Joe. Both sets of lights and numbers for that gray convertible. Here are the original, and here are the numbers on the stolen plates. Good. Everybody got a hot sheet? From the chief all the way down to the janitor. Fine. Now let's get together with Ed, huh? Hot shot, Joe. Grab it. I got it. On the corner of California and Oakwood, a woman badly beaten. On the corner of California and Oakwood, a woman badly... Come on, Ben, another one. But, Joe, it's broad daylight. Yeah, doesn't figure, does it? Come on. That vacant lot over, Joe. Two plain clothesmen and uniformed officers were keeping the crowd back. An ambulance was drawn up by the curb, but it was empty. When we got down to the rear of the lot, we found out why. They were waiting for the coroner. The woman was young, not much more than 30. Her body was half sprawled across the muddy ground, and her face was turned upward. It had been badly beaten. They figured it happened last night, Sergeant. Have the fingerprint men been notified? Yeah. How about the crime lab? Just called them. That's good. Now, let's keep everybody out of the area till they get here. All right, Sergeant. Uh, who found the body? One of the kids in the neighborhood. The woman was dead when he found her. Did she live around here? Well, about a half mile away. I hear she's got three kids. Or she had three kids. Uh-huh. You've seen enough, Ben? Yeah. Let's get on back to headquarters. All the way back to headquarters, Ben and I planned our next move. And by the time we got to Ed Backstrand's office, we knew exactly what had to be done. When we told him about the werewolf murder, he didn't say a thing for a minute. He just stared across the room at the calendar on the wall. Then he brought his hand down hard against the desk. Friday, Romero, I'm only going to say this once, so get it straight. That guy's pulled his last job in this city. He's through robbing and beating women, and he's through with murder. I've given you time to track him down, and now I want him in. No stalls and no excuses. I want him. I don't care how many men you use, and I don't care how you get him, but get him. That's all. Ben and I worked all that afternoon right through dinner, up until 8 o'clock. By that time, the overall plan was down on paper and already in action. It was one of the biggest things we'd ever tackled, and, well, we didn't know if it was going to work. We only knew it had to work. We had a squad of 65 cars to stretch out over 40 square miles of the city in one big dragnet. The blockade itself would be stationary most of the time, and working inside it would be two cars, 
14 policewomen as decoys with two plainclothesmen assigned to watch each policewoman. If and when the werewolf was sighted in the gray convertible, we'd automatically take over the police radio for the whole city, and Backstrand would direct the chase from headquarters. A little after eight, we had coffee and hamburgers, and we went to Ben's for a few hours. Ben tucked his kid in bed as usual, and then he laid down for a nap. I talked to his wife until I dozed off in the chair. At 11.30, she woke us up. I combed my hair and put on my coat. Cops' wives are like everybody else's. They worry. When we met Ed at headquarters, we did some last-minute checking on details with Backstrand for about a half an hour, and then we were all ready to go. By five minutes past two, half the dragnet crew pulled out of the police garage and scattered over the city to their places. By 2.35, the other half pulled out, and a few minutes later, Ben and I followed. At three minutes to three that morning, Backstrand took over communications and checked every car in the operation. It was a good start. Every man in his right place by the right time. The trap was set. All we needed now was to find our suspect, the werewolf, inside. Control 4 to Unit 80K. Control 4 to Unit 80K. 80K to Control 4. Go ahead. This is Backstrand standing by. 80K. Roger. Clear. KGPL. Okay, Ben. Now let's go find him. I got a hunch, Joe. Let's try the Wilshire district first. Sounds all right to me. Let's go. For the first hour and a half, we raked the Wilshire district back and forth. Not a sign. Then about 38 minutes past four, we headed back for the downtown area and parked in an alley where we could double check on one of our policewomen decoys. Here comes one of the gals now, Joe. Pat Field. But her feet are almost as tarred as mine. Yeah. Did you see anything else, Ben? Nothing. Quiet as a church. No. No, no, wait a minute. Hmm? Car just turned the corner. Heading up in the same direction she is. Joe. Hmm? Joe, it's slowing down. Wait a minute. He's pulling up beside her. It's a great convertible. It's him, Joe. Come on. <laughs> Take off. 80K to control four. 80K to control four. We've spotted the suspect. He's driving a gray Ford convertible. License 61 Robert 385. Suspect's headed east on Olympic from Alameda. Driving without lights. Suspect is armed. He had a fast car and he knew how to drive it. We almost lost him twice. Two minutes after we sighted him, Backstrand took over full radio control. ADK to Control 4. We're traveling at a high rate of speed, headed east on Olympic, crossing Soto Street. Control 4 to all units. Stand by. Units 11A, 12, and 13 are close in on the intersections at Olympic and Lorena. Units 41, 42, 45, and 104K move on on the next four crossings east of that. To the north and south, units 105K, 14A, 17R, 43J. Block all main arteries. In the next half hour, the 65 cars in the dragnet had pulled in like a noose around a five-mile area. Ben and I hoped it was just a matter of time. Unit 80K to Control 4. Control 4 to 80K, go ahead. He's headed north on Fresno Street, crossing Whittier Boulevard. Attention all units. 80K now pursuing suspect north on Fresno from Whittier Boulevard. Units 15, 105K, 11R, and 18A block off the intersection on Fresno and Fort. Hey, Ben, up there ahead. What's he trying to do now? Look, he's turning around. Yeah. Yeah, and he's coming right for us. Watch it, Joe. Look out. Pretty close. 80K to control four. Control four to 80K, go ahead. Exchanging shots with suspect. Watch it, Ben. Here he comes again. Sure likes to use that gun, doesn't he? Sure does. Hey, Joe, look. Now look, he's turning east. He's running for Hollenbeck Park. Yeah, 80K to Control 4. Control 4, go ahead. Suspect just drove up over curb and into Hollenbeck Park. Joe, Joe, can you get a shot at him? Don't shoot! Don't shoot! I'll give up! Don't shoot! 
and step out on the open and get your hands in the air. All right, all right, I give up. But don't shoot. You're a brave kill. Yeah, come on. All right, you get your hands in the air. Come on, higher. Joe, look out. He's got a knife. I got him. <laughs> Joe, those women were right. He does look like a werewolf. Yeah. You got your handcuffs? Yeah. Okay. Got a cigarette? Mm. I've been out for an hour. Middle place across the street. Maybe we can get somewhere. Okay. There's the crew from the 41 Arc. Hey, fellas, take him into robbery, will you? Okay, Friday. I think there's a vending machine in there. Uh-huh. Say, uh, you got some change for the cigarette machine, mister? I think so. Say, uh, who's that guy all them cops were after over in the park a little while ago? I picked up the werewolf. Been reading the paper? Yeah. You fellas cops? Yeah. <laughs> sure made it easy for you, didn't he? All you cops had to do was surround the little fella in the park. Nothing to it, huh? Yeah, that's right, mister. Nothing to it. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Walter Barton, known as the werewolf, was tried and convicted and is now serving a full life sentence at the state penitentiary. This has been Dragnet, the third in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of C.B. Horrell, Chief of Police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Sergeant Mario Victor Dairo of the Los Angeles Police Department, who on the morning of January 1st, 1943, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A gang of quick trigger gunmen have moved in on your city. They've given public notice that they'll kill the first cop who tries to take them. You know the risks, your job, apprehend the suspect. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case, from beginning to end, from crime to punishment. Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, April 17th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My partner's Ben Romero. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the record bureau. It was four minutes to six when I got to room 42. Homicide. Say, Ben, I pulled a package on the Raymond killing. And that proves you can still read, Friday. He's at it, Joe. Your pal, Fred Lindsay. Hiya, Fred. What's doing? Busier than you are. We know what we're looking for. Just having a little trouble finding them. That's the way it is with automobiles. They misplace so easy. Not normally they don't. We've got a small-size epidemic on our hands. Well, don't let us keep you, Fred. Just ducked in here for a breath of calm air. 
and to invite you to dinner for the last time. The wife and I are still waiting for the first time. How about it, Joe? Ruth's got a new pressure cooker. Your uh, sister-in-law visiting me again? Huh? No, on the level. Not selling a thing. Come on. Who is it this time? My cousin. But she's awfully pretty, Joe. Well, why do you guys insist on trying to marry me off? Me and Fred went down fighting, but it kind of grows on you after a while. Now, tell me, what is it about a married man? Just can't stand to see one single man left in the world. How about it, Joe? Tomorrow night at 7, okay? Okay. Tell Ruth I'll be there. It figures that he's got to run out of kinfolks pretty soon. Fine. We'll be expecting you. Got a stakeout tonight, but tomorrow I'll be clear. Anything, Ben? Nothing definite, Ben. Just a follow-up on those stolen cars. See you, men. So long, Lindsay. Joe, you'll uh, like my cousin. Oh, never say die. What a character. Mm. You just catnip the women, Joe. Yeah. Well, here's that Raymond package. Let's check those dates that Backstrand wanted, huh? Wednesday, April 17th was just routine. A dinner date I tried to get out of, some paperwork that the chief wanted done, and a hot, sticky day. Too hot to wear a suit of clothes. Sometimes it's like that. A day starts out being routine. By the time it comes of age, it's got a personality all its own. At 10.23 that night, Ben and I were just finishing up the paperwork, and Ed Backstrand opened his office door. Righty, Romero, just got a hot shot call. What you got, Skiver? Hold up and shooting at Hooper and Esperanza, code three. Code three, that means red light and siren. It was 10.32 when Ben and I pulled up at the corner of Hooper and Esperanza. It was a bar in the basement of a building on the south side of the street. A radio car was there, and the two officers were holding the crowd back. A man was talking to one of the officers who turned and pointed to us. As Ben and I got out of our car, the man hurried over to us. You're the detectives? That's right, Sergeant Friday. My name's Cummings, R.L. Cummings. I own the bar. This is terrible. There was a gunfight downstairs. Uh Uh-huh, come on. Where's the ambulance? One of the officers in the radio car said we needed the coroner. Did you see the actual shooting? No, I didn't. Here's the fellow that was shot. Uh Oh, where's Joan from the crime lab? Hello, Friday. Romero. Hi, Lee. What do we got here? Pretty bad. Looks like a shotgun. Close range. Mm, He really got in the way of it. Ben. Yeah. It's Fred Lindsay. Motor theft. He was on a stakeout, Lee. Tell us about it, Mr. Cummings. You know this fellow, Sergeant? Yeah, we know him. What happened? We had a holdup tonight. Three men. Yes, go on. Well, uh, business was good, real good. We had a large crowd, and I was happy about that because... I've been trying to sell out for a long time now. I've been showing the place to different parties all week long. I had a fellow coming over tonight to take a look at it. What time was that? A little less than an hour ago, about 9.30. I see. Go ahead. It was almost time for this man to show up, so I called Eddie. That's my bartender, and I told him to kind of keep a lookout for the man because I was going back to the office to get the books ready to show. You know how it is when you want to sell a bit of money. Hello, Mr. You'll watch for him, Eddie. You bet I will. If you want me, I'll be back in the office. Keep your mouth shut and stand still. Huh? You own this bar, don't you? Well, yes. What is this? You're the boy we want to see. Which one of you? All three of us. What's going on? What's it look like, genius? Just a stick-up. I haven't any money. You go to the bank on Thursdays, don't you? Well, I, I made my deposit today instead. I've been watching you for a month now. Don't give a cent. You go to the bank on Thursdays. Now, come on, hand it over. I'm telling you the truth. I, I usually go on Thursdays, but I, I went today instead. You're lying, Ace, and we ain't got much time. Look, you can have all the money I've got on me. I think it's about 200 but that's all I have. Here. Why you argue with him? Take what he's got and we'll shake the customers down. No, no, please don't do that. You got my money. Isn't that enough? No, it ain't. Oh. Come on, let's go out. That's about all I remember, Sergeant. When I come around, uh, I was lying on the floor of my office. You better have somebody take a look at that cut on your face. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to right away. There's my bartender. He saw the fight. What's his name, Eddie? Yeah. Eddie. Yes, sir? These men are detectives, Eddie. Will you, will you tell them what you saw? No, it was pretty rough. And tell us what happened when they started to shoot. Uh, that fellow the coroner just took out of here sure was long on nerves. Took on all three of them single-handed. Uh-huh. Tell us what you saw. You ought to get that fellow's name. Sure had a lot of nerve. Took over just like he was a cop. He was a cop. Now, what did you see? I pegged him for a cop. Well, he was sitting up at the bar. Been nursing a bottle of beer for about an hour. I was keeping an eye on the front door, watching for this fellow the boss wanted to see. So I didn't see the three hold-up men come through from the back. But I heard it. <laughs> all right, let's knock it off. You can all see this shotgun. Anybody make a move and I'll blow your head off. Team has covered the front door. Got it. Pickle, shake them down. Okay, Jance. You guys in the band, keep that music going. The rest of you people turn around and face the bar. 
Put your hands on top of the bar and leave them there till we tell you to move. Come on, hurry up. Knock it off. Okay, Sickle. We'll take your money, your watches, anything else you got. Now, don't try to be cute and hold out. All right, you, take off the watch. I'll get your bill for it. You, lady, let's have the ring. This Come man they called the Sickle went right down the line, took everything he could lay his hands on. Uh, this cop, your friend, was facing me at the far end of the bar. He was standing there just like the others. He kind of leaned toward me a little. Can you see the guy with the shotgun? Yeah. Where is he? Center of the room. The other guy still at the door? Yeah. Got his gun out? Holding it in his right hand. How far down the line is the other guy? About ten people away. Hey, you two down at the end there. Knock it off. Hurry up, Sickle. Doing the best I can. Come on, let's have the first lady. You, next to the lady here. Get the watch off. I'll take the floor. Over How far away now? Getting closer. But we better shut up like he says. I'm going to take the one with the shotgun first. Oh, you piece I got a gun. How far away is that guy now? I thought Jans told you two to shut up. All right, Sickle, try to move and I'll break your back. Let me go. Go ahead and shoot, Jans. Let me go. Away from Sickle. Let All me... you people at the bar, down on the floor. Okay, you with that shotgun, grab it. Lemus, can you get a shot at him? Not without hitting Sickle. Come on, you, I'm waiting. You got us all wrong, boy. We like Sickle, but not that much. The cop was holding Sickle as a shield. When the big guy let go with a shotgun, both the cop and Sickle ducked. The cop didn't get hit. This man, Sickle, fell over on his face, grabbed at his arm. The man with the shotgun went down on one knee, holding his stomach. The man at the door took a shot at the cop, but he missed. Then the cop fired three shots at the man by the door. Looked like the first two missed. But the last one caught the man in the leg and he went down. Well, by this time, the big guy with the shotgun had recovered enough to hold his weapon again. I tried to warn the cop. The guy out, the guy with the shotgun! I see him! Cop pointed his gun and pulled the trigger, but he was out of shell. Boy, Sergeant, my stomach knotted up when I heard that hammer fall against those empty chambers. The cop threw his gun at the guy with the shotgun and then ran right at him. You know, it was just as if that cop was trying to run right down the barrel of that shotgun. I glanced at the cop on the floor, then I tried to follow the three of them as they made their way out of the bar. They jumped into a car out front and drove off. As a kid, I used to watch Bill Hart take on a whole gang in the movies, but this way, right in front of my eyes, Sergeant, he was an awful brave guy. Did you get the license number of their car? No, I didn't. I... Couldn't see very well. You got a pretty good look at all three of the men, though, didn't you? I believe I'd recognize any of them. Thanks, Eddie. What's your last name? Uh, Bowers. Eddie Bower. Got that, Ben? Yeah. You'll be hearing from us, Eddie. We may want you to look at some pictures for us. Glad to help any way I can, Sergeant. I hope you get the men that shot this cop. You're sure gonna try, aren't you? Yeah, Eddie. We're sure gonna try. The next step was for Ben and I to make a complete report to Chief Ed Backstrand. They got Lindsay, huh? That Fred Lindsay an auto theft? Yeah, that's right. Good cut. You say he wounded two out of the three in that holdup? Yeah. That means they'll have to have medical attention in a hurry. We'll check all the small hospitals, cover all the drugstores to get a line on anyone who's bought medical supplies in the last hour. Mm -hmm. As soon as medical detail notifies Ms. Lindsay, I'd like to go over and see her. Smith and the medical details out there now. By the time you get back, we may have a flash in the drugstores or hospitals. We'll be back in 30 minutes. Call them when you get out there. Right, Ed. You might carry this with you. Yeah. I'm sick. I'm sick to my stomach about this thing. I want you to get those two bit punks. I don't want them to see another sunrise. Got that, haven't you? Yeah, Ed. Let's go, Ben. Chandler? Yes, sir. Put out an APB. Have communications broadcast the descriptions of these suspects every 30 minutes until further notice. Hello, Joe. Come in. Thanks, Ruth. Sit down. Ruth, you know how we all feel. It's all right, Joe. You're married to a cop, I guess you're meant to expect things like this. He'll like that. Fred and I used to discuss the possibility of this. We used to worry about him. We used to worry a lot, Joe. And some of those nights when he was away and the days, we used to worry. Now I know he's safe. Anything you want or you need? Thanks, no, Joe. Anything at all that I can do? Yes, Joe. I think there's something you can do. You and Ben are assigned to this case, aren't you? That's right. Then be careful. Thinking that you and Ben will have to face those killers. Ben's life. Be careful, Joe. Yeah, Ruth, we will. 
Okay. Well, I figured that you men did this to Fred more than anything I want that. No more heartache. Yeah. Thanks for coming by, Joe. How'd you take it, Joe? Let's go. Joe, Joe, how'd you take it? You're married, Ben. You figure it. It was 11.30 when we got back to Central Division. As we walked into the squad room, Backstrand was waiting for us. Righty, we just got our first lead. We've located a druggist who said he sold some medical supplies to a man about 45 minutes ago. Here's the address. Pretty close to the scene of the shooting. How about to see him right away? The Rex Pharmacy was exactly 14 blocks from the Red Feather Bar where the shooting took place. Rex Pharmacy was like your corner drugstore, complete with apothecary jars and shower curtains. The druggist was the same little man who has been prescribing sulfur and molasses since you were a kid in school. He's just about ready to close. What can I do for you, gentlemen? We're from the police department. Oh, I've been halfway expecting you fellows. We got a report that you sold some medical supplies to a man about an hour ago. Yes, sir, that's right. It's like I was telling those other officers that were here a while ago. There was something funny about that little fellow. How do you mean? Well, for one thing, he came in here sweating quite a bit. Of course, it's a warm night, but he seemed terribly nervous. Anybody with him? No, he was all by himself. What did he buy? Well, it wasn't so much what he bought, but how much. What do you mean? You know how most people buy iodine, a little ten-cent bottle. He bought a couple of pints. Then there was all that gauze and adhesive tape. Bought enough to repair a small army. Cotton, box of swabs. Then he asked me something that made me wonder. What was that? Asked me if I had something to probe with. That's just the way he said it. Something to probe with. I asked him, oh, what do you want to probe for? What did he say? Said a splinter. I told him a sewing needle would do the trick. He said forget it, and then he paid me and walked out. Mm -hmm. Did you describe the man? Mm -hmm. He was a small man, dark. Like I said, awful nervous. You think you could identify him? Oh, sure I could, if I ever saw him. Well, did he leave on foot, or was there a car outside? Uh, left in a cab, parked right out in front. Couldn't miss it. Uh, did you happen to take down the license number? Well, no, I didn't. But I did jot down the taxi cab number. Uh, would that help? Taking down cab numbers isn't exactly in a druggist's line, but because he had the presence of mind to do that one small thing... We accomplished in ten minutes what could have well taken as many weeks. Maybe with this small wedge, we could do what Backstrand wanted us to do. Get the killers before another sunrise. Well, it was close to midnight when we stepped into the drugstore phone booth. I called the cab company, got the night supervisor. I gave him the number of the cab, and he checked his location chart. Cab 375 was operating out of a stand at Wilshire and Greenhaven. He was the right driver, and he remembered the fare. Sure, I know who you mean. A little guy seemed in a big hurry. It was a long fare, though. I took him out to Inglewood. Uh, wait till I check my log sheet. I'll give you the exact address. Hello? 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 Here it is, Joe. 1523 Imperials. In the room in half. Yeah, come on. We'll check with the landlady. Kind of late, Joe. Yeah. Let's stand away from the door, huh? Might not be the landlady who answers. Yes, what do you want? Police department. Let me see your badge. There you are, ma'am. I'm Sergeant Friday. This is Romero. Homicide. All right. Now, what do you want? I run a good, clean rooming house It's here. not the house, lady. It's one of your tenants. Which one? That's what we want you to help us on. Look, do you men know what time it is? Come back here in the morning. Sorry, this can't wait till morning. Well, I'm not going to invite you in. We'll talk right here on the porch and keep your voices down. My tenants work during the day. Whatever you say, ma'am. Now, what is it you want to know? We're looking for a small, dark man. Well, I got three here. Could fit that description. No, he came in late tonight, about 45 minutes ago. I wouldn't know about that. I don't spy on my people. This is very important. You'll have to keep your voices down. Sorry. He's dark and he's small. Well, I didn't just say he was dark. He must mean Mr. Kendall. What's he done? What's his room number? He's in room 10, but I can't allow you to tramp up and down the stairs. At this hour, you'll wake all my rumors. We'll be as quiet as he wants us to be. What do you mean by that? Is there going to be trouble? I don't know, lady. Uh, where do we find number 10? The end of the hall, last room on the right, and keep your voices down. If you'll just wait in your room, lady, we'll call you if we want you. Okay, here we are. The 
keep the door clear, Ben. We might have trouble. Think they're all in there? We'll know in a minute. Who is it? What do you want? <coughs> Police department. Hey. I'll try this loaded, Joe. What do you want with me? What are you looking for? Close it's empty. What'd you say your name was? Tendo, Bob Tendo. New name, but same face, huh, Joe? Yeah, how long you been out of jail, Tenny? My name ain't Tenny, it's Tendo. Your name's not Tendo, it's Sam Tenny. We sent you up on a robbery charge four years ago, and isn't that right, Tenny? No, it's not right. You got the wrong man. I never been in jail. Yes, you have, because we sent you there. Now, come on. Who'd you buy the medical supplies for? I don't know what you're talking about. Look, Tenny, it's a hot night and it's late, so let's cut out the smart talk, huh? Who'd you buy those medical supplies for? Tenny, look, you're a two-time loser right now. Who are you shielding? You got nothing on me. I ain't done a thing. We can prove that you bought those supplies tonight, and it can go kind of hard on you. So let's open up. I haven't been out of this room all night long. We got a druggist and a cab driver who will make a liar out of you. I still don't know a thing. That cab driver hauled you home here 45 minutes ago. Where were you? I was out on a date. Is that who you bought the medicine for? Ben, call the druggist and get that cab driver. We'll take Tenny downtown. All right, all right. All I did was buy the bandages and stuff. I got nothing else to do with this. Who'd you buy the stuff for? Now, you know everything else. You'll figure it out. Oh, now, look, punk. We know there were three of them. One of them killed a cop. We're going to get to them, and Tenny, you're not going to stand in our way. They killed somebody. They didn't tell me that. Who didn't tell you? I don't want any part of murder. I'm going to tell you who it was, but I'm clean. I got nothing to do with it. I was trying to help them out of a jam. Who were you trying to help? It was Roy Bemis, Charlie Sickle, and Red Jans. They didn't tell me nothing about murder. Well, why'd you help? They offered me a pretty good piece of change to run an errand for me. You, you know, I got paid for. That's, that's all I had to do with it. Where did you deliver those medical supplies? I have to tell you that. I'm afraid of Jans. He's awful free with that shotgun. We'll give you protection. Now, where are they? Can I go to jail till you get them? You'll get protection. Give us the address. It's an apartment house. Just around the corner from here. The Blue Eagle. <laughs> We took Sam Tenney down to Central Division with us. On the way downtown, he told us that Red Jantz and the other two had their room at the Blue Eagle barricaded. Tenney said that they told him that they'd kill the first cop who tried to take him. Well, we knew they were wounded. He told us that Sickle had an arm wound, Bemis got it in the leg, and Jantz had a slug in his side. We figured they'd be weak from the loss of blood, and we could take them easy. You'll never take those guys easy. Sure, they lost a little blood, but they had enough fight left to stack that room. And they got enough left to kill you if you try to take them. On the way to headquarters, we stopped at an all-night drive-in and called Ed Backstrand. We told him we had a radio car watching the Blue Eagle. We gave him the whole story and told him we were on our way in. By the time we checked into Homicide, Ed had the plan all mapped out. It was 2.25 a.m. Here's the map from the city engineers. It's one city block bounded on the north by Hawthorne Street, on the south Lawndale Avenue, on the east 16th Street, and to the west 17th. The Blue Eagle apartment house is right here, on 16th and Hawthorne. West of the Blue Eagle is a private residence. South of the Blue Eagle on 16th is a vacant lot. There are 12 apartments in the building. The men we want are on the second floor, number 11. And that apartment faces east on 16th. How do you want to handle it, Ed? Now, Baker and Moorheim will evacuate the private residence. Friday, you and Romero clean out the apartment building. Right, Skim. All traffic is being diverted. The entire block is completely isolated. We'll throw up a cordon. As soon as we clear the residence, nobody goes in, nobody goes out. Will you brief us again when we get there, Ed? I'll give you all the briefing you need right now. Get this. These guys have already killed a cop. I don't want to lose any more. You know they're heavily armed and they're desperate. Have the men draw shotguns, tear gas, and tommy guns. I'll take care of that, Skip. All right. Now, we're not going in after these punks like tin horn heroes. We're going after them, and we're coming out alive. All of us. What time is it, Brady? 2.37. Not much time till sunup, is it? It was a code two. That means red light and move fast. Backstrand figured we needed six squad cars, four men to a car, the police public address truck, ambulance, and floodlights. Ben checked out the weapons to the men, and by 2.46, we pulled out of the Central Division garage. We slid into the area at 3.20 a.m. The six squad cars and the public address truck took up their positions. The floodlights were rigged and ready to turn on at Backstrand's command. The machinery was set to roll as soon as we got the neighborhood cleared. Ben and I evacuated the Blue Eagle apartment house. How many does that make, Joe? Well, we've cleared nine. Two to go. Here's apartment 10. The killers are right next door. Joe, I'd like to kick that door in right now. Take your time, Ben. We'll get to them. Quiet now. Hey, 
Why, what is it? Police department. May we come in? Yeah, of course. What's the trouble? No trouble. We're evacuating the building. Now, we'll have to ask you to leave for the back door. We'll notify you when to return. Please leave quietly and lock your door. What's huh? going on? No time to explain. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Okay, now, we'll skip 11 and go to 12. Yeah. Yeah. Who are you? Police department. Can we come in? Sorry to disturb you at this hour. We're evacuating the building. Please hurry and leave quietly by the back door. You'll be notified when to return. Lock your door when you leave. Thank you. It was 4.10 a.m. Everything was set now. The neighborhood was completely cleared. The entire block was empty except for apartment 11 on the second floor of the Blue Eagle. I left Ben to watch the door of apartment 11. I went downstairs and across the street to join the rest of the men. It was Ed Backstrand's show from here on. That's it, Ed. All set. Baker, Morheim, all clear? All clear, Chief. Baker, you and Morheim take three men and cover the rear of the building. Right. Is that detail covered Hawthorne Street? They're all set, Ed. How about the vacant lot? Taken care of. The rest of you men? Yeah. Grady and I are going into the building. We'll try to get them to come out now. Uh, Johnson. Yes, sir? Come with us and keep us covered. Let's go. Apartment 11's up at the head of the stairs, Ed. Right. Any action, Romero? Not a thing, Skipper. Keep down, all of you. I'll try to get them out. Jance, Demas, Sickle, you're all alone. The building's clear. Come on out with your hands behind your head. Come on out, Jance, or we'll come in and get you. You hear me? I hear you, Ed. Come on, let's get out to the street. Johnson, cover that door and be careful. Keep down. All right, Chief. Friday, Romero, come with me. We left Sergeant Johnson to watch the door, and we ran out on the 16th Street and ducked down behind the police sound truck. The floodlights hit the side of the building. Backstrand grabbed the microphone. Chance, Bemis, Sigel. You've got 30 seconds to come down out of that room. Walk out backwards with your hands behind your head. Stay together. Don't fan out. 30 seconds, Chance. <laughs> They're making it tough, Ed. Romero, lob some tear gas through that window. Right, Skipper. Come on out, Bemis. We're giving you a chance. That's more than you gave that cop in the bar. Come on out. That's Jance, Ed. He isn't coming out. They must have got Johnson because they're in another room. Shoot the gas in there. That's not going to get him out, Ed. Give it time, Freddy. Those floodlights in up there. Friday, rake that second floor with the Tommy gun. Let's keep them in one room. Right. Hold your fire, Franny. George, give us a couple of masks. Ben and I are going in. The rest of you men, concentrate your fire on those two rooms. Hit them down. Here's your mask, Joe. Let's go. Come on. Put that mask on, Ben, and keep down. Yeah, wait a minute. Somebody coming down the inside stairs. Duck, Ben, he's got a gun. I got one, copper. Get out of my way. Stop it, you. You haven't got a chance. I'm coming through, copper. I think I stopped him, Joe. Can you see Johnson? No, too much gas in there. All right, you two up there. We got one of you. The other two, come on out. Joe, think we got him? I don't know. Can you see Johnson? No, Joe, it's still too thick in there. I'm going in, Ben. Cover me. Come on. We know there are two of you up there. <laughs> Just one, copper. Throw your gun down the stairs ahead of you. Hurry up. Shotgun, Joe. Jance. I see him. I'll take him at the foot of the stairs. Uh, all right, I got my hands up. I found Johnson, Ben. All right, Jance, outside. Come on, move. Put the handcuffs on him, Ben. I'll cover you. Yeah. How's John? I don't know. Ed, get the ambulance crew over here. Jance, who's this other guy we got? Bemis. How about Sickle? I said just one, didn't I, copper? Never mind the smart talk, Jance. Now just answer the question, huh? Sickle wanted out of it a long time ago, so I let him out. He's upstairs. I let him out the back way. Mean you shot him? He wanted out, didn't he? All right. We'll take him in. Johnson's in the ambulance. Uh, I'll see you in the office. Yeah. Right, Skipper. How about a smoke, huh? No. Yeah. Here you go. Backstrand said he didn't want those men to see another sunrise. Yeah. Five minutes to five, Joe. It's 
Soon ought to be, huh? Yeah. But look, man. It's cloudy. Guess we'll never know, huh? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Edgar Red Jens, the sole survivor, was tried and convicted and sentenced to be put to death in the state penitentiary in the manner prescribed by law. You have just heard the fourth in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of C.B. Horrell, Chief of Police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to radio car patrolman Forrest E. Sawyer of the Denver, Colorado Police Department, who on the evening of March 8, 1937, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide. Somewhere in the tangled web of your city, there's a killer on the loose. A young woman has been brutally murdered. The weapon, a steel bludgeon. Your job is to get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, March 19th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 9.14 p.m. when I got to the old central jail building, third floor, the crime lab. Hi, Joe. Hi, coming, Lee. Just ran a spectrograph. What'd you find? The paint flake from the victim's head matches that paint on the hunk of pipe. Any prints? No, the pipe was clean, no latent prints. Well, that figured. Anything else? Got those blood test reports. A couple of slides for you to look at under the comparison mic. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lee. Oh, hi, Joe. Didn't hear you come in. What's it look like, Ben? Now, here's the blood test reports. This one is blood found on the piece of pipe. Mm, type A. This one's blood from the victim. Type A. They match. That's right, boys. Doesn't mean too much, though. Did you look at these slides under the microscope? No, not yet. Well, this is your clincher. Wait till I get the light. Okay, take a look. Mm-hmm. Got a make? Yeah, go ahead. Well, this slide here on the right... Mm-hmm. That's a slice of hair from the victim's head. On the other slide is hair found on the steel pipe. Yeah. She had wavy hair. Both specimens are flat. Same hair, Joe. You got anything on that piece of pipe, Lee? Mm, nothing. Just ordinary steel pipe. 14 inches long. What else you got? The plaster impressions of those footprints we found by the body. Here they are. Hmm. Crepe soles? Tennis shoes. New ones. Size 9. Good impression. Ground was soft. Man about 150 pounds, according to the length of stride, roughly about 5 feet 10 inches tall. Yeah, new shoes, all right. You can still read the manufacturer's label. That's right. Made by the Sport King Company. Well, that's something to follow up. Yeah, sure. You could start with the tennis courts. Only about 1,000 or so in L.A. Maybe you'd rather track down the brand. These particular tennis shoes are the biggest sellers in the country. Yeah. 
Where'd you like to start, Minneapolis or Pullman, Washington? What about that glove? Yeah, you might look for a missing glove. Yeah. They go well with the shoes, just about as common. White cotton work gloves with a blue top. Here's the right glove, you find the left one. Blood on a glove? High pay. Well, that's good evidence, Jones, but where's the lead? Now, look, I don't ask you to pay my parking tickets. You want to see blow-ups? Yeah, okay. Right over here. Oh, uh, yeah. This is the vacant lot where they found the body. Yeah, that's right. Here's a close-up of her showing the location of the murder weapon, the glove, and the footprints relative to the position of the body. Looks as bad as yesterday. Sure did work her over, didn't it? The rest of these are morgue shots. Interested? No, I checked them this morning. Once is enough, Lee. Yeah, that winds it, boy. You want to go over the stuff in her purse again? You find anything more? No, nothing you haven't seen already. The usual. Makeup, comb, barrette. That's a hair clip. Mm -hmm. A few cheap stones in it. Loose change, a quarter, nickel, a few pennies. Her ID card. Mm. Ellen Corday. 33 Naomi Place. Age 21. 21. That's not very old, is it, Lee? Not to die. No. Helen Corday. Who could kill Helen Corday? Why? Why do you say that, Mr. Meyer? Well, people kill for money. They, they kill for love. Helen Corday had none of these. No boyfriend? Not in here. No, she was a good worker. Five different waiters, says the union, sends me one month. Five! Did the union send Helen to you? Oh, sure, sure. All the girls come from the union, but none like Helen. Oh, she was sweet, honest, and courteous. Mr. Meyer, did you know anything about her personal life? Only that she was a good worker. Everything else she took home with her from this place. Did she ever mention any men to you, anyone at all? No gentleman, not one. No. How much money did she make here? I paid her $26.50 a week, every Tuesday. And not much salary for so much work, but the tips are very good here. Nice customers. Mm -hmm. nice this is her home address, 33 Naomi Place? 33 Naomi, that's right, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Marr, for your time. I wonder what kind of a person does things like this. Who could kill Helen Cordy? Everybody liked Helen. Helen Cordy? I never liked her. Come on in the office, boys, where we can talk. Never liked her, because I never knew her. You the head of the union? Not just a steward. I know most of the girls. This Corday girl, what was she what did she look like? Small brunette, about five three. Oh, here's a picture. Yeah. Pretty girl, wasn't she? Oh, sure, sure. Play Strada Dotto's place. Nice little Dutch fella. Out of Meyer. That's right. He seemed to think quite a lot of her. Hey, yeah, she was a fine worker. Oh, sure. Always right up on her dues. Paid all the assessments right on time. Thought you said you didn't know her. Well, not right off, I didn't. But when you showed me that picture there, placed her right away. Do you know anything about her personal life? Now, wait a minute. Why all these questions? Helen Corday was murdered last night. Oh. Who did it? Do you know anything about her personal life? Well, you can see my position, Sergeant. 1,200 girls. Check them in, check them out. Oh, just names to me till I see a picture of them. You wouldn't know if she had any boyfriends here in the Union? Waiters, busboys? That I wouldn't know. Like I tell you, Sergeant, I never knew Helen Corday. Sure, I knew Helen Corday. Gus plays a nice piano, huh, Sergeant? Yeah. I read about it in the paper this morning. How long have you been selling pianos here at this place? About as long as I knew Helen. Three years. How'd you find me? Helen's landlady, we talked to her yesterday. She told us she worked here at this piano store. Oh. Funny, isn't it? What funny? See Gus over there? That fellow demonstrating the piano? A few weeks ago, I made a deal with him to give Helen piano lessons. I figured it would help her with her singing lessons. She wanted to be a singer, you know. Did Helen know that fellow, Gus? No, she never met him. Who gave her the singing lessons, Miss Olsen? She took from Ostrander. Paul Ostrander, out on Melrose. A lot of movie people used to take from him. What do you know about her personal life? How do you mean? Does she have any boyfriends? Well, yes. You don't seem sure, Miss Olsen. Well, it's just that I don't know. I never asked Helen. But she did have a few dates with Paul Ostrander. I don't think she was serious. How about Ostrander? Well, gee, I, I don't know, Sergeant. I don't want to involve anybody. You want to help us find the killer, don't you? Yes, but if you're thinking Paul Ostrander did it, 
No, I'm sure he didn't kill her. That's all for today, Victoria. No, gentlemen, I did not kill Helen Corday. You gave her singing lessons, Mr. Ostrander. You knew her pretty well? Yes, I gave her voice coaching for about a year and a half. Helen showed a little promise. Not a great voice, a bad vibrato. You knew her pretty well. Why do you say that? Mr. Ostrander, didn't you used to take her out once in a while? No. No, I didn't know Helen socially at all. We know you had dates with her. That's not true. Only times I saw her was when she came here to the studio for lessons. You better tell the truth, Mr. Ostrander. We can prove that you've been out with her. Afraid of the publicity, is that it? Certainly that's it. I have a successful business here. I've spent years building it. Anything like this would ruin me. Then you have been out with her. Only a few times. Nothing serious. I had nothing to do with her murder. Now, that's the truth. Don't you know that withholding information about a thing like this can go kind of hard for you? Yes, I know that. What else could I do? Mr. Ostrander, somewhere in this city right now, there's a guy who beat a young girl to death. He crushed her skull with a piece of steel pipe. We need every bit of information we can get to track him down. I know that, John. You could have come to us. We wouldn't run to the newspapers with it. If the information's confidential, that's the way we treat it. Most of the time, it's the people who run to the newspapers first. Then they come to us. That's right, Mr. Ostrander. People are their own press agents. Sergeant, I'd like to know what right you have to invade my privacy and lecture me on my civic duty. All right, I'll tell you what right, Ostrander. We want the man who murdered Helen Corday. I got as much right as he had at 12.14 this morning. Come on, Joe. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Ostrander. Sorry if I invaded your privacy. Chief of Detectives, orders. Hannon. No, I'm sorry, ma'am. You got the wrong extension. Try 2511. You're welcome. Hi, Friday, Romero. Chief's been looking for you. Thank you, Mike. Come on, Joe. Yeah. Hello, Joe. Ben, sit down. What'd you get? A notebook full of notes, a crime lab full of evidence, nothing to tie them together. Uh, these some of the people you interviewed? Yeah, those and about a dozen more we didn't even take notes on. It's hard to figure, Skipper. Everybody seemed to like this girl. Helen Corday, no known relative. Single, unattached girl, living all alone in the city. Few friends and no enemies, none we can find anyway. Are you uh, satisfied that all the people you interviewed are in the clear? Well, if we're going to stick to the simple robbery motive, we are kind of money Helen Corday made wouldn't interest those people. How are you doing on the outside leads? Nothing. We could just find one hole someplace, anything. All right, now look. You've got a lab full of evidence across the street. You've got a book full of names here. You've got the pieces. Now fit them together. They just don't add. Well, go over them and keep going over them until they do add. Anything from the informants? No, nothing so far. No tips on anybody that's been dough lately. <laughs> Nobody's shooting off their mouth. Uh, the guy we want won't advertise. Figures himself a pretty smooth operator. But he probably made a mistake somewhere along the line. We'll find him. Got a hot shot, Ed. Yeah? 3220 Casino. Woman, probable attack. All right, Friday. You and Ben run it down. We ran down the hot shot call for 3220 Casino. Turned out to be a typical dead-end lead. Her name was Mrs. Lillian Horn. For the past five years, Mr. Horn had been paid regularly on Wednesdays. He spent all day Thursday drinking up his paycheck and beating his wife. The call had no connection with the Corday murder. We made the usual call into communications. Unit 80K to Control 1, 80K to Control 1. Control 1 to 80K, go ahead. On that probable attack, 3220 Casino, code 4. 80K, roger. 80K to Control 1, KMA 367. That was the beginning. For the next three days, we followed up every lead and every call, but they were all blind. All units were alerted, and they had as much information on the killer of Helen Corday as we did. Ben and I cruised throughout the entire Central Division. We covered every probable call that might have some connection with the murder. Attention, Unit 41R. 1654 Swanson Terrace. A woman, victim of probable attack. Code 3. Unit 41R. It didn't make any difference what the call was. If there was a possibility it might tie in with the Corday murder, we ran it down. We made it a 24-hour job. So far, if the killer made a mistake, we hadn't been able to find it. The Corday funeral was on Monday. They were all there. The girl's landlady, the voice teacher, Ostrander, 
her girlfriend, Marie Olson, the man from the union, and her boss, Otto Meyer. But nobody else we hadn't checked. That was Monday afternoon. Monday night, we went back to the old routine, tracking calls during the night in the squad car, picking up small threads that led nowhere. Three more days of the same thing. Thursday morning, one week after we found Helen Corday's body, we got an anonymous phone tip. I know who killed Helen Corday. His name's George Barlow. He lives at 418 White Oak Avenue. He used to date her up all the time. Get him and you've got the murderer. We checked George Barlow and about ten others just like him. None of them knew Helen Corday. Saturday night, Ben and I were back in the squad car cruising the Central Division. Saturday night's a good night for robbery. By 10 p.m., we'd run down four various calls. 123, Cross 1. 123, Roger. 12G, call your station. In the 13R, 1254 Tower Road. A woman screaming. Investigating trouble. Call 2. Let's handle that one, Ben. Yeah, okay. I'll notify communications. Unit 80K to Control 1. 80K to Control 1. Control 1 to Unit 80K. Go ahead. On your 1254 Tower Road call, we're in the vicinity. We will handle. 80K, Roger. 80K to Control 1, TMA 367. Let's go, Ben. Control 1 to 13R. Disregard your last call. Handled by 80K. It should be right about here. Oh, now. Here it is. 1254. <laughs> that man is trying to kill me. He's running down the street. Where? He's getting to that car he tried to kill me. Come on. Where'd he go, Joe? Turn right at the next corner. That's him up ahead. Got a good lead on us. Hit the siren. He's gaining, Joe. Took a left at the next corner. Oh, he isn't going to stop. Close in as tight as you can, Ben. Down to the floor now. Swing out to the left a little. I'm going for his tires. Right. That'll slow him down. Pull up on him. Yeah. All right, you. Keep both hands on that wheel and get over to the curb. Cover me, Joe. Right. Out of that car, mister. Shake him down. Hey, take it easy, will you? I haven't got a gun. Put the cuffs on him. Hey, this horse works fast. What am I doing with the gas chamber? Just save that, mister. It's pretty rough treatment for speeding. All right, man. come on, you. Look, I, I got a right to know where you're taking me. What's the charge? We'll let the girl tell you. What girl? You can sit there and be quiet, huh? Oh, I know where you're going. The place back on Tar Road. Well, I asked to use the phone. The girl slammed the door in my face. I don't know what you cops are trying to prove. I just wanted to use the phone, that's all. I even tried to scare her a little. I, I told her I'd hit her over the head if she didn't let me use the phone. It's a laugh, huh? All right, you get out. Yeah, that's the place where I... Get out. Okay. I got nothing to hide. That little girl's gonna lie. You know that, don't you? Who's there? Police officers. Ah! It's the man. That's him. He tried to kill me. His full name's Frank Philip Larson. They had no previous record. This the uh, girl's report? Yeah, that's it, Skipper. Uh, Judy Scott. How old is she? She's 19. She's a babysitter. Real tough boy, isn't he? Forced his way into the house. Beat her about the neck and arms. A tire iron. We found it in his car. Jones is running it through the crime lab. Ask her if she had any money. He told him no. Struck her again. Where's this Larson live? Hotel out near Santa Monica. The clothing salesman, Ed, works for a big men's store, Burns and Company. According to the house book sales record, he bought a pair of tennis shoes two weeks ago. Weighs 158 pounds, 5 foot 11 inches. The tennis shoes are missing. They're not in his hotel room. He's not wearing it. What else did you find? A rhinestone. You mean a pin? No, just a small loose stone recovered from the rug in Larson's room. Crime lab got it? Working on it now. Ed, I think we got the man who killed Helen Corday. <laughs> A few scraps of circumstantial evidence and a hunch. That's not much to go on. Larson had gone after the little Scott girl with a tire iron. Wasn't much of a tie-in, but we had to be sure. 
All that day, we checked Frank Larson's alibi for the night of Helen Corday's murder. We interviewed the personnel manager at Burns & Company where he worked. We talked to all the clerks who knew him, the manager of the hotel where he lived. We found out everything we could about Frank Larson. And that night at 10 o'clock, we had the prisoner brought to the interrogation room. How are you, Larson? Fine. Just fine. I like jail. Sit down. Lousy weather. Been foggy all over town. I wouldn't know. I've been inside all day. How old are you, Larson? 31. Same as the last time you asked me. Where'd you go to school? I didn't. I was born smart. You sell clothes, don't you, Larson? We know you work for Burns and Company. Remember, you told us. What is all this? What are you guys trying to build? Just want to know if you like selling clothes. That's all. What do you coppers know about clothes? One blue surge a year is your speed. You know quite a bit about clothes, don't you? I've been selling them for five years. Can you tell me something I've been wondering about? What's that? Are your socks and tie always supposed to match? That's what the style books say. Bet you always know the right things to wear, don't you? You wouldn't wear black shoes with a brown suit, would you? Is that what you're keeping me here for? Style, isn't it? Oh, would you? Would you wear black shoes with a brown suit? Most people wouldn't. Bet you wouldn't wear brown shoes with a tuxedo, either. I've been smoking too much. You got a glass of wine? Oh, yeah, sure. There you are, Lord. Hmm? Nice. That's good and cold. How about it? Would you ever wear brown shoes with a tux? Nobody would. That's a navy blue flannel you got on there, isn't it? Yeah. Good-looking suit. Stop around sometime. Get you a good deal. Suit like that flannel there you're wearing. You'd never wear tennis shoes with an outfit like that, would you? What do you think? I think you did. I think you wore them the night you killed Helen Corday. Who? Maybe you didn't have the blue suit on, but you were wearing tennis shoes. Sport King, size 9. Sell for five ninety five. You picked them up at a discount. Cost you three and a quarter. Where'd you get that? Out of the house book, Burns and Company. You wouldn't have those shoes around now, would you? We couldn't find them in your hotel room. Your boss, Mr. Craig, used to think a lot of you, Larson. Before you started drinking on the job, your commissions used to run pretty high up the last couple of months. What happened? That cheap ride get to you? Well, you two really nosed around, didn't you? When are you going to tell me what I eat for breakfast? Cornflakes, cup of coffee, donut, sometimes two donuts when you're hungry. Elsie waits on you at the Royal Cafe. She gets a dime tip. <laughs> nice some more of that water. Help yourself, there's a cooler. Sure good and cold. How about it, Larson? Where are the tennis shoes? They wore out. In three weeks? Can't be very good tennis shoes. No, they didn't wear out. What'd you do with them? You know all the answers. You figure it out. We know you bought the tennis shoes. We don't know where they are now. We know you had them. Size nine. Three feet from the body of Helen Corday, we found two size nine footprints made by a pair of Sport King tennis shoes. We figured the man weighed about 150 pounds. You weigh 158. Figured he's about five foot ten. You're 5'11". You come awful close to being the same build as the man who killed Helen Corday, don't you, Larson? And you wear the same size tennis shoes, same brand name. A lot of people wear nines. It's the average size. They sell a lot of Sport Kings, too. Everybody wears them. If we could find your pair, it might make a difference. Doesn't mean your tennis shoes made the prints with a body. Doesn't prove it it didn't, neither. What'd you do with them, Larson? I threw them away. That's too bad. Might make a difference. Oh, what difference could it make? I threw them away, that's all. Well, how about the mate to this glove? I never saw it before. Found this right-hand glove by the body of Helen Corday. Just an ordinary cotton work glove. Everybody wears them. If we could find the missing left glove, why, well, might make a difference. Size medium. That's average, too, isn't it, Larson? I never saw work gloves. I wouldn't know. No, but you bought work gloves, haven't you? Not a pair of those. I mean like this, don't you? We only got one. What kind of work gloves did you buy? I didn't buy any. You just said you did. I never said I bought any work gloves. You bought tennis shoes, though, didn't you? I Sport... told you I bought the tennis shoes. Didn't I tell you I bought them? No, you didn't tell us. We told you. Found out from Burns and Company where you were. All right, you told me. I bought them. You know that. Same kind of tennis shoes that made footprints by Helen Corday's butt. It wasn't me. Then why won't you tell us what you did with them? I've shoes? already told you. I threw them away. They were only three weeks old. Must have worn out awful fast. I didn't say they wore out. They got too dirty. No, you told us they wore out. Remember, Larson? I don't remember what I told you, but I don't have them now. We know you don't have them now. Where are they? Who told us? They got too dirty. Right, Larson? Yes. Yes, yes, that's what I said. Anyhow, you haven't got them now. No, I haven't got them now. All right, now, just for the record, Larson, which was it? Did they get too dirty or did they wear out? Whatever I said before. You said both before, Larson. All right, I said both. You haven't got anything on me. We got that little Scott girl statement from last night. She says you tried to kill her. She's lying. I told you she'd lie, didn't I? 
I only wanted to use the phone. She says you hit her with a tire iron. Did you hit her with that iron? No, I only tried to scare her. I didn't hit her with anything. Then how'd you get those marks around her neck and arm? Police doctor says they were made by that tire iron. I don't care what your doctor says. I didn't hurt her. Now, what do you mean, Larson? You didn't hurt her or you didn't hit her with that tire Neither iron? Neither one. I just wanted to use a phone. How'd you know she had a phone? I didn't know if she had a phone. I just went up to find out. To find out what? To find out if I could use her phone. But you said you didn't know if she had a phone. I don't know anything the way you twist everything around. Sorry, Larson. You only want the truth. How about a cigarette? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I could use one. Here's Lack. Larson, where were you Wednesday night, March 18th? How many times are you going to ask me that same question? Just want to make sure we got it right. I told you this morning. I went to a show. I got out about 11, had a beer, and I went home. What time did you get home? About 11.30. Did you stay home? I went to bed. What did you see at the show? I never remember the names. You ought to try to remember this, and it's pretty important. Well, it was a deluxe theater. It was Spencer Tracy and something. What was on when you walked in? The news. I never go in in the middle of a picture. Neither do I. Spoilers them for me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The girl in the box office doesn't remember seeing you go I in. She know. It was Keno night. There was a big crowd. Did you win anything? I never do. Anybody hit the jackpot? I don't remember. They give away a lot of money in those neighborhood theaters. I always remember who hits the jackpot. Well, all right, you do. I don't. You remember if anybody won the jackpot? I told you, no. Do they have a jackpot at that show? I guess they do. I don't know. You know, it was Keno night. You should know if they had a jackpot. Maybe they had a jackpot. I don't know. I went out for a smoke. You said the cartoon was on when you walked in. Why do you always twist what I say? I told you the news was on when I went in. You remember anything about the newsreel? It was ten days ago. How do I know it was in it? I only know it was a newsreel. I saw it. You're lying, Larson. We checked your alibi. The manager of the theater had to cut the newsreel Wednesday night because the show was running long with Keno night. You didn't go to the show Wednesday night, did you? All right, maybe I didn't. I don't remember. What's the difference? The difference is you could have been in that vacant lot the same night, the night Helen Corday was murdered. I didn't kill her. You can't prove I did. Interrogation room, Friday. Hiya, Jones. It did, huh? You're positive. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Lee. Sure you don't want to tell us what you did with those tennis shoes? I'm not going to go back over all that. I've told you guys all I'm going to tell you. You know how the Corday girl was murdered? How would I know? I don't know anything about it. She was on her way home from work, as usual, about midnight. Of course, you were home in bed about that time. But you didn't go to the show that night, Larson. On her way home, Helen Corday always took a shortcut across a vacant lot. She was about halfway through the lot when the murderer tried to grab her purse. She screamed and he struck her. Hit her several times with a piece of steel pipe 14 inches long. He beat her to death with that piece of steel pipe. Then he dropped the pipe in the right-hand cotton work glove. He left two footprints, size nine, sports king tennis shoes. I know all that. Well, here's something you don't know. When the killer scooped the paper money out of that girl's purse, he accidentally took along a loose rhinestone, a stone that fell out of a cheap barrette in the bottom of her bag. He carried that stone home with him. When he reached in his pocket to pull out the money he stole from her, the rhinestone fell on the floor. So? We found that rhinestone on the rug in your hotel room. Well, I haven't lived in that hotel room all my life. Maybe the tenant before me dropped it there. No, not this one. We checked the cement that held it in that barrette. It matches the glue on the stone. No, Larson, that rhinestone came from the hair clip that Helen Corday wore before she was murdered. That's enough to take you to the district attorney with. What am I supposed to say? We want you to tell us the truth. Why did you kill Helen Corday? Yeah. Not the sandwiches and coffee now, Sergeant? Bring them in, Mike. Looks like we're going to be here a long time. Yeah, I brought you ham, cheese, and liverwurst. And some fruit. Coffee's black. Cream and sugar on the side. Mm, thanks, Mike. Yeah, it looks good. What kind do you want, Larson? Ham, cheese, liverwurst. Oh, you're not hungry? Okay. Sandwich, Joe? No, thanks. I think I'll have an apple. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I fixed you a plate there, Larson. My coffee's right here. It's a fine apple. Mm. Nice and fresh. This is this a Washington apple? No, I don't know. Is that coffee hot enough? No, it's fine. Where'd Mike pick these up? Well, <clears throat> in Frosty Street. At least? No, hmm. No, it tastes good. Well, drink your coffee anyway, Larson. It's getting cold. All right! All right! I didn't want to kill her. She screamed and I hit her. All I wanted was her purse. That's all I wanted. She... She wouldn't give to me. She had to fight back, so I hit her. I, I didn't want to kill her. All she had to do was give me the purse. I wouldn't have hurt her. I, 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 was, I was drinking, and I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I was drunk. I was drunk. I didn't, I didn't mean to kill her. I, I, I didn't mean to kill her. Mike, <laughs> stay with him. We'll call the stenographer.
See you tomorrow, Joe. Good night. Yeah. Sour racket, huh? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Frank Philip Larson was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the fifth in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to police officer Charles A. Brady of the Chicago, Illinois Police Department, who on the night of September 2nd, 1945, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. A ruthless fiend roams the streets of your city masquerading as a police officer. For months, helpless citizens have been robbed, beaten senseless, and kidnapped. The criminal is a twisted genius, vicious, cunning. Your job is to get him. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files, from beginning to end, from crime to punishment. Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, June 4th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch on a robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from communications, and it was 11.13 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Oh, hi, Joe. Hi, Ben. You got that message to call home? Yeah, bad news. What's the matter? That doggone kid of mine, chicken pot. Oh, again? Last year, it was a month. The year before that, the measles. Every time I get set for a vacation, he decides to catch something. Well, forget it, Ben. Think what a comfort he's going to be in your old age. Go ahead, laugh. You'll find out. Yeah. How are you, Friday? Romero? Fine. What can we do for you? You don't look like you remember me. Oh, no, wait a minute. Name's Savage, isn't it? George? Johnny, Sergeant. Johnny Savage, you remember now? Oh, sure. Those liquor store robbers out in the Wilshire district. About six, seven years ago, wasn't it? Ten years, Romero. You ought to remember that. You went to trial. We testify in court every week. Ten years is a long time. It's longer in the state pen. It's a lot longer. Now, you cried a little at that trial, didn't you, Savage? You said we beat that confession out of you. Yeah, that's why I figured I'd drop in for a little visit. I kind of apologize to you fellas. You gave me a square deal, I... I guess I kind of lost my head. I figured I'd apologize. Oh, that's all right, Savvy. When'd you get out? A couple of weeks ago. I did it the hard way. Served ten flats. I don't own my day. You find a job yet? Yeah, Friday. I'm working nights. What kind of a job? Laborer in a warehouse, south end of town. Good. You decided to level? Ten years in prison's a long time. You learn a lot of things. Nights are long. You think a lot. You get things straightened out. I hope you mean that. Sure I mean it, Friday. I've got everything straightened out. I know who my friends are, and I know who to watch out for. You sound like maybe you're on the right track. I got it figured, Romero. And like you two fellas, you caught me red-handed, and you sent me up for ten years. Well, you did all right, Savage. Five armed robberies. You got off pretty easy. You got a break, Savage. Make the best of it. Sure, I'm not kicking. Ten years, a real break. That's right. Well, 
Uh, just dropped in for a little visit. Maybe I'll see you fellas sometime. All right, Savvy. Keep your nose clean? Sure. No hard feelings. No? You just took ten years of my life. That's all. There's no such thing as a man going through prison without changing. And Ben and I have seen him switch in both directions. Some men learn their lesson after they land behind bars, and when they're released, they turn into good citizens. Johnny Savage was sour. We made a mental note to check him out later on, and then we went down to the record bureau and pulled his coming out mug. That's about all that we had time for, because about an hour later, we started to get busy. Hot shot, Joe. Grab it. On the corner of Selma and Naples, the drugstore, 211, and probable attack. On the corner of Selma and Naples, 211, and probable... What you got, Joe? Selma and Naples, 211 and attack. Come on. Here we are, Joe. Hold the on the far corner. Yeah. All right. Come on. We got the story from the victim, the store owner, Mr. Thomas. For the most part, it was the usual rundown of an early morning holdup. There was only one exception. Oh, I've had young Hoodlum try to hold me up before, but there was nothing like this one. How you mean, Mr. Thomas? Well, he came in here just before closing, and ordinarily I'd have kept an eye out because that's the time to look for him. But this fellow came to the door and said he was a policeman, so I let him in. He looked like a cop. Boyd's right up to me and the wife behind the counter and pointed a gun. And she screamed, and he hit her in the face with the butt of the gun. Sergeant, it, it was horrible. That's the way it started, and that's the way it kept going. Because most of the victims and most people don't realize that as a citizen, they have the right to check on police officers' identification when in doubt. After we got the story from Mr. Thomas and checked the store in the neighborhood, Ben and I headed back to the office. Attention, all units. At the end of North Baxter Road near Hillcrest, victim of 211 in slugging. Car 7172, take the call, code 3. Attention, all That's four blocks away from the last one. Let's roll on it, huh, Ben? Right, I'll hit the fire and you get the light. By the time Ben and I got up to the end of North Baxter, the men from car 71 were already there. The victim was telling his story. His face looked like it had been through a meat grinder. I was just shifting the car into second to make the hill when I hear this siren behind me and I, I see this red light flashing in the side view mirror. So naturally, I pulled over to the curb and... I was just reaching for my driver's license when the cop runs up, yanks me out of the car, and starts clubbing me in the face with the butt of his gun. Did you get a look at him? Think you can describe it? No, I'm afraid not. He swung me around and kept me staring into that red light on his car all the time he was beating me. After a while, everything just went black. When I woke up, my wallet was gone, all my money... Forty-five minutes later, Ben and I were interviewing the third victim, a young housewife out in the Wilshire district. Same trademark. <laughs> I tried to tell him, I tried to tell him I didn't have any money, but he wouldn't listen. He kept holding me by the throat, beating me with his fist like he enjoyed it. He, 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 yeah, all right, all right, Mrs. Jameson. Could you tell us how he got in the house? He came in the front door and rang the bell. I opened the door, but I left the burglar chain on. He said he was a policeman. So when he demanded I open the door all the way, I did. And he grabbed me. And you can't describe the man for us, Miss Jameson. He was tall, and he had dark hair and big hands. It was like a nightmare. Oh, it was like a nightmare. Tall, dark hair, big hands. Your guess the same as mine, Joe? Maybe. Let's wait and see. Come on, let's check with the boss. Hi, Mike. Hi. He's waiting for you. In there. Come on, Ben. Chief of Detectives Office. Hand him. Sit down. Yeah, Skipper. All right, you two. Let's have it. The guy with the red light? Yes, the guy with the red light posing as a policeman. Why hasn't he been picked up? You know as much about it as we do, Ed. We got our first call around midnight. He knocked over a drugstore out on Selma. He hasn't stopped working since. Didn't you get any definite lead on him? No description? No license number? Nothing. He's tall, big hands, dark hair. That's all. Fine. Either of you got any ideas? Could be anybody, Skipper, with that description. You're sure it wasn't anybody on the force? We sent all the victims down to personnel. Lowry showed him the mug book of all police officers. Wasn't one of our men. Works fast. Drugstore, motorist, a pedestrian, a housewife out in the Wiltshire district. Went right in the house after her. Four of them, right in a row. Five. 
Huh? There's a 20-year-old kid in the next room. Came in just before you got here. A couple of hours ago, he was sitting in the car with his girl up in Mulholland Drive. This red light bandit comes along, slugs him, and kidnaps the girl. Kidnaps? She still miss? Not a trace. When did this happen? A couple of hours ago. They brought the kid over from Georgia Street Hospital. We can talk to him now. He's had a bad time. Right in here. Okay. Pete, we're going to have to ask you a few more questions. Oh, yeah. Okay. It feels a little better now. This is Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero. Hi, Pete. Hi. Can you tell us what time the trouble started? Oh, about... 10.15, 10.30. Sally and I were sitting in the car talking about where we were going on our honeymoon. We're going to be married next month. And then this car pulls up behind us and starts flashing a red spotlight on us. And a guy runs over and pulls open the door. He said he was a cop. Did you get a good look at his car, Pete? I think it was a black sedan. Did you get a look at the man, Pete? No. No, I didn't. It was pretty dark, and he kept me staring into that red spotlight. It all happened so fast. Then he started slugging me, and I went down. What happened then? Well, the next thing I knew, Sally was screaming. He had one hand on her throat, and he had her backed up against the side of the car. He was beating her with the other hand. So some kind of a short billy club. Well, I got up, and I started for him, and he slugged me again. When I came to, Sally was gone. Anybody check the area up there, Ed? Yeah, Davis and Griffin didn't find a thing. Oh, Sergeant, you got to find it. you got to. I wouldn't know what to tell her folks. I... I wouldn't know what to say. That's all right, Pete. We'll find her. You take it easy. Got a hot shot, Ed, up in Summit Road near Westmore. A woman, unconscious. Ambulance follow-up. Possible dead body. Uh, all right, Hannon. Look after Pete here. Friday, Romero, let's go. Up ahead, Romero, to the right. Okay, Skip. Yeah, there's the ambulance and the cruiser car. You're a lonely nothing, spot. All right, come on. Hiya, Doc. What'd you find? Hiya, fellas. Right over here. Just gonna take her in. Uh, where'd you find her? Over there, by the side of the road. Somebody driving by us saw her. They called us. Any identification? This bracelet on her wrist. Mm, to my dearest Sally and Pete. December 25th, 1947. That's the girl, all right. What are the chances, Doc? I wouldn't bet on them. Pretty bad shape. Well, have you seen enough? Yeah. Friday, Romero, call the crime lab and check the area for footprints and tire tracks. I'll ride back in the ambulance with the girl. If she regains consciousness, I want to talk to her. All right? Okay, Ed. I'll meet you in the office by 8.30. We're working straight through till we get this guy. See you at the office, Gilbert. What time have you got, Ben? Seven minutes to four. Long night. Hey, that car up there ahead. Let's take a look at it, huh? Black sedan. Hey, look, he's flashing a red spot on that convertible. Come on. He sees us, Joe. He's pulling away. Get that gas pedal down to the floor. No already there. He's turning off right. Hit the siren. I'll get the light. We're gaining a little, Ben. Next corner to the left. Joe, where'd he go? The fancy driver. Try the alley up ahead to the left. Yeah. Must have turned up that cross street. Get through the alley and double back on him. Right. There he is, Ben. Look out. Watch it, Joe. Watch it. He's going to ram us. We got hit just in front of the rear bumper. Our car was forced into the curbing and it turned over. He was real lucky. He kept right on going. But this time, Ben and I were sharing the luck. All we got out of it was a couple of nasty cracks in the head and a few bruises, but it was enough to keep us in a hospital under observation for a day. By this time, Ed Backstrand was fuming. So were the newspapers. During the day we spent in the hospital, a red light bandit went on a real blitz. He pulled six more jobs, one liquor store, two residential holdups, and three car robberies. Five of the six victims were slugged and beaten. Davis and Griffin had taken over for Ben and me, and by the time we got back on the job, they'd built up a lead for us. So we've been working with Wilkerson up an auto theft job. He's used four stolen cars already. We got the makes and numbers on each one of them. How about the dark sedan he was driving when he rammed it? The boys picked it up this morning out on Sepulveda. We're checking it for prints now. Oh, that's fine, Dave. You got any description on the guy yet? No luck there, Joe. He works too fast. Nothing at all? The same as you had. Tall, black hair, big hands. Loves to use them. Friday, Romero, got a minute? Okay, Skipper. Check you later, honey. Sure thing, boys. 
Sit down. How do you feel? Pretty fair, Ed. A little stiff here and there. All right. Did Davis fill you in? Up to date. Okay. I just called the doctor who's handling Sally Wilder, Pete's girlfriend. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. She's been in pretty bad shape since we found her up there on Summit Road. This morning she took a turn for the better. She's conscious and her doctor thinks she might be able to talk to us a little bit. Good. When? About an hour. I cleared it with the doctor and with her family. You'll only be able to stay a couple of minutes to make the most of them. That's all. All right, Ed. We'll check with you later. Hey, Joe, Ben, Perfect. here's some mail came for you fellas while you were gone. Oh, thank you, Mark. We're going over to the county hospital. We ought to be back in a couple of hours. Okay. Say, there's been a couple of phone calls, too. Yeah, anything important? I don't think so. The guy just called to say hello. Said his name was Johnny Savage. He just called to say hello. I presume you men are aware of the girl's critical condition. Yeah, that's right, Dr. Froman. We saw her before she was taken here at the hospital. Ah, yes. Uh, you understand, of course, that you'll be able to see her for only a few minutes, and please try your best not to excite her, huh? Right, Doctor. Sally isn't able to talk. Bad mouth and face injuries, so your questions will have to be answered simply yes or no, and nod of the head. Okay, we got you. We only have a few questions, and we want to know if she can identify the man who beat her from these pictures we've got here. All right, Sergeant. This way, please. Thank you. Sally... Sally, these gentlemen from the police department, they'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, 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 now, there's no need to be nervous or afraid. Just simply nod your head, yes or no. Now, that's fine. All right, Sally. Uh, Sally, did you see the man who attacked you? Yes. She says yes. Did you get a good look at his face? You did. All right, Sally, now you can answer these three together, just yes or no. Was he tall? Did he have dark hair? Did he have large hands? He did. Ben. Oh, yeah, Jim. Hand me the folder. Here you are. Here you are. Thanks. Uh, just one more thing, Sally. I'm going to show you some pictures now. Take all the time you want before you make up your mind about each one. If you recognize any one of these men as the person who attacked you, just nod your head. All right? All right, fine. Now, good. Here's the first one. No? All right. Here's the next one. No. Uh, how about this one? No? All right. Here's another. You recognize him? <laughs> This was the man? Are you sure, Sally? Thank you. That's all. Let's go. Did you uh, find what you wanted, Sergeant? Yes, Doctor, we did. Here, this one. Hmm. Nice looking chap. Who is he, Sergeant? His name's Savage, Dr. Froman. Johnny Savage. When we got back to the office, we checked in with Ed Backstrand. In five minutes, an all-points bulletin and a full description of the suspect was broadcast to every radio car, every motorcycle officer, to every sheriff and law enforcement agency in Los Angeles and Southern California. By nightfall, our manhunt was on. More than a dozen extra patrol units were called in for duty that night, and when they pulled out of the police garage, the name, the picture, and the full description of Johnny Savage was in the possession of every officer. The same for the patrolmen. Whether they walked a beat downtown or out in the residential area, the picture of Johnny Savage went with them. Everything was done that could be done. On the second night of the manhunt, far out on the edge of town, Johnny Savage, the red light bandit, got his 12th victim, a 63-year-old storekeeper. Attention all units, 939 Markham Street, near Clark, 211 and slugging, code 3, ambulance dispatched. All units, 939 Markham Street, near Clark. Here it is, Skipper. Tie in. What'd you get? Wilkerson lifted the prints off that black sedan at Ram's you and me. Yeah? They belong to Johnny Savage. Yeah, good. That storekeeper last night is a savage, all right. The victim identified him from his mug. All right. We got enough of this savage guy to put him on ice for life. All we have to do now is to get him. Well, look, the way we figure it, Ed, this red light bandit is using stolen cars with coal plates, so there's no way of tracking down the cars at regular commercial garages. He's got to be running private garages someplace around town. All right, let's get the neighborhood patrolman on the job. Advertise it. All over town. The city ordinance, isn't it? People who rent private garages are bound by law to register the car and license number with the police. Start a campaign if you want, but find those cars. Right. Now, wait a minute. Hello, Backstrand. Yeah? When? I see. Yeah, thanks. Well, what is it, Ed? It was the hospital. About the girl, Sally. Sally Wilder? What about? She died five minutes ago. <laughs> That night, everybody went back on the job as usual. The cruiser cars, the patrolmen, the motorcycle officers, and about a dozen decoy cars. Armed policewomen riding alone in cars or parked in lonely spots with a police officer escort. 
Our car, 80K, was still in the garage for repairs, so they assigned us another one. And we started to make the round. Everything was usual. Except one thing. We weren't tracking down just a thief anymore or a sadist who liked to put people's faces in. We were out to get a murderer. It was a perfect night for the suspect. Dark, no moon. I gave Ben two to one odds and I put up five dollars that we'd get Savage that night. I lost the five dollars. We cruised until seven the next morning, but there wasn't even a nibble. We had breakfast at the Federal Cafe, a little restaurant down the street from the city hall, and it was about 8.15 when we got back to the office. We were pretty tired. Robert DTL Romero. I would like to stick to Sergeant Friday. Just a minute. For you, Joe. Okay, thanks. Friday talking. Sergeant Friday, I want to talk to you. Well, I'm listening. Go ahead. I mean, I want to talk to you in person as soon as possible. Can't you tell me over the phone? What is it? I cannot tell you over the phone. It is very important. Can you come now? Well, now, look, mister, I'm awful sorry, but we're very busy down... 554 Ramona Avenue. Can you come now? Well, what's this all about? Who is this speaking? My name is Carl Savage. My son's name is John. Here it is, Joe. Neat-looking little place. Yeah. Yeah? I'm Sergeant Friday. You Mr. Savage? Yeah, come in. Okay. This is my partner, Sergeant Romero. How do you do? I will be brief, gentlemen. I am the father of John Savage. I wish for you to catch him. I, I will help you. I noticed a name on the mailbox outside, Mr. Savage. You changed your name lately? I changed my name ten years ago when John first got into trouble. My own name I had to change to the shame. Always from him, my son. Shame. Mr. Savage, has your son been home since he got out of prison? Yeah, many times, to ask for money. I would not give him any, so he struck me. Last night, I read in the newspaper, the little girl he beat up. She is dead. Then I make up my mind. Do you know where your son is now, Mr. Savage? Not now, no. But our garage has a car in there. It is not his, I know. Also in the garage, I find many license plates. I find spotlights with red glass lens. But you don't have any idea where we could find him. No, but he will come back. He always comes back for money. We're going to station an officer here in the house, Mr. Savage. Anything you want, if it will catch him. He's bad, Sergeant. Like something poison. All, all true, he's bad. Be a thorn basket over him, Mr. Savage. The wife lives here with you? Ten days ago, before they start, I buried Gertrude, my wife, his mother. Sergeant, for ten years she is sick, but for ten years she stays alive to see him from prison. Ten days ago, she died. He did not even come to the funeral. Did your son have any idea that you might call us? No, no, I don't think so. But when you catch him, give me a gun. With my own two hands, I will kill him, Johnny Savage. <laughs> Before we left, we called Ed Backstrand and we brought him up to date. He sent three detectives out to relieve us, Davis, Griffin, and Marsh. We told them to keep an eye on the house and the stolen car in the garage. That night after dinner, Ed Backstrand, Ben and I went out and relieved them. We parked the cruiser car in the garage next door, and then we took up our post. Carl Savage had a light supper, and then he went to bed about nine. The three of us sat at the front windows in the darkened house, and we waited. Ben kept his eye on the garage. Outside, across the city, the manhunt continued as usual. Three hours went by. The waiting got monotonous. Brandy, mm -hmm. Romero, look at life, will you? Oh, yes, Skipper, I'm sorry. That clock's enough to put anybody to sleep. Yeah, what time you got? 12.23 a.m. Thanks. The clock kept ticking. We were tired. We took turns keeping each other awake. At ten minutes past two, I looked at my watch, and then I settled back and tried to find some kind of a comfortable position. They started so faintly, it was just like the ticking of the clock. Same rhythm. And then they came closer, and the sounds got out of rhythm. Backstrand's head came up with a snap. Brady, hmm? Romero, you hear that? Yeah, Ed. Get up to the window, watch the curtains. You see anything? Yeah. Yeah, somebody's coming. Savage? Can't tell. Wait a minute, he's slowing down. Going up the driveway to the garage. He's going inside. That's him. Come on. Watch it. He spotted us. 
He went over that fence into the yard. There he is, Friday. You hit him, Joe. Maybe. Yeah, he's going for the street. He's headed for that car, Ed, that sedan up on the corner there. Yeah, Romero, go back and get the car. All right, Skeeter. Yeah. Must have parked up the block before he came around. Where's Romero? I don't know. Oh, here he comes now. All right, let's go. Get that radio on, Joe. It's already on, Ed. All right, give him a call. Any sign yet? No, nothing so far. Next corner to the right, Ben. Unit 80K to control four. 80K to control four. Control four to unit 80K. Go ahead. Clear and keep frequency four open. This is an emergency. 80K, Roger. Frequency four, opening clear. Attention, all units on frequency four. Stand by. 80K, go ahead. Yeah, there he is, Friday up ahead. Dark blue sedan. Control four. We are in pursuit of a possible red light bandit. Suspect is driving a dark blue 1949 sedan. License number in the seven column. 61 Roberts, 784. Use caution. Suspect is armed. Code 3. Attention, all units. Attention, all units. Unit 80K now pursuing possible red light bandit. Suspect is driving a dark blue 1949 sedan. License number in the 7 column. 61 Roberts, 784. Use caution. Suspect is armed. Code 3. Your location, 80K. Control 4. We are headed east on Wilshire Boulevard, crossing La Brea. Attention, all units. Suspect is headed east on Wilshire Boulevard, crossing La Brea. Watch it, Romero. Don't lose him. I see him, Skipper. Control 4. Still pursuing red light bandits. Headed east on Wilshire, now crossing Rossmore. Attention, all units. Suspect is still headed east on Wilshire. Now crossing Rossmore. Suspect is on. Use caution. Control 3. That truck pulling out of the head. Get the siren, will you, Skipper? Yeah. Right, hold on. Just that squeeze. Keep on, Romero. Traffic on ahead, he's got to slow down. Control four, suspect headed east on Wilshire, crossing Western Avenue, closing in. There he goes, to go right down Sherman Alley, the dead end. Yeah. Control four, suspect turns south into Sherman Alley, closing in on suspect. Attention, all units, suspect has turned south into Sherman Alley. Suspect is coming out. There he is, Skipper, pulling up ahead. He's jumping out. All right, take the mic, will you add here? Come on, Ben. I'll direct the other cars in. If you need help, holler. All right, Skipper. All right, which way to go, Ben? Down the Flint Hills building. Come on. I'm starting up the back car, Skipper. All right, keep him busy. All right, Savage, come on down. He wants to go the rough way. One more chance, Savage. Come on down. No use, Joe. He's heading up for the roof. Come on. Well, he climbs like a monkey. Come on, let's get him. Yeah, right. Here, I'll give you a hand. Here, here's the rough part. Where'd he go? I don't know. Let's spread out. All right, Savage, you're through. Throw your gun out. Come out with your hands up. Watch it, Joe. He's running for the edge. He's gonna jump. I'll get him. All right, oh, this guy back here. You lousy copper, you dirty lousy copper. I'll kill you out. You're through, Savage. You're through. <laughs> Savage, this guy's father. Mm-hmm. What about him? Nothing. What would you do, Ben, if your son was a murderer? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. John Savage was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the sixth in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Patrol Officer Robert Steele of the Montana State Highway Patrol who on the morning of November 2nd, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure.
Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You've been off duty two hours. You receive an emergency call from the chief of detectives. An entire block in the heart of your city is threatened with complete destruction. Your job, report at once. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. Investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, November 15th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were off duty reporting in on an emergency call. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 8.32 a.m. when I walked in the Spring Street entrance of the city hall. You Sergeant Friday? Yeah, that's right. I take my elevator, Sergeant. It's the only one in service. All right. I'll run you up to 16. The chief's waiting for you up there. What's the pitch? Only one elevator in service out of ten? The place looks deserted. What's going on? Nobody in the building. All the office people been sent home. Lots of trouble. Somebody declare a holiday? No joke, Sergeant. Big trouble. All right, you convinced me. What is it? Here we are. 16th floor. Over here, Friday. Hi, Joe. Hello, Ben. You made good time. Came as soon as I got the call. Ben. Sorry to have to bring you back in. You worked last night, didn't you? Yeah, midnight to eight this morning. Sorry. Come on. Okay. What is it, Skipper? Why all the hush? Uh... Wait till we get inside. In here. Okay. Number one, let's keep our voices down. Yeah, all right. I'll make it as brief as I can. Every minute counts. What time you got, Friday? 8.33. All right, here it is. Fifty-five minutes ago, a man walked into this building with a homemade bomb under his arm. If we don't release his brother from the county jail by nine o'clock this morning, he says he'll pull the trigger on the bomb and blow up the whole building. He's kidding, Skipper. Who is the guy? Name's Vernon Carney. Here's his package. He and his brother have been in and out of jail since 1937. Small-time thieves. Yeah. Where's the FBI kickback? We had him once before, both of them. Brother's name is Elwood, serving a year for car stripping. And this two-bit thief is sitting here in the city hall with a bomb on his lap? That's right. In the next room. What kind of a bomb is it, Ed? You think he's bluffing? Could be bluffing, but the crime lab says no. Lee Jones from the lab get a look at it? Been in there twice. One end of the box is glass. Says you can't see much without a closer look, but you can't get near the guy. What do you want us to do? It's a volunteer job. You can take it or leave it. I won't order you to do it. How you want to handle it? You sure you want a piece of this one, Romero? No, he doesn't, Ed. He's got a family. Get me another single man. We'll give it a try. Wait a minute, Joe. What makes this, do this job so different? Anytime we kick a door in, we never know what's on the other side. That's what makes it different. This time we do. No, you're not going to cut me out. Not the only time I know what I'm getting into. All right. Chandler's tried. Hannon, Davis, Watson, they've all tried. This guy, Connie, knows what he's doing. He's no pushover. But somebody's got to get that bomb away from him. Friday, Romero, it's your baby now. I looked at my watch. It was 8.36. We left Backstrand and started down the hall. If Carney was going to make good his threat to blow up the building by 9 o'clock, we had exactly 24 minutes to talk him out of it. Ben and I figured we'd better look him over first and then work out some kind of a plan. Maybe just talking to him would do it. Vernon Carney was sitting in a straight back chair against the far wall facing the door. He was seated between two windows that looked out over the city. Along the left wall was a row of six wooden chairs. In the center of the right wall was a connecting door leading to the office where Backstrand had briefed us. The door was locked on both sides. Just off center and favoring the left of the room was a small filing table. 
The other furniture in the office was a desk just forward of the connecting door on the right. There was a dictaphone on the desk. In the near left corner, shielded by a white screen, was a small wash basin, the faucet leak. Vernon Carney was middle-aged. He sat erect, holding a black box on his lap. He held his right hand inside one end of the box. Ben and I stood there for a minute and looked at him. Then we walked in the room. What do you say to a man with a bomb? That's close enough. Cigarette, Carney? I'm not smoking right now. What are you trying to prove? You know what I want. We're not going to let your brother out of jail. You got until 9 o'clock to change your mind. According to that clock on the wall, you got 24 minutes. If we go, you're going with us, Carney. Don't take much of a brain to figure that, copper. What made you think you could get away at this? Haven't yet. It ain't 9 o'clock. Unless that clock's slow. Haven't checked it against my pocket watch lately. That's the one that's running this show. Have you given any thought to all the innocent people that are going to go up with that thing of yours there? My brother's innocent. I want him out of jail. The court says he's guilty. He'll get out when he serves his time. That's where you're wrong, copper. He gets out at 9 o'clock this morning. All right, come on, Carney. Get your hand out of that box. Put the box on the table. You think I'm bluffing, don't you? I'm going to let you get within five feet before I make a liar out of you. Okay, Kearney. I guess you mean business. You can take three more steps and find out for sure. Suppose we did let your brother out. We'd just come out and pick him up again, you along with him? If you could find us. Let's get this straight. If we let your brother Elwood out, how do we know you're going to keep your promise? What promise? I ain't made any promises. You just get Elwood down here first, and then we'll talk about it. There's only one thing I can't figure, Kearney. Yeah, what's that? If we don't let your brother out, you say you'll pull the trigger on that bomb. You're going to kill a lot of innocent people. What are you going to prove by that? It's 8.37. You've got 23 minutes left. Now, I wish you'd answer that one for me. Why do you want to kill a lot of innocent people? Don't try to con me, copper. I know they cleared everybody out of this building 45 minutes ago. I know they cleaned out the whole block. They got it roped off. Where'd you get your information? I got a couple of windows here to look out of. Don't you think it's about time to send somebody over to get Elwood? You know, Carney, we've got a way out of this. We don't have to let your brother out, neither. I've heard that before. What's to stop us from leaving the building along with the other few officers and let you sit here and touch off that bomb? Just go ahead. It won't be a long wait without you. Who are you trying to kid? You'd let me blow up $10 million worth of taxpayers' money? <laughs> ah, no. You're going to let Elwood out. You'll wait till the last minute to do it. But you'll let him out. Ed, I'm still not convinced Carney can back up what he says. Then why didn't you take the box away from him? Yeah. We're in a spot, let's face it. How about an eye for an eye, Skipper? What do you mean? If he pulls the trigger on that machine, he kills us. How about us getting him first? All right, Romero. How are you going to handle it? Well, I'm not top man on the pistol range, but I could wing him. And then he hands the box to you? Or maybe he falls and his reflex action pulls the trigger. Okay, I don't wing him. I stop him for keeps. You just can't walk in there and shoot him down. Why not? You do the same thing with armed criminals. Yeah, but you warn him first. I warn him. Yeah, and after you shoot him, you find out it's a harmless gadget. Couldn't have gone off in a million years. No, no, a gun's not the answer. We can't shoot him until we're positive. We'll be positive by 9 o'clock, and there might not be anybody around to shoot him. We've located Carney's apartment. There's a detail out there checking it now. Pacelli and Morris. Ed, have you got any ideas at all? Anything we could try? That's why I called you in. None of us have gotten any further than you did just now. There's just one thing I want to know for sure. Yeah, Friday. Is it or isn't it? We all want to know. Either way, we've got to get that box away from him. Backstrand. Yeah. You did? Yeah. No, stay out there till I call you. All right, here's half the answer. That was Pacelli. They found 28 sticks of dynamite in Carney's apartment. We knew Carney wasn't kidding now. We could see into the bomb through that glass window in one end. It looked like dynamite inside, and there was dynamite in Carney's room. We didn't know if he had the nerve to pull the trigger. We didn't know if it would go off when he did. But with only minutes remaining, nobody wanted to take the chance. From here on in, all of us agreed that Vernon Carney sat in the next room, holding in his two hands a force powerful enough to destroy us all. We had to get that box away from him, and to get that box, we had to have a plan. I looked at my watch. It was 8.40, 20 minutes till 9 o'clock. How do we get it away from him? I got an idea. It might work. Let's have it. 
Carney's sitting against the far wall between two windows. They're both open. Yeah, that's right. All right, if we could get a man through one of those windows, we might get Carney from behind. How are you going to get him? Whoever gets through the window could slug him. What do you do then? Somebody grabs the box. The crime lab can tell us what to do with it. How do we get a man through one of those windows? We're on the 16th floor. Well, there's some kind of a ledge that runs around the building on each story. Wide enough for a man to walk on? And let's take a look. All right. Looks pretty narrow, Joe. That's a good 18 inches. Could be done. Oh, too risky. It's raining out. That ledge is slippery. Strong wind out there, Joe. Tear a man right off the building. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, there's still a way. How about a ladder? 16 floors, Skipper. There might be a way. Fire department would know that. I'll get Battalion Chief Erickson. Is Lee Jones in the building? No, he's over in the crime lab. I'll get him up here, too. I don't know, Friday. Maybe it'll work. It's got to, Ed. All right, now look. It's going to take a couple of minutes to set this up. We've got to know what Carney's doing every second of that time. Well, how about the dictaphone in there on deck? Good. Get it on without him seeing you. We'll try. The dictaphone in there is connected to this one in here. This room is 1614. You got that? Yeah. All right, push down key 1614 on that machine in there and leave it down. Get the receiver off the hook and leave it off. Leave the receiver off. That's right. You know, if it isn't off the hook, we won't be able to hear a thing in here. All right. Come on, Ben. This is back, friend. Give me Chief Erickson. Where's my brother? Still in his cell. You coppers are long on talk, but short on time. Yeah, we know. I'm telling you, for your own good, you'd better get Elwood over here. Carney, I'll bet if we get your brother on the phone here, he'll tell you he doesn't want any part of this. You mean Elwood don't want out? Since when? Sure he wants out, but not your way. He's only got a year to serve. Why don't you leave him alone? I told Elwood. I told him I'd get him out. He didn't think I could do it. But I'm doing it. I'll make you a bet, Carney. Let us get your brother on the phone. He won't walk out of here with you. I get him on the pipe. Where you going? The phone's over here. Have to use the dictaphone. We get an okay from the chief. Elwood's still a prisoner. What's the matter with the phone? No operators. You know the building's been cleared. Oh, yeah. That's right. Almost forgot. Okay, you can use the dictaphone. This is Friday, Ed. Carney wants to talk to his brother. Yeah, I know you'll have to send somebody over. Have them put the call on extension. Wait a minute. What's that extension number, Ben? 2351. 2351, Ed. Right. It'll take a minute. Yeah. I'd kind of like to talk to El. Been a couple of months since I seen him. We've always been together, me and El, most of the time. Joe, let's go in and see if we can't hurry that call. Good idea, boy. 16 minutes to nine. Hey, cop. Yeah. Forgot to hang up the dictaphone, didn't you? I put the receiver back on the dictaphone. Ben and I had failed to make good on the first step of the plan. When we got outside the door, we briefed Davis and Watson. They went in to sit with Carney. It would be their job to keep us posted on Carney's movements. The dictaphone was out. We went back into the office next door. Chief Sam Erickson of the fire department and Lieutenant Lee Jones from the crime lab were already there. We told Baxter what happened. It would have been a help. We haven't got time to cry over it. Barney's wide awake, Skipper. He doesn't miss a thing. Backstrand told us the plan, Friday. We can't run a ladder up from the street. Too high, Chief? Best we got us a 100-foot area. You figure 12 foot to the story, that'll take you up 96 feet, eight floors. And we've got the latest equipment. What's the idea you had, Jones? Sam, can you get hold of a pump here in a hurry? Sure, we got a lot of scaling ladders, but you got nothing up there to hook them on. You figure on dropping down from the floor above? That's right, and I figure a pump here would do it. Sure it would. You can make it past the windowsill up there, but you got a foot and a half ledge in the way, no... What you want is a lifeline. You mean lower a man on a rope, Chief? Yeah, Romero. That's the quickest and the quietest. Could you rig it so one of my boys could do it? Sure. What's the risk? None, if you work it right. We'll strap on a life belt, give the man heavy leather gloves. Two of my men will lower him down. We'll pick the lightest man. What do you think, Lee? That's it. What do we do with the bomb when we get it? I figure that box Connie's holding is about a foot square. Here's what I'll do. I'll get you a bucket with a foot and a half mouth. It'll be full of water. Yeah. I'll have it right outside the door of that office. When you get that box, place it in the water. We'll get the bucket out of the building as fast as we can. And once we get the bomb underwater, we're in it clear. And I can't promise you that, but it's the safest way to handle it under the circumstances. All right, that's the procedure. Sam, you take care of your end. Right away. I'll get a detail to give me a hand down in the street. We'll have a car ready to take the bomb to a safe area to decommission it. Work as fast as you can. Come on, Sam. It's our baby, Joe. That's right. Which part of it you want, the rope or the bomb? You call it. Fire Chief Erickson says the lightest man on the rope. That's me, Joe. All right, I'll get the bomb out of the building. Okay, that's the routine, but carry this with you. The man that comes down on that rope has one chance to make good. You slug him and make it count because there's no second try. Yeah. 
And Joe, when you grab that box, you got to get it away from Carney before he can squeeze the trigger. Then you got to get it down into the street. The elevator. You know how to operate it? Well, it's pretty simple, but I'll double check with the operator. Better do it right now. Okay. Ed, we better get Carney's brother on the phone for him. He seemed anxious. Might be a pretty good stall. All right, Romero, that's the outside phone. Get the city jail. All right, Skipper. Get going, Friday. Okay. Hey, you. Elevator man. Uh, yeah, Sergeant. Let me see if I know how to work that thing. You taking over the elevator? Well, in a couple of minutes. You want to check me out? Nothing to it, Sergeant. All right. Now, here's the control, see? Uh -huh. You push this lever right to go up, left to go down. You see this little trigger on the underside of the handle? Yeah. That's the safety lock. Be sure you squeeze it or you can't move the lever. Let me try it. Huh? That's it. Uh -huh. Right to go up, uh -huh. left to go down. Right to go up, left to go down. How do you operate the doors? Automatic. They work off the control lever. When the control lever is locked in the up or down position, the doors will close. I get it. Now, in case they jam, this red emergency button up here? Yeah. You push it. If that doesn't close them, we call the repairman. Okay, I think I got it. You sure now? I've had my orders to get out of the building. I'll just leave the elevator right here and take the stairs down. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, Sergeant, hmm? uh, just curious. You gonna take the bomb down in this car? We're gonna try. You won't have any trouble. We haven't had an elevator failure in 18 months. The elevator man turned and went down the stairs. Outside of a handful of volunteers and a man with a bomb, the city hall was now cleared. I started down the corridor and met Ben outside the office. He told me that Lee Jones and Chief Erickson were on their way up in the freight elevator at the rear of the building with the necessary equipment. The two fire department volunteers were with him. The phone call had been put through to the city jail, and in a moment, Elwood Carney would be ready at the other end of the line. We went in to tell Carney. I told him over at the jail to put the call through on extension 2351. Yeah. When's it coming through? Right now. Mm -hmm. You got Elwood with you? No. Look, Carney, we told you we'd get him on the phone for you. The call will be through in a minute. Minutes a long time, cop. You only got 12 of them left. Elwood's going to talk you out of this. Yeah, sure. Sure, everybody's going to talk me out of this. First, it was them other two cops, the little porky guy and that other monkey. Then you and this Dixie Doughhead here, and now it's Elwood. Come off it, will you, and get my brother over here. That's him. It's your brother, Connie. I'll get him. Stay put, you. Just going to get the phone. You want to talk to your brother, don't you? I'll take care of the phone. We'll just connect it for a while. Now, get it straight, copper. I'm through with your stinking, rotten lying. I want Elwood here. And I want him now. Bring him here before I blow you all to pieces. What's going on? Who threw that phone out in the hall? I did. You want me to go out and pick it up? Carney, that's not going to get you any place. You the big boss around here? Maybe. Are you or aren't you? I answered you. All right, big boy. I've got a piece of advice for you. Take your rookie cops here and get it through their heads. I mean what I say. I want my brother over here in this room. And you've got just 11 minutes to get it done. Tell him that, will you, boy? All right, Carney. It's your show. All right, we've got to work fast now. Jones, everything set for you? Got the bucket with the water right here. Car's waiting down in the street. Right. Erickson, your boy's ready? Upstairs, waiting. And we all know what to do. Ed, i got to have somebody to give me a hand with Carney when he falls. I'll be in there with you, Friday. Let's go upstairs, Chief. Anytime. Oh. One thing you ought to know. What's that? Strong wind coming up. About 20 mile an hour out there right now. That going to louse us up? No, but it's going to increase the sway. Got to allow for it. How do you mean? The wind's coming from the south. We'll lower you just to the right of the window. If I figure it correctly, the wind will do the rest. Bigger risk, but we don't control the weather. How are you going to do it, Ben? As soon as I get in position, I'll reach in through the window on his right. I'll use the belly. Try to catch him on the right side of his head. One good hit should put him away. Let's make it two and be sure, huh? Right. You ready, Chief? Now, let's go. Ben. Yeah? Nothing. I'll be careful. You too, huh? What's the time, Friday? 8.50. Shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes for Romero to get down to that window, unless the wind gives him trouble. Jones, no use you sticking around. I'll give Friday a hand. That's my job. We've got to keep you alive to decommission the bomb. Bomb joke. See you downstairs. You ready, Ed? Yeah. Scared, Friday? Yeah. That makes us even. Come on. 
Ed Backstrand and I went into the next room with Vernon Carney. Our job was to keep him occupied until Ben was lowered to the windowsill from the floor above. Ben was going to make a try from the window on Carney's right. Somehow, we had to keep Carney's attention on us and away from that window. If anything went wrong and Carney got out of position, the plan would fail. If Ben was spotted, the plan would fail. If Chief Erickson didn't estimate the force of the wind correctly, the plan would fail. After Ben slugged Carney, my timing had to be perfect. If it wasn't, the plan would fail. I looked at my watch. It was eight minutes to nine. Carney, anything we can say that'll make you change your mind? I've asked you a hundred times. Now I'm ordering you. You're going to get to a phone and have somebody send Elwood over here right now. I'm through waiting. Now move. You ripped out the phone, Carney. Well, find another one. I told you I'm sick of your two-bit stalling. We've got until 9 o'clock to make up our mind about this. You had until 9. But you wouldn't do what I told you. Now I'm cutting you short. You guys have got exactly one minute to get a phone in this room where I can hear you call the jail and have them send Elwood over here. You said 9, Carney. All right, Joe. We'll give him what he wants. Davis, unlock the connecting door to this office. I'll get the phone, Ed. Will the cord reach? Yeah. Your brother's a prisoner. He's in our custody and he's under our protection. We can't place his life in jeopardy. Why not leave it up to Al? Here's the phone, Ed. Yeah. Ken Willie, this is Backstrand. The one Elwood Kearney over here at City Hall. His brother wants to see him. Explain the situation. If he wants to come, get him over here. Leave it up to him. Room 1614. You'll have to use the freight elevator. And tell him to hurry. Yeah. Tell him to hurry. That's the only smart thing you've done today. Now, why don't you go next door and figure out another angle? We'll wait for Elwood, too. You don't think I'd let you get out now, do you? We're all going to wait right here for my brother. In case he don't show up, you're going to see me pull the plug. Just sit down. Not the close. Right where you are, sit down. Loud clock, ain't it? Windy. Getting cold in here. Sure, a loud clock. Real windy. Maybe I ought to close the windows. Don't want to catch me a cold. I can turn on the heat. Stay put, cop. Hey, what's that? What's going on? Just the wind, Shut up. There's somebody out there. I can see his feet. You stupid cops. Pull him up. Get back there. You pull him up. Ready, tell him to pull him up. Right. Pull him up. All right, Carney, you win. You bet I win, you dumb coppers. You didn't think I'd miss a trick like that. We'll just close these windows, boys. There's one. Lock it. And here's... Here's your brother, Carney. Yeah. Hi, Al. Hi, Vern. You did it. I told you. I told you I'd do it, didn't I? That's far enough for the rest of you. Al, come on over here. You're crazy, Vern. You're crazy. Yeah, that's what they've been trying to tell me. We're going home, Al. How are you going to do it? There's a million cops outside. People all over town heard about this. They're holding the crowd back. They ain't going to stop us now, Al. You'll never make it, either one of you. I got him this far, didn't I? We'll make it. Vern, you think we could do it? Hey, you. Yeah? You're going to get a car ready for us, a fast one. Have it in front of the building. Move! All right, Friday, do what he tells you. Right. Hold it. Yeah. If you ain't back by 9 o'clock, the deal still holds. I told him I'd pull the pin at 9, Al, if they didn't let you out. You ain't fooling, are you, Vern? Will that gadget really blow? Four miles high. You know what that means, Al? Yeah. But they won't let you pull it. We're getting out. All right, copper. Get the car. You got... Four minutes. Hey, Ben, Ben. What happened? He spot me? Yeah, there's no time to explain now. Listen, we got to work fast. Yeah. We had to bring Connie's brother over from the jail. I don't think he cares if they get out or not. He just...
Sheriff wants to use that bomb, and for some crazy reason, he's waiting until nine. How much time we got? Let me look. Less than four minutes. How about the ledge? You think you can do it? Strong wind. You'll have to hang on like a fly. I don't know. I can give it a try. Okay. Same plan. Every second counts. Now, I can't brief Ed. He's in the room with the guy. It's up to you and me. I'll get on the ledge from one of these offices. I hope they make me. If you don't, we'll know you tried. Hurry. Hey, Ben, wait a minute. Yeah? I forgot. The windows. The one on his right. He locked it. You'll have to crawl around to the one on the left. You got it? Right. Okay. The car will be ready in two minutes. Out front. Fine. Ellen and I'll just sit here and wait. It's gonna be good being back together, huh, El? We always were real good together, Vern. Yeah, that's the way brothers ought to be together all the time. Together. Uh, Vern, I'd feel better with a gun. We don't need no gun, El. <laughs> we got the bomb. We'll need a gun when we get out, when we get on the road. Okay. Take your pick. They all got them. Hey, you, give him yours. I'm not carrying a gun. I left it in the other room. A cop without a gun? Who's kidding who? I left it in the other room. Frisk the big boy, Al. He's got one. About time for the car, ain't it? Two minutes to nine. Yeah, this feels like it. Right on his hip. Hey, burn, look out! Grab him, Joe, I got him. Yeah. Get the box. Leave that gun alone. I got him, Ben. I gotta get his hand out of it. Run, Joe, get it in the water. Run! floors isn't very much, but I've never shared an elevator with a live bomb. It seemed like minutes between floors. I kept watching the bucket. The bomb was completely underwater. A small stream of bubbles was hissing to the surface. I waited. Main floor. I picked up the bucket and ran for the street. I missed the first step. I fell forward. The bucket spun out of my hand. I sprawled flat on the sidewalk. I waited for the explosion. It didn't go off Friday. Yeah. I gave it a good chance, Lee. It was all there. Look. At least a dozen sticks of dynamite. Snyder. Bring that over here. Here you are, Lieutenant. Thanks. Here's why it didn't go off. Mm -hmm. Had it rigged for a hard trigger pull. Would have taken a good yank to set this one off. Yeah. Hi, Joe. Hi, Ben. Clumsy. <laughs> The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Vernon Carney was examined by five different psychiatrists appointed by the Superior Court and was found to be incompetent. He is now confined in the state mental institution for the criminally insane. Elwood Carney is now serving the balance of his sentence with no time off for good behavior. <laughs> just heard the seventh in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Town Marshal Lon T. Larson of the Mount Pleasant, Utah Force, who on the night of October 15, 1945, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. Your 
a detective sergeant. You're assigned to missing persons detail. You've never heard of Fountain Green, Utah. You've never heard of Juanita Lasky. Los Angeles is a big city. 452 square miles. 3,356,969 people. Your job, find her. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law to an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, December 12th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of missing persons detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from lunch, and it was 12.47 p.m. when I got to room 67A. Missing persons detail. Poor G. Federal cafe. Good soup today. What kind? Uh, corn chowder. It was real good. Place is jammed with Christmas shoppers. I had to wait. Mm. I haven't even started my shopping yet. You? Oh, I gotta pick up something for my mother. Prices are high. I'll send a lot of cards. Wait till you get married, Joe. Ever try to sell a Christmas card to a kid? They got to have something with wheels on it. Yeah, I guess you're right. Missing persons, Friday. Fountain Green, Utah, calling the Los Angeles Police Department. Bureau of Missing Persons. My party will speak with anyone in charge. This is Missing Persons, Sergeant Friday. Just a moment, please. Mrs. Lasky, ready with your call to Los Angeles. Hello? 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 This is your party. Go ahead, please. Uh, operator? Yes, madam. Uh, could you please give me the charges for this call? I'm using my neighbor's phone. All right, madam. Please signal when your call is completed. Oh, yes, yes. I I'll do that. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Sergeant Friday. This is Mrs. Hannah Lasky. I'm calling you from Fountain Green, Utah. Yes, ma'am. This is in regard to my daughter, Juanita Lasky. I, I haven't heard from her in well over a month, and I I'm terribly worried. Where was she staying in Los Angeles, Ms. Lasky? At the Chelsea Hotel for Women. I, I, I have the address. 941 South Melrose Street. I can't understand it. Ever since Juanita's been away from home, she's... When's the last time you heard from her? The last letter I have is due slot November 2nd. You know how it is, Sergeant. We have no relatives in Los Angeles, and, and she's trying to find work down there, living all alone. I, I just don't know what to do. All right, Ms. Lasky, I'll take her description over the phone and make out a preliminary report. You'll have to send us a photograph of your daughter and a letter to the effect that you want us to trace her. I'll get the letter and the snapshot off today. Now, what's your daughter look like? What's her full name? Juanita Marie Lasky. L-A-S-K-E-Y. No, 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 no. All right. Her age, weight, and height. She was 26 last July 10th, 128 pounds, and about my height. Well, how tall are you, Ms. Lasky? Oh, oh, she's um, five feet seven inches. She has auburn hair. It's quite long, and her eyes are green. Okay, I got it. Any outstanding scars, birthmarks, anything that might help us identify her? Uh, what's that? I say any outstanding scars, birthmarks, anything that might help us identify her. Where can we contact you, Ms. Lasky? 122 Brigham Young Street, Fountain Green, Utah. When you find me, Juanita, I wish you'd have her call me right away. I I I'll pay for the call. We'll do that, Ms. Lasky. What's your number up there? This is a neighbor's phone, but, but they'll call me. It's Fountain Green 14R2. Yeah. You will try to find her as fast as you can. We'll go to work on it. Well, Juanita always comes home for the Christmas holidays. You think she's all right? I wouldn't worry about it, Ms. Lasky. We'll call you just as soon as we get any kind of a list on her. Thank you so much, Sergeant. And, and if there's any charge, I'll be glad to pay it. No charge. If your daughter's in Los Angeles, I think we can find her. Oh, if there's anything wrong, you'll let me know right away? Yes, ma'am. You're very kind. Goodbye. Bye. What you got, Joe? Some girl owes her mother a letter. Come on, Ben. Just a routine call. We made the usual check, the morgue, all the hospitals, the county jail. 
And then we went through the repeater file. We found a Juanita Lasky in the files, but the age and description didn't match. We put that lead in the discard. After the usual paperwork, the next step was to check her last known residence, the Chelsea Hotel for Women. Here it is, Joe. Chelsea Hotel. Yeah. 55 rooms all outside. You're home away from home. Now let's go in. Chelsea Hotel. Thank you. Here's a bell. Yes, sir. May I help you? We're looking for a Miss Juanita Lasky. I'll ring her room. Whom shall I say is calling? Is she in? I believe so. I just saw her about an hour ago. Okay. Would you ring her room, please? Uh, yes, sir. And whom shall I say is calling? My name's Friday. All right, Mr. Friday. Just a moment. Uh, do you wish to speak with her on the phone, or shall I have her come down? Ask her to come down if she doesn't mind. She doesn't need to answer. That's funny. I'll ring again. No, sir. She doesn't seem to be in. Would you like to leave a message? Didn't you say you saw her about an hour ago? Yes, I did. She must have gone out again. I wonder if we could check the room. Oh, no. Gentlemen are not allowed above the main lobby. I'm sorry, ma'am. We're from the police department. Missing persons. I'm Sergeant Friday. This is Sergeant Romero. Oh. You men are from missing persons, did you say? Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm sure Juanita's just stepped out for a moment if you'd care to wait here in the lobby. We haven't got much time, ma'am. We'd appreciate it if you'd show us a room. Certainly. I'll get to the taxi. Two fifteen. The elevator is right this way. Thank you. What seems to be the trouble? Some friend of Juanita's missing? No, ma'am. Juanita. Juanita? I don't understand. Her mother's a little worried about her. Down this way. Here we are. No wonder she didn't hear the phone. She's in the shower. Yes, ma'am. Um, would you rap on the bathroom door and say we'd like to talk to her as soon as she throws? We'll wait out here in the hall. Certainly. Juanita? Juanita? Darling, there are two gentlemen here to see you. Juanita? Juanita? I'm coming in. It's Miss Waters. Sergeant? Yeah? There's no one in the shower. It's running, isn't it? Yes, and I see a robe and towel all laid out. You better take a look around. Turn off the shower, will you? Yeah. She must have left in a hurry. Say, here's a fresh change of clothing on the bed. Where's the closet, ma'am, Miss Door? Yes, that's right. Closet full of clothes. There's a couple of feet of luggage in there. This isn't like one, either. Funny, isn't it? You say you saw her about an hour ago. Yes, I did. Coming in or going out? Oh, coming in, I thought. You have room service here? Yes, we have a coffee shop downstairs. Uh -huh. The tray of food here on the table hasn't been touched. Coffee's still warm. Shut that radio off, will you, Ben? Yeah. Could she have gotten out of the building without you seeing her? No, we don't have a rear entrance. You sure you didn't see her go out the front door just before we got here? No. No, I did not. How about her mail? Has she been picking it up lately? I think so. We can check that down at the desk. Yeah, here's some letters. Postmark Utah. Return address. Mrs. H. Lasky. Smart. Well, let me see that one, Ben. This is one of your telephone message forms? Well, let me see. Yes, yes, that's right. It says, Long Distance Call Operator Sioux Fountain, Green, Utah. According to this slip, this call was received at 125 today. May I see that, sir? Certainly. Hey, Lasky. Yes, that's Edna's writing. Mrs. Tollison took that call. She relieves me for lunch. Well, do you know whether she returned this call? Well, if she did, there'll be a record down at the desk. Uh-huh. Now, you're positive that you saw Juanita Lasky an hour ago. Yes, how? I'm sure. Just about an hour ago. Five feet, seven, 128 pounds, green eyes, red hair. Red hair? Oh, no. Juanita's a blonde. Her mother told us that Juanita Lasky had red hair. Now, we weren't too surprised. A lot of women change the color of their hair. It would make identification a little more difficult, but not impossible. We checked down at the desk. Juanita Lasky had picked up all her mail, but she had not answered that long-distance phone call to Fountain Green. The next step was to question some of the people in the Chelsea Hotel who knew Juanita. We tried room 217. Yeah, oh, Gloria, these men are police officers. They want to ask you some questions. Why, well, yes. Is it all right for them to... Yes. Yes, of course. This is an exception. Won't you come in? Thank you. What's your name, miss? Gloria Edgerton. 
You know Juanita Lasky? Yes, I know her. She has a room right next door to me. Have you seen her today? No, I haven't. I've been out doing my Christmas shopping. Why? We were trying to locate her, Miss Edgington. Well, isn't she in her room? I thought I heard her shower going. Yeah, she did, but she wasn't in there. When was the last time you saw her? Last night at dinner. We always eat dinner together. Did she say anything that might lead you to believe that she was going anywhere today? No. She said she might do some Christmas shopping today, so I suggested she go with me. She agreed. She said she let me know this morning. Did she? No, she didn't. I just assumed that maybe she was sleeping in, so I went on alone. Are you sure she hasn't just slipped out? We don't know. She's just going down to the corner. It's a little unusual to leave the shower running, the radio on, and let your lunch get cold. Did she do that? How long has Juanita had blonde hair? Well, ever since I've known her, about six months. We moved in here together. We work at the same place. Where's that, Miss Edgerton? At the Kaiser building. We're elevator operators. I see. Who's your immediate superior down there? Darlene Camp. She's cheap starter. Mm -hmm. You got that, Ben? Mm -hmm. She have many dates? No, not too many. Juanita likes to go steady. Who was her steady boyfriend? Paul Matthews. He works in the Kaiser building, too. He's in the dental lab for Dr. Welty. Sixth floor. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to add that might help us find her? Well, are you sure she's lost? The Claggett Building is in the heart of downtown Los Angeles. It's a business and professional building. The cornerstone says, erected in 1924, and it stands 12 stories high. The main entrance is on Hill Street. Going up. Just go and get coffee. All right, Going up. Get back in the car, please. Are you Darlene Camp? Yes. Just a moment, please. Going out. All right, Dora. Can I help you? I'm Sergeant Friday, Police Department. This is Sergeant Romero. Yes, sir. Juanita Lasky work for you? Yes, she does. She's one of my operators. When's the last time you saw her? Mm, anything wrong? No, no. We're just trying to locate her. <laughs> you just missed her about 45 minutes. All right, Sylvia. She was in to pick up a check. You know where she cashes a check? Most of the girls cash them down at the bank on the corner. There's only one around here over on 8th. You say about 45 minutes ago? Yes, that's right. Thanks very much, Miss Camp. Come on, Ben. Going up. All right, Marion. Yeah, the bank's not far from here. Yeah, it is kind of funny, isn't it? What's that? Her room, the shower, the radio, that lunch. Door pulled out in a hurry. What do you think? I don't know what to figure. It's a new one on me. She's alive. We know that. She was 45 minutes ago, anyway. Hmm. Christmas is here. Santa Claus and his chimney. Yeah. No, oh, uh, I beg your pardon, sir. That's all right. Merry Christmas. Same to you. Here we are, Jim. Guess we better check with the manager, huh? You the manager? I'm the assistant manager. Can I help you? Police department. Yes, sir. I'd like to find out if a check has been cashed here within the hour. Yes, sir. And what's the party's name? Lasky, Juanita, payroll check, Plaggett building. Yes, sir. I know Miss Lasky. If you'll uh, step behind the counter, I'll get the check. Thank you. If you'll uh, just wait right here. Okay, thanks. Wonder why she stopped writing to her mother. That's a good question. When we find her, we'll ask her. Wonder if anything was wrong where she worked. No, it didn't seem to be. We'll check back there when we finish here. Yeah. That boyfriend, Paul Matthews, too. Yeah. Oh, here's our man. Yes, sir. Uh, here's the cancel check. I okayed it. You sure it's the same girl? Blonde girl, elevator operator in the Claggett building. Was she alone? Well, I think so. Did she appear normal? No. No, she didn't seem to be as friendly as she usually is. Now, does she have an account here? She did have a small savings account here, but she closed it out about a month ago. I see. Well, here's our card. If you should happen to see her again, give us a call. I'll do that. Thank you very much. Entirely welcome. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We went back to the Claggett building. Ben called the Chelsea Hotel from the phone booth in the lobby of the building. Miss Waters, the manager, was keeping a sharp lookout, but Juanita Lasky had not been heard from. Paul Matthews worked in a dental lab for a Dr. Welty. His office was number 637. Yes, gentlemen, may I help you? We'd like to see Paul Matthews. I'm Paul Matthews. We're from Missing Persons Police Department, Sergeant Friday. I'm Sergeant Merrill. Yes, sir. Do you know a Juanita Lasky? Yes, sir. When's the last time you saw her? Saturday night. We went to a show. Is there something wrong? We're trying to locate her. Do you see a lot of each other? Yes, we do. I don't understand. Miss Lasky disappeared from the hotel a couple hours ago. Thought maybe you might know where she is. No, I don't. Today's a day off. Maybe she's out shopping. Uh, has Juanita done anything wrong? No, it's just that her mother hasn't heard from her for quite some time. I can explain that. 
Juanita's an elevator operator here in the building. That's how I met her. They don't make much money, you know. Yeah. She was having a hard time making ends meet. She sends money home to her mother every month or so, and besides that, she's got to pay rent and buy clothes and eat. It's pretty rough. She seemed despondent over all this? No, I wouldn't say that, but she was kind of unhappy about not getting a raise. Did she have any outside job? No, sir, she didn't. What kind of a girl is she? What do you mean? Cheerful, good-natured. Oh, sure. Fine girl. We get along swell. I, I, I still don't get it. Well, maybe there's nothing to it. Just a routine check. I hope she's all right. When did all this come up? A couple of hours ago. We might have to check back with you. If I can help. Okay. Thanks for the information. Here's our card. If you hear from him, well, give us a ring. You don't suppose anything's happened to her? That's what we're trying to find out. Goodbye, Miss Matthew. <laughs> When we got back to Central Division, we had a full description of Juanita Lasky's teletype to all outlying stations in the metropolitan area of Los Angeles. We also put out an APB. We double-checked the repeater file and the wanderer file. We made out a full report on our findings to date. During the next eight days, we located a missing husband for a wife in Memphis, Tennessee. We picked up a runaway boy missing from his home in Reno, Nevada, and a 79-year-old veteran of the Spanish-American War who left his home in Bakersfield, California because he didn't like his daughter-in-law's cooking. But Juanita Lassie was still a mystery. For eight days, we checked and rechecked all our known friends and habits. We went back over the course a dozen times, but no trace. It was almost as if she had ceased to exist that day in the Chelsea Hotel. The letter and photograph from her mother had arrived, and we circulated it to cities all over the country. Her mother wrote that during the war, Juanita was a whack corporal. We put a tracer through to the War Department. That way, we'd have another photo and a full set of fingerprints. Well, where do you want to start today? I'll get it. Missing persons, Friday. Joe, this is Spencer over in the morgue. Yeah, Archie. You still looking for that girl? Uh, what's her name? Ramona Lasky? Juanita, yeah. Just had one brought in. Looks like your girl to me. The city morgue is located in the basement of the Hall of Justice on West Temple Street. Across the street from the city hall. A lot of missing persons cases end right here. Archie Spencer met us at the door. Hi, Joe. How's the wife been? Oh, fine, Archie. Over here, Joe. Cooler 23. Mm. Give me a hand, huh? You bet. That's her, isn't it? When's she going to be posted? As soon as your fingerprint man gets you. Mm. That's Ramona Lasky, isn't it? Juanita. Juanita, I mean. No. No, that's not her, Archie. You sure? Yeah. Oh, I was almost positive. Sure looks like this picture in the bulletin. Yeah, yeah, she looks a lot like the picture, but it's not Juanita Lasky. Five foot seven, green eyes, blonde hair, about 130. Hmm. How close can you get? Look at the face. You sure that's not her? Yeah, I'm sure. Look at her hair, the roots. Yeah. They're blonde all the way down. They ought to be dark. Our girl's a bleached blonde. Yeah, I see what you mean. Look at her right hand, index and middle fingers. Heavy nicotine stains. Our girl didn't smoke, Archie. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, guess I was wrong. That's not Ramona. Juanita. Come on, Ben. That afternoon, we got another phone call from Fountain Green, Utah. Juanita Lasky's mother. We told her we hadn't found any trace of her daughter. It was a hard job. We had answered calls like this before, but... Maybe it was just the season of the year. Somehow, we felt that we had to find Juanita Lasky by Christmas. We covered every angle we could think of. We kept close watch on all incoming reports. We stayed in close contact with her friends and Miss Waters at the Chelsea Hotel. Regardless of the name on the incoming reports, we checked every set of fingerprints against those we had received on Juanita Lasky from the War Department. Still, no trace. December 23rd, we checked in for work at 8.30 a.m. Chief Ed Backstrand wanted to see us. Got a little something on the Lasky girl. Might help you. What is it, Kevin? Man by the name of Willard Harris. Owns a bar out in Pomona. Phoned in this morning. Yeah? Found a woman's handbag left in the bar. Driver's license made out to Juanita Lasky. Why'd you think to call us? He's got a television set in his bar. Saw the Lasky girl's picture on Sergeant Rosenquist's broadcast last night. How about the girl? Says he can't place her. You uh, better hop out and pick up that purse. Willard Harris owned the Mission Trail Bar. It was in the bus terminal in the heart of Pomona. The Christmas traffic was heavy all the way out Garvey Boulevard. 
It was 10.45 when we pulled up in front of the bar. Willard Harris was inside taking a liquor inventory when we walked in. How do you do? You, Mr. Harris? Yes, yeah, that's right. You fellas with General Liquors? Los Angeles Police Department. My name's Friday. This is Sergeant Romero. Oh, say. Glad to know you, boys. Yeah, I called Los Angeles this morning. We came right out. Say, um, how about a little eye-opener? Got some fine Irish whiskey? No, thanks, Mr. Harris. How about your partner there? No, thank you. All right, boys. Guess you want that purse, huh? Yes, please. Yeah. Here you are. Just as I found it. I opened it up to get the owner's name, but that's all. Didn't touch a thing. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Harris. You said that you didn't remember seeing the woman who left this. No, I don't. But Herb works with me here. He might have seen her, but he didn't. I asked him the night we found it. How long ago did you find this purse? Oh, said about a two weeks. No, a little closer to a week. Yeah. yeah, about eight days ago. I usually hold something like this for 30 days. That's the law, you know. Yeah. But I saw that fellow on the television on that missing persons program. That's how come I called you, boy. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Harris. That's all, boy. I'm cold out this morning. Sure you don't want a little mix? No, thanks, Mr. Harris. Goodbye. We checked the personnel at the bus terminal, but none of them seemed to recognize Juanita Lasky's photograph. We checked the contents of her purse, but we found nothing unusual. Four $1 bills and some change and the normal things women carry. Since it was money in the bag, we felt sure that Juanita Lasky had lost the purse herself. That meant that she was alive eight days ago, two days after she walked out of the Chelsea Hotel. We checked 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 Chelsea Hotel's license home print. That's the only print carried on a California driver's license. It matched the same print on the War Department record. It didn't prove anything except that all the evidence tied in and belonged to the girl we were looking for, Juanita Lasky. The next morning, December 24th, we checked in for work at 8.30. Morning, Ben. All right, Joe, here's the data report. You want to check them? There's a mess of them. Let's get at them. Have you looked through any of them yet? No, not yet. I figured it would for you. All right, I'll take care. Huh? Mm. Got any shopping done? No, you? It's done. Lunch hour, mostly. Mm-hmm. Found some nice cards. Be sure to send me one. Yeah, I'll hand it to you in the morning. Let's trade shaving lotions like we did last year. If I get any. You can get some. My kid's got a bottle all picked out for you. It's called South Pole for that cool feeling. Yeah. Just like it. 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 Feeling one. He's only a kid. He's feeling one. He's only a kid. He's feeling one. Better than he gets old. Uh-huh. So he'll do it. Tell us that, buddy. On the last case. Thanks, Holmes. Oh, Ben, listen to this. Bureau of Criminal Investigation, Sacramento. Here's a kickback on our APB. Yeah, what's it say? Uh, reading your APB, number 43 on 12, 1248. Our records disclose that Juanita Lasky applied for a position of civilian clerk at Marchfield, California, U.S. Army Air Base, using alias Gene Davis. How about the fingerprint classification? Yeah, let me find it. Yeah, SPC. Key 19, primary 32 over 32, inner over outer, final 15 over 17. Friends, check out. That's our girl, Joe. <laughs> Sacramento report stated that Gene Davis had applied for government work at Marchfield, California. Well, a couple of things dropped into place. Her purse had been found in Pomona. That's right on the main highway from Los Angeles to Riverside. And the application for a job at the Army Air Base a few miles beyond Riverside. We put through a long-distance phone call, and they told us that Gene Davis was employed there as a civilian clerk but failed to show up for work that morning. It seems like we run fresh out of luck every trip, doesn't it? Yeah, we get so close, and then she's gone again. What do you think she's on the go for? If I could figure that, I could find her. I'll get it. Missing persons, Friday. Yeah? We'll be right over. We didn't find her, but she's been found. Juanita Lasky just walked into the Chelsea Hotel. We went over to the Chelsea Hotel. Technically, our job was completed now. Juanita Lasky had been found. We went over to make out a routine report. The streets were pretty jammed with last-minute Christmas shoppers, so we walked the last block to the hotel. What's your guess, Jill? Let's ask her. Come on, let's go in. That looks like her over by the desk there. Yeah, it's pretty well memorized, that face. Sergeant! This is Juanita Lasky, Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero, Juanita. How do you do, Miss Lasky? How do you do? I'm 
sorry. I'm terribly sorry. Miss Waters told me. Do you mind telling me? Where have you been? Sergeant, I don't know. These last 12 days have been a complete loss to me. Miss Waters told me what happened. I went over to see my doctor. He said I had temporary amnesia. I'll take treatment. Oh, I see. What's your doctor's name, Miss Lasky? Dr. Rudner over on Crenshaw. Well, we're glad you're okay. Kind of had us going there for a while. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I use your phone, Miss Waters? Oh, certainly. Help yourself. Thank you. I'd like to place a person-to-person -person call to Mrs. Hannah Lasky, Fountain Green, Utah. That number is 14R2. Fountain Green, Utah, 14R2. That's right. Your name and number, please. Joe Friday, and this is Hempstead, 8594. Thank you. Rate operator. Fountain Green, Utah, route and night person rate from Los Angeles. Lasky. Yes? Just a minute, Ms. Lasky. Juanita. Yes? You're wanted on the phone. Oh. Who is it? Just say hello. She'll take it from there. Let's go, Ben. Hello? Yes? Hello, Mother. Come on, Ben. Yes, I'm all right. See you tomorrow, Joe. Merry Christmas. Yeah, it is, isn't it? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Upon further examination by competent medical authorities, Juanita Lasky was found to be suffering from periodic spells of amnesia. She was given treatment and a complete cure was affected. You have just heard the eighth in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Corporal Grady A. Beecham of the 9th Precinct Metropolitan Police Force, Washington, D.C who, on the night of December 2nd, 1948, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. In NBC's great parade of new shows, Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to narcotics detail. For more than two months, doctors' offices have been burglarized, hospital pharmacies pillaged, drugstores robbed, medical supply firms ransacked, with one purpose in mind, the theft of narcotics. The criminals are expert, cunning, vicious. Your job, get them. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, transcribed in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. 
From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, March 23rd. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of narcotics. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the record bureau, and it was 10.35 p.m. when I got to room 24. Narcotics detail. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll be right over. Thank you. You get anything, Joe? Nothing we don't know already. How about you? That was the county hospital on the phone. Doc Welch. Pretty fair lead. I told him we'd be right over. What's he got? One of our informants, Benny Trounds. Ready? Let's go. What's with Benny? Bad shape. Somebody worked him over. They found him in an alley off of South Main. Yeah? Doc says Trounds will talk before he passed out. Anything good? He claimed he knows who's running the new dope racket in town. Says they got him. No, let's take the stairs here, huh? Why should they bother with small fry like Benny? That's what I'm wondering. Blackmail, maybe. Hmm. Benny's still on the needle? Maybe that accounts for his story. Doc says his skull is fractured. Morphine doesn't do that to him. Yeah. Benny mention any names? I don't know. Doc didn't say. Here's the garage. Come on. When did they pick up Benny? About an hour ago. He had a pocket full of bindles on him. Heroin. Crowns will small fry. He never had that much dope on him in his life. That's what makes it interesting. Let's go. County Hospital? Yes, sir. The line is busy when you wait. Thank you. Can I help you, gentlemen? We'd like to see Dr. Welsh. He's expecting us. Your name, please? This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday, police officer. Oh, yes. Around the corner to your left, room 127. The doctor's waiting for you. Thank you. Come on, Ben. I hope Benny's still talking. We could sure use a lead. Yeah. Here it is. 127. Hiya, Ben. Joe? How are you, Doc? Anything new? Just left Trownsville upstairs. You think we can talk to him now? Won't do much good. He died about six minutes ago. For almost two years, Benny Trounsel, an addict himself, had been one of the most valuable informants Ben and I had in the narcotic game. More than once, he had helped us solve a case, but this time, if Benny Trounsel had any direct leads to the nerve center of the newest narcotic ring, he took them with him. Besides his dying accusation that the ring had gotten to him, he left behind only two small scraps of information. First... When he arrived at the county hospital, Dr. Welsh reported that Trounsel repeatedly muttered the name Patterson. Secondly, among the few personal effects found in his pockets was a good amount of heroin and a small piece of white paper with two words scrawled on it, Tucker Building. Benny Trounsel's body was taken to the county morgue, and the next morning it was posted. At the coroner's inquest, the cause of death was listed as a brain hemorrhage induced by severe blows by a blunt instrument on the sides and base of the skull, inflicted by a person or persons unknown. Besides Ben and myself, the only identification witness at the inquest was a woman who managed a rooming house in Benedict Alley, where Trounsel used to stay periodically. After the inquest, we questioned her briefly in our office. Miss Strutch, you say you can't remember any friends Trounsel had while he stayed at your rooming house? No, I can't. Besides, if I knew that man used dope, I never would have rented him a room. How long did he rent from you, Miss Strutch? About six months. I run a respectable house. I don't mind if my people drink a little now and then, but those dope users, no, sir. Did you know anything about Trounsel, Miss Strite? Where he spent his time, where he had his meals? Well, don't serve at my place. Too much trouble. Most of the people eat at the Ace Lunchroom. Down the corner. Where's that, Miss Strite? Um, Grant and South Main. Right on the corner. And you think Trounsel might have spent some time there? He might have, I don't know. Miss Strite, did Trounsel ever mention anyone by the name of Patterson? No. Patterson? No. And you can't recall any friends he might have had? He had any friends and never set foot in my house. That's all I know. All right, Miss Strike, thank you. Here's a card, ma'am. If you come across any information about trials, we'd appreciate it if you'd call us. All right. Isn't that all? That's all, ma'am. Thank you. Well, bye. Goodbye, ma'am. Big help. Yeah, not even a good identification with me. 
You got those listings we made on the Tucker building? Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Here it is. Okay, let me have it. Huh? Tucker building, 7310 South Wilshire. I wonder what Benny Trounsel could have been doing out there. Shouldn't be too hard to check. It's a small building. Yeah. Six listings for the whole place. A couple of law officers, real estate guy, dentist, architect, and a doctor. One dentist, one doctor. Could you leave? Maybe. Pretty thin. Friday, Romero. You got a minute? Yes, Skipper. Come on, Doc. Yeah. What do you got, Ed? Letters. Here's a sample. Now listen to this. Chief of Detectives, Ed Back, Strand City Hall, Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. In view of mounting wave of narcotic robberies, strongly recommend that your efforts to curb this lawlessness be redoubled. Are they all like that? All of them. They're mad. Can you blame them? Not a bit. We haven't got much to go on, Chief. The gang's pretty smart. All right, then let's be smarter. There's no law against it. Doing our best, Giver. Then make it better. I'm sick of that bunch, and I'm tired of these letters. And look at that record. In two months, 15 drugstore robbed, eight medical offices, two supply houses, two hospital pharmacies. Narcotics missing every time. Now, who's behind it? None of the old-timers. We've checked them out. Gone over every hype and mainliner we know of. All right, then get on the transient. New faces. Climb on every one of them that shoots the stuff. Until you get to that gang and break it. If you need help, holler. But get to that gang and break it. You understand? Okay, Skipper, we'll try. You dig up anything on that Trounsel case yet? Still checking out one lay. What? Slip of paper we found in Trounsel's pocket, Ed. Said Tucker building on it, that's all. Just going to check it out when you called. All right, hop on it. Fast. We got a lot of pressure on us. Keep in touch with the office. It was almost noon when Ben and I got out to the Tucker building. It was a two-story affair, comparatively small, very modern. We checked with the dentist in the building first, but he'd never heard of anyone by the name of Benny Trousel. His records and appointment books proved it out. Well, that's one down, Joe. Yeah. Let's try that doctor's office now. What's his name? Let me see. Uh, oh, Springer. Dr. Fred Springer. He's on the second floor. Okay. There's a stairway down there. Come on. Pretty close to lunchtime. Might not be in. Maybe. Somebody should be there. We haven't got much time to play with. Yeah. Chief sure was up in there this morning. Here's the office. Fred Springer, M.D. We'd like to see Dr. Springer, please. Do you have an appointment? No, we don't. Well, the doctor's not in at present. Would you like to make an appointment for later in the day? No, ma'am. We're police officers. This is Sergeant Friday. I'm Sergeant Romero. How do you do? I'm uh, Miss Turner. I'm the doctor's nurse. Then you must take care of the appointment and record books for the doctor. Yes, I do. Well, maybe you can give us the information we're looking for, Miss Turner. Did the doctor ever have a patient by the name of Trounsel? Benny Trounsel? Trounsel? Mm-hmm. No, I, I don't think so. Just a moment, I'll check. Thank you. No. T R O U N S E L, is that the way it's spelled? Yes, ma'am. No. The name's not listed here. Uh, let me check the account book. No. Wait. It's funny. What's that, Miss Turner? Here in the back of the book in the doctor's handwriting. Look. Hmm. Trounsel, the black parrot. Certainly funny. I can't remember seeing that notation before. It must be fairly recent. Miss Turner, what kind of a clientele would you say Dr. Springer has? Oh, it's quite exclusive. Beverly Hills, Bel Air. That's where most of the bills are mailed. Can you recall seeing Trounsel in the office here, Miss Turner? Small man, thin, walked with a kind of a limp, not very well dressed? No, I, I don't think so. It doesn't sound like any of our patients. Would you show us the doctor's prescription list for the last two months? We'd like to check them. Well, I'm afraid I can't. Dr. Springer keeps it in the safe. He's the only one who has the combination. How long have you been with Dr. Springer? About ten months. Ever since he started his practice out here. Where was he before that? Philadelphia. I, I don't understand all these questions. Is there anything the matter? Just a routine check, Miss Turner. When do you expect the doctor back? About four this afternoon. He's out making home calls. All right. Here's our card. Would you ask him to call us as soon as he comes in? I'll do that. Thank you, Miss Turner. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Oh, say, Miss Turner, one more question. Yes? Does Dr. Springer have a patient by the name of Patterson? Oh, yes. One of the doctor's first patients, John Patterson. He lives out on East Beverly Drive. When we left Dr. Springer's office, we called R&I. There was no make on John Patterson. Ben and I drove over to see him just on a hunch. 
It didn't pay off right then, but it showed a little promise. When the maid came to the door of the Swank apartment, she told us Patterson was out for the day. We asked her about Patterson's occupation. She didn't know. We asked her about his friends, his business acquaintances. She could remember only two people visiting the apartment. One of them was Dr. Springer, apparently a constant visitor. The other, a tall, dark man who spoke bad English. We asked the maid how long she had worked for Patterson. She said ever since he moved to Los Angeles, about six months before. A few things started to fall into place, but it was strictly a guesswork operation. Ben and I got in the car and headed for the south end of the city to check out some of the places Benny Trounsel was supposed to have frequented. We met a stone wall from the Ace Lunch Room near Benny's former rooming house to the Black Parrot. No one was willing to talk. Threats didn't work and neither did promises. Ben and I gave up for the moment and headed back to the office. Pacific Ambulance 1, call to Alhambra is now code 3. Seems like Skid Row doesn't want any part of this one. Yeah, there's a bad feeling. Something's got him scared. Sure would like to know what it is or who it is. Yeah, I'd like to know the answer to that, too. Control 1, unit 80K. Bust, Joe. Get it, will you? I got it. 80K to Control 1. 80K to Control 1. Go ahead. 80K. Call station 2511. Close 3. 80K to Control 1. Roger. KMA 367. wonder what that's all about. Now let's find out. There's a drugstore. They ought to have a phone. Pull over, huh? You got a nickel? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Thanks. I'll be back in a minute. Friday, Mike. The chief there? Oh, yeah. Just a minute. Back friend talking. This is Friday, Ed. What do you got? You tied up? Nothing big. Then check in as soon as you can. Got something good. What? You remember the stick-up at St. Agnes Hospital about a month ago? Pharmacy there? What about it? Two patrolmen picked up a user down near Union Station about an hour and a half ago. Yeah? Guy was way back on his heels. He had two vials of morphine on him. Files had serial numbers. Good. Did they match out? Perfect. Thanks, Ed. We'll be right in. When Ben and I got back to the office at 3.52 p.m., we picked up Chief Ed Backstrand and went directly to the crime lab where Lieutenant Lee Jones analyzed the contents of the two vials taken from the suspect. Jones told us it was high-grade morphine. We went back to the office and double-checked the serial numbers on the vials with the crime report on the St. Agnes Hospital robbery. They matched. And there's a good break. These vials were in the loot when the gang knocked over the hospital 28 days ago. Now stay on the trail and we'll crack that gang wide open. This the arrest report on the guy yet? Yeah. Picked him up in a bar off South Main. Who is the guy? Trangy? Yeah, here it is, man. James Steiner, Phoenix, Arizona, age 37, transient laborer. Anybody talk to this guy yet, Ed? Not yet. He couldn't be too hard. You better get on it. Right, Skipper. Come on, Joe. Check you later, Ed. What time you got, Ben? Let me see, uh... 25 past four. Any phone call for you, Ben? Yeah, who was it? Your wife. Wants you to pick up some aspirin and a bottle of nose drops for your kid on your way home. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. That's the only call we had, Mike? That's right. Thanks. Well, you got that Dr. Springer's number, Ben? Yeah. Um, yeah here it is. Uh, request for you 55284. Five, Thanks. Nurse said he'd call us around four, didn't he? Yeah. Dr. Springer's office. This is Sergeant Friday down at the police department. Dr. Springer there? Well, no, he isn't, Sergeant. He called in about 20 minutes ago when I gave him your message. He said he'd call you. All right, Miss Turner. When he comes in, tell him to call us. Impress on him it's urgent. All right, Sergeant. I'll do that. Goodbye. Goodbye. No left? I don't know. Just a hunch. He may be ducking us. Who are you calling now? State Medical Board. Maybe they can check us out on Dr. Springer. I put the call through to the state medical board and asked for a check on Dr. Fred Springer. They said they'd call back within the hour. In the meantime, we had James Steiner brought to one of the interrogation rooms for questioning. It was all talk. Uh, like I told the sergeant when they booked me, I, I don't know anything about this hospital, John. Sit down, Steiner. Oh, all right. How long you been in the city, Steiner? L.A.? 
Oh, about a month. I, I came from Phoenix, looking for work. Things are pretty slow in Phoenix. Where'd you get the morphine? Huh? I said, where'd you get the morphine? The stuff? Uh, I bought it. Just for a pop now and then. I just play around with it. Just for kicks. Who'd you buy the vial from? Who? I don't know. Got in a bar. Gave me a price. Which bar was that? Which bar? Uh, Black Perry. I, I'm not hooked. I, I just play around with it, just for kicks. What'd the guy look like, Stoner? What did he look like? I don't know. Tall, I guess. Would you remember him if you saw him again? Remember? Sure. I talked to him a couple of nights at the bar. Was he on the stuff? Was he a hype? A hype? Yeah. Maybe. Tall fella, Doc. You shooting the stuff? Shooting the stuff? No. No, I, I'm no mainliner. I never took in the veins of my life. I, I told you, I'd do it just for kicks. Just a pop now and then. Take off your shirt. Let's see your arms. Huh? My arms? Come on, take it off. Well, <laughs> Who are you kidding, Stanny? Your arm looks like a pin cushion. I, I, I told you, just once in a while, just for the kicks. I'm not hooked on it. They found two vials of stolen morphine on you, Stanny. You can go two ways, hard or easy. Hard or easy? I, I told you, I ain't done nothing. I, I bought this stuff. I, I use a cap or a bindle once in a while for kicks, but I'm not hooked. I bought the stuff, I tell you. Who was he, Steiner? Who sold it to you? Who? I told you, I met him in a bar, the Black Ferret. Who was he? He was tall. Dark, he gave me a good price. Come on, let's have it, Steiner. His name. I'm feeling sick. You got something for me, I'm sick. All right. Mike. Yeah, Joe. Get some milk. A couple of quarts right away. Okay. You ready to tell us, Steiner? Who was it? Sick. I'm sick. We're getting some milk for you now. Come on, you better talk. Max. That, that, that's all he said. Name was Max. He gave me a good price. I only take a pop now and then just for kicks. You think you could point him out for us? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I'm sick. Narcotics from Mill. Hello. This is Dr. Springer calling. He wanted to talk to me. Yes, we did, Doctor. And we've got a few questions we'd like to ask you. Oh, hold on just a minute, will you? Dr. Springer, Joe. All right, tell him we got to see him tonight. We'll call him back later. Dr. Springer? Yes? Sorry, Doctor. We'll have to see you later on tonight. You be at home? Well, I have an appointment this evening. Uh, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Sure, Doctor. It's about a man named Benny Trowney. Oh. I see. And if you don't mind, we'd like to check over your prescription list, will you? Yes. I'll cancel my appointment. You can contact me here at home. 1538 South Road. I'll be here all night. All right, Doctor. Thank you. We'll see you later, then. Uh, yes. Goodbye. Goodbye. What'd he say? All right? Yeah, it's all right. I'll buy that hunch of yours now, Joe. Hmm? Dr. Springer, he knows who killed Benny Tronzel. I bet he knows why. When Mike Hannon came back with the milk, we fed it to Steiner, and then we put him back in his cell. We put in another call to John Patterson out on East Beverly Drive, but there was no answer. We left word with Hannon where we were going, and then Ben and I headed out for Dr. Springer's home. It was 7.35 when we pulled up into the driveway at 1538 South Road, a low, rambling, ranch-type home. We got out of the car and made our way down the path to the front door. The gray Persian cat followed us. The door was half open. We knocked, but there was no answer. Through the window, we could see the living room was dimly lighted. We went in. We found Dr. Springer sitting in a large carved mahogany chair in the dining room. The room was hung with draperies. He was slumped forward, face down on the dining table. There was a bullet hole in his right temple. On the floor near his right hand was a 32 automatic pistol. In the center of the dining table was a piece of white paper. Looks like he beat us. Yeah. Any names on that confession? One. Says he killed Trump. No, wait a minute. It says, uh, John Patterson, he forced me to this. What? I don't know. What's it look like to you? Here's another one. Norberg. That's all it says. Then he signed his name, Dr. Fred Springer. Ben, come over here. Look at these. 
Mm, hypodermic needle. Or work. Is this morphine? White powder. Could be. Then he was on it himself. Looks like it. We'll find out when they post him. I'll get it. Yeah. Sergeant Friday there, please. This is Joe, Mike. What do you got? Can you talk all right there? Yeah, go ahead. Just got a kickback on your call to the state medical board on this Dr. Fred Springer. Mm -hmm. He's not a registered physician in the state of California. Besides that, his license was revoked in Pennsylvania two years ago. Illegal operation. That explains it. Notify homicide. Get the crime lab in the corner out here, will you? Looks like Springer shot himself. Okay, Joe, right away. We'll wait for him, but hurry him up, Mike. We got a couple more places to check out tonight. Okay, Joe, see you later. Right. What's next, Patterson Blake? I don't know. Maybe we ought to try Steiner first. Sounds good to me. Feels like we're getting close. Yeah, man, real close. <laughs> Twelve minutes later, Homicide and the crime lab men checked in at the Springer house, and Ben and I checked out. We went back to the office and found Ed Backstrand waiting for us. We told him our story, and he sent two men out to keep an eye on the Patterson place. Two other men went to work to try and track down the other name in Springer's confession note, Norberg. Ben and I went up to the county jail and picked up Steiner. The three of us started out to look for the man who sold Steiner the two vials of morphine stolen from the hospital pharmacy a month before. The man's name was Max. He was tall and dark. That was all we knew. The rest of it was up to Steiner. Two other men from the detail, Davis and Emerson, came along with us to take care of Steiner if anything went wrong. Our first stop was the Black Parrot Tavern. Davis parked the car in an alley down the street. Steiner, Ben, and I got out and walked the rest of the way. You understand what you're supposed to do, Steiner? Me? Yeah. I go in first and sit at the bar. You two will follow me. I sit at the bar, and if I see Max, I give you the sign. That's, that's okay, huh? That's right. Now, you don't try to break for it. Break for it? Me? I, I told you, I'm squaring with you guys. All right, Steiner. Go ahead. Let's hope it works, Joe. Yeah. There he goes inside. Come on. Now, look, try to grab one of the booths along the wall if you can, huh? Right. Here we are. The first booth, Ben, it's empty. Yeah. Oh, it's about to order at the bar. Wait, just got a night off. Make it a couple of beers, will you? A couple of beers? Okay. Joe, go look at Steiner. Yeah, he's signaling. Must mean the guy putting on his coat over there. No, hold it, Ben. Wait till he gets past us. All right, get Steiner back to the car. I'll tell the guy. You come after me. I didn't know how right Steiner was or how much we could trust him. All I knew was that the man I was following was tall and he was in a hurry. I followed him three quarters of a block before he turned in at a motel. He went to a cottage at the rear of the lot, let himself in, and closed the door quickly behind him. A minute later, Ben and the others pulled up in the car. Got him staked up, Joe. Steiner says that was Max. Let's make sure. Come on. Which one's the end? The one down at the end here. Now be careful. You too. All right, here we are. Wait a minute right there. No rear door. He's got to come out the front. Keep the door clear. You ready? All set. Cover me. Open up in there. Who is it? Police officers. Open up. Just for a minute. All right, Ben. Give it back to him. Stop! Stop! Don't shoot! We'll come out! All right. Throw your guns out first and come out with your hands behind your head and make it fast. Watch it, Ben. He's making a break. All right, mister. That's far enough. Get out of my way. Get out of Get my way. Get him, Ben. That's good, Ben. You all right? Yeah. He didn't mean it, Cover. He didn't mean it. He didn't know what he was doing. Well, that must be a good excuse, lady. A lot of people use it. Come on, Ben. Let's take him in. <laughs> It was ten minutes past midnight when we got back to headquarters. Both the man and the woman were booked for violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony. He gave his name as Max Jansen. In his luggage, we found 13 vials of morphine, large quantities of heroin, and a small amount of panopin. He gave us the names and addresses of six active members of the narcotics gang. He identified Dr. Springer as second in command. Just a few more questions, Jansen. Yeah, all right. Why did Springer kill Trounsel? He had it coming. Trounsel knew the score and he was blackmailing him. Bleeding them white. Why didn't the gang take care of them? The boss said no rough stuff. Things were going too good. He warned Springer, but he wouldn't listen. All right, Jensen, just one more question. Who's the boss? Will I get off light? 
state's witness. It might help. We can't promise you anything. Who's the boss, Patterson? Yeah, 138 East Beverly Drive. That's right. What about Norberg? How does he figure? The same guy. Patterson, Norberg, both the same. And what's his real name? Norberg. Tony Norberg. What's his front? He's legit. He used to be importing business. Where? Here. Got an office downtown. Do I get protection? Where's Norberg now? Home, out in Laurel Canyon. Do I get protection? I thought you said he lived out on East Beverly. His apartment, his home's out in the canyon. Where? What's the address? Do I get protection? You'll get protection. Wind and way. 860 Wind and Way. All right, Friday. Romero, take some men with you. Davis, cover the back of the house. Levine, you cover the front. Come on, Ben. Yeah? Mr. Norberg in? Who's calling? Police officer. Oh, come in, won't you? Thank you. Now get your hands up. Face the wall. You'll never make it, lady. The house is surrounded. Tony, get the stuff. It's our only chance. They'll cut you down, Norberg. All right, Jeannie, give him the gun. Don't be a fool. They're going to march out the door in front of us, right to the car. I'm not going, Jean. Try it if you want to. I'm not going. All right, Tony, stay. Come on, coppers. You'd never make it, lady. I said move. Fast. All right, Ben, hit the dirt. He's going for the car. See if he can get those tires. Dane? Yeah. Norberg was smart. Must be the girlfriend. Guess so. Wonder why this dark. Hmm? Why did they get on the stuff, Joe? For kicks, Ben. None of them ever get hooked. Just for kicks. <laughs> just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Tony Norberg, alias John Patterson, was tried and convicted for possession of narcotics, robbery, and conspiracy, and was sentenced to the maximum term prescribed by law, each count to run consecutively. He died three years and 11 days after his arrival at the state penitentiary. <laughs> You have just heard the ninth in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Chief Erskine Ert Fish of the North Sacramento Police Department, who on the night of August 11, 1935, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. <laughs> Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. We're in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide. There's a mad killer at large in your city. A woman has been brutally slain. The body mutilated. The picture is clear. The killer has a thirst for blood. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, transcribed in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force 
in action. It was Wednesday, January 12th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the morgue, and it was 11.23 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Chief wants to see you. He's in there with Romero. Thanks, Chandler. How's the wife? Fine. How about your mother? Better, thanks. Hi, Joe. Hi. Come on in. Sit down. Did they post the body in? In the morning. Pretty messy. Strangled and mutilated. The guy's a maniac, Skipper. The body shows it. A murder like this? Anybody's a suspect. The coroner looked at the body. He says the weapon was a long, sharp instrument. Found her in a hotel down on East 3rd Street. Manager's son discovered her about 7.30. You talked to him? It was too much for him. He passed out. Manager wasn't home. We'll check with him before midnight. Close to it now, Joe. We better get going. All right. The boys from the crime lab check the room? They're still down there, Ed. The place is a mess. Get back as soon as you can. We're working straight through on this thing. That's a hot shot. I'll get it. Lux Hotel, room 219, corner of South Grand and Cordova. Dead body. Possible homicide. The Lux Hotel, room 219, corner of South Grand and Cordova. A dead body. What is it, Friday? Lux Hotel, possible homicide. Busy night. Yeah. You coming, Ed? Right. Let's go. Six minutes later, Ed Backstrand, Ben, and I pulled up in front of the Lux Hotel. The manager met us at the door and led the way up a narrow stairway to the second floor. The room number was 219. We were prepared for the worst. We got it. You're right, Romero. The guy must be a maniac. Two hotels, two murders. The same M.O. Three of us made a brief inspection of the room at the Lux Hotel. We took a few notes on the appearance of the girl's body and a brief description. Apparently, she'd been strangled to death first, and then her body brutally mangled. Ben and I went back down to the lobby. And the manager of Mr. Ford showed us the house book. The girl was registered together with a man, Mr. and Mrs. Philip Grant. We took the hotel register to have it checked for fingerprints and to photostat the handwriting. Ben notified the crime lab. Then we went back to the room and questioned the manager. Mr. and Mrs. Philip Grant, that's all I know. I never saw either one of them before tonight. When did they check in, Mr. Ford? About three hours ago. That's right, about nine. Maybe a little before. Did they register together? Yeah, a little before nine. They came in together. Did you let them in the room? Yes, sir, like I always do. It's a small place here, maybe not first class, but I treat people right. What did the man look like? Do you remember? I think so. Kind of tall. Young, maybe 30 or so, husky fella, had a mustache. How tall would you say, Mr. Ford? Oh, about your height, Wade. Must have been at least 180. Seemed like a nice fella. Would you know him if you saw him again? I think so. People sure don't act like they look. You think it was him? Can you think of anybody else? Well, no. I never saw him before tonight, either one of them. I don't know anything about it. Did you notice anything in particular about them when they came in? Well, he didn't show it. But it looked like she'd been drinking a little. Giggling, you know. And you didn't see this man Grant leave the hotel? No, I didn't. I must have been checking the account books back of the desk. Guess he got by me. Is there a back entrance to the hotel, Mr. Ford? No, he had to come out this way, all right. How about the fire escape? I never thought of that. Say, I bet you cops think I'm trying to hide something. How did you happen to find the body? I don't know anything about it, honest. I've been running the hotel for ten years now. Everybody knows me around here. You can ask at the bank. All right, Mr. Ford. Now, would you mind telling us how you happened to find the body? I don't want a lot of lousy newspaper publicity. Give the place a bad name. Can you blame me? The newspapers won't get your name from us. All we want to know is how you happened to find the body. Well, I told you. It's a small place here, but I like to treat people right. A couple hours after they checked in, I remembered I forgot to fill the ice water pitcher in the room. So I got some and took it up. The door was opened a little ways. It's got a bad catch on it. And the lights were on. I peeked in, and there she was. She was... Well, the guy must have been crazy. You remember what time it was when you found her? Well, just before I called the cops, about 
Half past 11, I guess. All right, Ford, that's all for now. When the other officers get here, show them up, will you? Yes, sir, I sure will. Romero? Yes, Skipper? Get on the phone downstairs and call the Metropolitan Division. Have them send us every available man from the reserve unit. We're going to patrol the area for the rest of the night. Right, Chief. Least we can do is make it hard for him. <clears throat> Two murders in seven hours. Yeah, both of them in a three-block radius. Yeah, the same pattern. It's got to be the same guy. All right, we got a description. What do you think? Well, when the reserve unit shows up, have them cover this whole section of town. Pick up everybody who even comes close to that guy's description. All right, Ed. It's got to go fast. We can't lose a minute. One hour either way, it, it might mean another body. Like this one. <laughs> Nine minutes later, at four minutes past midnight, the men from the crime lab showed up. It started to drizzle. They went over the room in detail. They dusted everything in the room for fingerprints, the walls, the doors, the fixtures in the bathroom, the lamps, chairs, everything. They took samples of the girl's blood and her lipstick. Small pieces of flesh and human hair were found under the girl's fingernail. The nails were scraped carefully and the contents put in an envelope, marked and sealed. Ed Backstrand ordered pictures taken of the room and the girl's body from different angles. Every object in the room that could have any possible tie-in with a murder was photographed. It was raining. The rear of the hotel where the fire escape was overlooked a vacant lot. Ben had a hunch. While the lab men were at work, we left the hotel and circled around into the lot for a look at the ground directly underneath the fire escape ladder. It was raining hard now. Must be an easier way to make a living. Mud's almost up to my knee. Mine too. Watch your step. You see any prints? No. Wait till my wife sees these new shoes. Put it on your expense account. Oh, real funny. Ben, get that light over here. Look. Yeah, good set of prints. Lucky that rain didn't start turning to wash them out by now. Yeah, hand me that cover from the trash can over there. I'll cover them. Wait a minute. What? Here, on the edge of the fire escape ladder. Small hunk of cloth, man suit? Well, looks like it. Might have caught himself in that sharp corner. I got it. All right, come on, let's get back. Yeah, out of this mud bath. Yo, huh? let me have a light. You catch anything? Hunk of wrapping paper in that trash can. Stains on it. Open it up. Look. Yeah, a butcher knife. We went back to the Lux Hotel, room 219. The lab men were tearing the room apart. It was ten minutes to one. We gave the blood-stained knife and the piece of cloth we found on the fire escape to Lieutenant Lee Jones, head of the crime lab. We told him about the footprints just below the fire escape ladder. The knife will help us sew the cloth. I don't know about the footprints. You say you covered them? That's right, Lee. They still look in pretty good shape. Maybe we can do something if the rain hasn't broken them down too bad. Bracken. Yeah, Lieutenant? You and Sloan get downstairs and take a look at those prints. They're good enough. Get a torch, dry them out, and make a cast, right? Okay, Lieutenant. Come on, sir. That's about all I can do for you now, Ed. I think we got everything there is to get. All right, Jones. I'll follow you back to the lab in a couple of minutes. Okay, Ed. Good luck, fellas. Thanks, Lee. We're going to need it. All right, Friday. Romero, it's your baby for the rest of the night. Did he get anything? A few prints, a woman's purse under the bed. Don't know if it's hers or not. No identification. You going to be at the crime lab, Ed? All night. As soon as we find anything, I'll let you know. Yeah? Gang of cops just came in the lobby. They asked for you. Must be the reserve men from Metropolitan. Tell them we'll be right down, Ford. Okay. You want us to handle it, Ed? That's right. Do just as I told you. Spread them out over the whole area. Cover the streets, the alleys, the flop houses, restaurants, bars, everything. We got a description to go on. Find the man that fits it. Right, Skipper. Don't forget, the guy's a killer twice over. I don't think he'd hesitate on you. Be careful. <laughs> We went down to the lobby, and Ed Backstrand gave the reserve men their orders. Then Backstrand left, and Ben and I took over. We picked up another half dozen men in addition to the men in the reserve unit. They were deployed over an area of a dozen square blocks. It was one of the toughest sections of the city. With a general description of the suspect, some of them were to travel on foot, some in cruiser cars. A few minutes before 1 a.m., there was a steady downpour. Visibility was bad. At three minutes past one, the manhunt was on. For the first 30 minutes, Ben and I cruised the general area between East 3rd and College Streets and Alameda and Figueroa. No sign. The rain kept on. We sat and listened to the calls come in. 12A, call your station. 
What do you think, Joe? Any hunches? I think he's still around. Somewhere inside these 12 blocks. I bet on him. Five? All right, you're on. Want to check out a couple of these bars along here? Getting on the closing time. It's a good idea. Pull over, huh? All right, let's check him for the next couple of blocks, huh? Right. For the next six blocks until closing time, Ben and I checked every bar and every informant we met along the way. The questions got to be automatic. Have you seen a man answering this description? Tall, dark, about 5 feet 11, 180 pounds, well-built, mustache, about 30 years old. The answer's got to be automatic, too. Sorry, officer, I haven't seen him. No, can't remember him. Try the place down the street. We kept on checking the bars until they closed for the night. Then we started on the all-night restaurants and coffee counters. We did plenty of legwork for the next hour. Not a trace. About 2.30, the rain let up a little, and then it started in heavy all over again. That finishes that block. Yeah, I better get the radio on. Yeah. Beautiful weather. By the bucket, Paul. You want to smoke? Hmm, thank you. Control 4, Unit 80K, your location, please. Yeah. 80K, your location, KMA 367. That's us, Joe. You want to take it? Yeah, I got it. 80K to Control 4, 80K to Control 4, our location, corner of Alameda and Commercial, KMA 367. 80K, stand by. Something's going. Maybe. No, hold on a minute. Control 4 to 80K. Go to the crime lab, code 2. 80K to Control 4, KMA 367. Crime lab. Maybe those prints paid off. Oh, I hope so. Let's go. Huh? That killer sure picked fine weather to work in. Feels like I've just been swimming in these clothes. Yeah. I hope those guys in the crime lab have the heater on. A hot bath and a warm bed. Lead me on. Attention, all units. Hold on. Let's get the radio. All units. At 420 St. John's Place, a woman screaming. All right, double around, Ben. Hit the siren. I'll get the light. Right, hold on. Left turn on the mark, you said, right? Yeah, watch out for those fire tracks. They're wet. Hold on again. The alley up ahead to your right, huh? All right, pull up, Ben. Put the street light over there. There you are. All right, come on. Let's go. Officer! Officer! Over here! All right, what happened? Let's have it. This girl, Rita, she was coming home up the street. A man, he tried to grab her. He slashed her coat. Look at her. Her eyes saw him as he ran under the street light. Where'd he go? Uh, down that way, down the alley, over that fence there. A big man. Davis, Davis, you there? Yeah, Joe. All right, Ben, go with Davis. Circle behind the alley. See what you can find. I'll call in. All right, come on, Dave. Yeah. Officer, look at her face. What's wrong with her? Severe state of shock, it looks like. Get her in the house, huh? I'll call an ambulance. 80K to control four. 80K to control four. Control four, go ahead. Direct all units in the vicinity to converge on area around St. John's Place from Jackson to Banning Street. A woman attacked by large man with knife. Suspect left seen on foot. Possibly still in area. Request ambulance. KMA 367. 80K, Roger, stand by. Attention, all units. Attention, all units. Converge on area around St. John's Place, Jackson to Banning Street. 80K reports woman attacked by large man with knife. Suspect left seen on foot. In three minutes, the area around St. John's Place was surrounded. For the next hour, the men combed the neighborhood back and forth. Every building, every storehouse in the two square blocks was searched from basement to attic. No trace. The girl, Rita, was hysterical. She could give us only a bare description of her attacker. At 3.45 a.m., a detail was assigned to patrol the area, and the rest of the cars and men were deployed again in the general area from Figueroa to Alameda Street and East 3rd to College Street. 
The manhunt went on. So did the ring. At 3.54, Ben and I checked in at the old city jail building, second floor, the crime lab. Chief Ed Backstrand and Lee Jones were waiting for us. Heard about the call. How'd he get away? Not sure it was him, Skipper. How do you mean? Well, the girl wasn't hurt bad for one thing. No attempted strangling. For another thing, the guy stole her purse. That doesn't sound like the man we're after. Did you get a description from the girl? Didn't jibe too well, what she gave us. She was pretty hysterical. And you raked the neighborhood good? Every corner. Not a sign. Do you find anything? Yeah. Jones? Yeah, Ed. Fill them in, will you? Not one print on that knife you found, boys. Blood, but not a print. Your killer's crazy like a fox. And how about the scrapings from the girl's fingernails, Lee? Didn't help too much. Really do. Not enough to go on. Got to have a fair-sized bit of flesh to run with the papal ridges. All we found under the girl's fingernails are small bits of skin. Yeah. She probably scratched the guy up some. Might have drawn blood. We had more luck with the footprints. You get an impression? Dried out the ground with torches and cast them. About size 10B. That's fine, Lee. But how about the prints? Only good one was a thumb. Real good. Got it off the wall near the light switch in the bathroom. You classified yet? Yep. Found it in our single fingerprint file. The print belongs to a man by the name of Long. Robert Long. You got a record, Ed? Yeah. Misdemeanor. Two arrests for drunkenness last October. Petty theft in December. The mama sheet shows a dishonorable discharge from the United States Coast Guard in 1946. Age 29, 192 pounds, 5 feet 10 inches, dark hair, dark eyes. Well, that's close enough. We got even closer, Joe. Long works as a counterman at the Cottage Cafe down on South Flower. Started there last week on the early morning shift, but he didn't show up for work last night. Good. Where'd you get the tip? The knife you boys found. It didn't have any prints, but it had a brand on it. We ran it down. It was taken from the Cottage Cafe. Mm-hmm. Any address on this Robert Long, Ed? Yeah, got it from his boss. Rooming house on East First. Landlady says he hasn't been home in two nights. Yeah, now we wait. Rooming house is staked out, and so is the cottage cafe, just in case Long decides to show up for work this morning. What time you got, Romero? Uh, six minutes past four. All right. We've got every indication that Robert Long's the man we're after. His description, fingerprints, the knife, the footprint, his size. Maybe we're wrong. I don't think so. How about a motive, Ed? I think Robert Long likes to kill. He's thirsty for it. None of the victims were criminally attacked. They were strangled. Bodies mutilated. How about robbery? No. Two of the women he killed had money in their purses. Didn't touch it. Well, what's next, Skipper? Back on the street? Figueroa to Alameda. He's third to College Street. Keep a net around that area and work it back and forth until we're positive he's not inside. I think he is. At ten minutes past four a.m., Ed Backstrand, Ben, and I left the crime lab and drove to the surrounded area. It was still raining. We passed several patrolmen from the reserve unit making the rounds. They didn't look any more comfortable than we felt. At Broadway and Alpine Street, Ben and I got out and started patrolling on foot again. Backstrand followed in the car to maintain a radio check. We must have covered two dozen blocks and a half a dozen coffee counters before we got to the Criterion Restaurant and Donut Shop, a few blocks up the street from the cottage cafe. Hey, Skipper. You want to take a minute for some hot coffee? I'll keep an ear on the radio. You two go ahead. You look drenched. Yeah, we are. Will we bring you some back in a paper carton? Fine, thanks. Cream. No sugar. All right, Ed. Come on, Ben. Place is empty. Yeah. Yes, sir, gentlemen. What'll it be? Hot coffee? Yeah, there's two of us here. Can you fix up one to go? Sure thing. Say on that one to go, cream, no sugar. Right. Say, you fellas cops? Yeah, why? No offense, just wondering. Here you are. Thank you. Cop in uniform was around a couple hours ago. Wanted to know if I'd seen some guy he was looking for. Tall, about 190 pounds, mustache, about 30 years old. Yeah, that's the description he gave me. He, he was looking for the guy. So are we. Say, that's good. That other cop came in right at my busiest time, a little after two when the bars closed. You know, I guess pretty rushed, and I didn't have much time to think, so I just said no. Then after the cop left, I remembered. You saw a man answering that description tonight? Yeah. I would have told the cop, but I was rushed. You know how it is. No time to think. And then I remembered. Are you sure? Oh, I'm sure, all right. Whoever he is, he's a lady killer. What do you mean? No offense. Uh, there was a sharp-looking dame down the end of the counter, and this guy breezes in and picks her up. Talks to her about 20 minutes, buys her a cup of coffee, and they walk out together. You remember what she looked like? Oh, nice-looking dame. Not beautiful, you know. More on the, on the cute side. Ben, you got that morgue shot? Oh, yeah. 
Here, here, dear. Thanks. Here's a picture. This the girl? Let's see. Yeah, that's her. Who is she? I don't know, mister. Down at the morgue, they call her Jane Doe, number seven. Just by accident, we'd come across a concrete lead on the killer's method of operation. The picture we showed the man in the donut shop was a shot of the strangler's first victim the night before. Evidently, the killer would enter a bar, coffee shop, or restaurant, strike up a conversation with a woman, make friends with her, either buy her drinks or invite her to a bar in the neighborhood, and then the rest of the puzzle was still unsolved. We went back to the cottage cafe and checked with the men on stakeout. Not a sign of them, Chief. How are you men covering the place? Baxter up in front in the booth across from the cash register. Lyman's back with the dishwashers. I'm at the counter. When's Long due to report for work, Dave? At five. About mm, 20 minutes to go. You're lucky you're inside. It's wet out there. You're looking. All right, Davis. We'll be around about five. Right, Chief. Let's get back in the car. Where to, Skipper? Cruise the next two blocks, but don't go too far. If Long shows up for work this morning, we want to be around. The next ten minutes dragged by. The rain kept on. Backstrand chewed nervously on a cigar. At South Flower and First Street, the sewers were clogged with street refuse. The rain backed up and filled the intersection. A group of aircraft workers huddled together in the doorway on one corner waiting for the bus. It was cold and damp. I opened one of the back windows in the car to get some fresh air in. Off in the distance and close by, we could hear the sounds of a big city waking up slow to a rainy January morning. It was eight minutes to five. Attention all units. Attention all units. At 780 East Main, a restaurant. Man answering description of murder suspect. All right, Romero, step At on it. All right, Jim. About ten blocks away, Ed. Who's going to cover the men at the cottage cafe? If this is a blind lead, it won't take us long to find out. They can handle it alone if they have to. Hang on. Look out. We're skidding. That was a close one, Ben. Yeah. If this is the guy, I owe you five bucks, right? Yeah. Attention all units. Additional information on your call to 780 East Main. Officers in pursuit of suspect. Suspect is on foot. Step on it, Romero. Attention, Two more blocks, Skipper. Watch it, Ben. Next one to the left. Got it. That's the joint up ahead there. All right, watch your step and don't take chances. Don't play with it. Right. Here we go. He went out the back, ran down that alley. Come on, Ben. Behind you. You men, hustle it. Hustle around the block and choke off the alley. There. Come in, please. Oh, go with it. Right. Right over the fence, Ben. Ben, look out, look out. All right. It's not that good. Come on, Joe. All right. There he goes. Between the buildings. Stop or I'll shoot. The next house. He ducked into the basement. All right, cover me. All right. Come on, he broke through the garage doors. There's Davis. Dave, Dave, he slipped through. Get down to the next corner and ring the block. Yeah. Ben, Ben, did you follow him? Yeah, right on his tail, that warehouse, a couple of lots over. He went through the back. There it is, Joe. All right, don't go in blind. Watch out. All right, you, you haven't got a chance. Come out with your hands up. He's not stopping, Joe. All right, let's fan out. All right, Ben, cover me. I'm going for the door. All right, Ben, come on. You're clear. You spot him? There he is. Let's get him. No. He's in a good spot. Let's move. He's up in the lot. Come on, let's head for the stairs. Will you? Easy. Spot him, Ben. Not a sign. Ben, look out that packing tape. Kind of close, huh, Joe? Yeah. Let's get that punk now. Hey, now, Joe, there's another one. Surrounded. Come on down. All right, then we'll flash you out. Joe, he's dropping down the ladder. He's going for the front door. They're waiting for you with Tommy guns out there. They'll cut you down. Stop. 
Joe, he's got the door open. He's making a break for it. He's crazy. He's trying to shoot his way out. Well, he asked for it. Yeah. Let's take a look. Messed up. Well, like his girlfriends. Well, maybe he just didn't like women. Maybe. Hi, Ed. You all right? Sorry. This is him, huh? Even the scratches that girl made on his face. <laughs> Description match? Five feet ten, 192 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes. Age 29. Robert Long. Killer. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. You have just heard the tenth in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Detective Louis A. Abbott of the Chicago Police Department, who on the afternoon of March 3rd, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, you'll probably want to listen this Saturday evening to a pair of adventure shows featuring two well-known Hollywood personalities. You'll enjoy Brian Donlevy, star of Dangerous Assignment. Also on Saturday's schedule is Richard Diamond, private detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell. Listen to both of these exciting programs this Saturday over most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. A sudden wave of jewel thefts is sweeping the city. In 16 days, 16 burglaries have been committed, one each night. They bear the same trademark. Thousands of dollars of jewels are missing. The thief is a master at his trade. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. Investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 17th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way into work that morning, and it was 7.53 a.m. when I got to room 45. Burglary detail. Hi, Joe. How are you, Walker? Going to be a scorcher out today. Yeah, just like yesterday. Ben in yet? I think he's over in communications picking up the mail. Oh, thanks. You guys been busy? Yeah, kind of. Jewel thefts. Anything big? No, no big hauls, but he's consistent. Sixteen nights in a row. Hmm. Same guy? Think so. Same M.O. Yeah, everybody's got troubles. Got to check some records. See you later, Joe. Okay, Willie. Burglary, Friday. Yeah. Okay, Mike, soon as Ben gets back. He's picking up the mail. 
Right. Bye. Hi, Joe. Hi, Ben. Hannon just called. Chief wants to see us. Take a look at these first. What do you got? Overnight reports? Yeah, I yeah, have these two. Mm. Yeah. Two of them. Three diamond rings, one sapphire, one necklace, jade. Big haul. Look at that other one. Ladies' watch, diamond band, emerald bracelet, tourmaline brooch. What's tourmaline, Ben? I don't know. It must be valuable. It's gone. Mm hmm. Let's see. Owner left house about 9 p.m., returned about 1.30 a.m., found property gone, scratches on the door. Probably using the cellophane method. Hasn't missed yet. Two in one night. Well, he's picking up his pace. Must have a bag full of loot somewhere, whoever it is. You get the description sheet from pawn shop detail? Yeah, I got them right here. You take half of them. Let's see what luck we got this morning. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Nothing so far. Mm -mm. Me neither. Just, uh, I'll get it, Joe. Burglar Romero. Hi, Ben. Chief still wants to talk to you, boys. He's got an appointment at 830. He wants to see you before he leaves. Okay, Mike. Just checking some buy sheets. Be right in. Better make it fast. He's in a bad mood this morning. Okay, Mike. Thank you. Back strand again? Yeah, he's in a bad mood. Come on. Wonder what's bothering him. Something's bad. He doesn't blow very often. Chief of Detectives Office, Hannon. Go ahead in, boys. He's waiting. Thank you, Mike. All right, ma'am. I'll connect you. Friday, Romero, sit down. Wait till I get the phone. Back strand. Oh, yes, Mrs. Winthrop. Yes, ma'am. We're doing all we can. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, ma'am. Goodbye. Got trouble, Ed? Taxpayer, Mrs. Winthrop. You two ought to remember the name. We do, Skip. Ten days ago, somebody lifted $2,000 worth of diamonds from her bedroom while she was at the symphony. Last night, she was hit again. A diamond watch, an emerald bracelet, and some kind of a brooch. Tourmaline. I don't care what kind it was. It's gone. What's the pitch? We just read a report a couple of minutes ago, Skipper. Could be a time with those other 16 jobs. 16 jobs in 16 days. You haven't got a lead on the thief yet? Nothing shows up. No prints, nothing. Uh, what about the pawn shops? Nobody's tried to soak any hot stuff as far as we know. We double-checked the detail. We got every hawk shop in town on the alert. Whoever it is, they've got to try to pawn the stuff sometime. Unless they're going to give diamond rings for Christmas presents. They haven't tried the pawn shops yet, Skipper. We're sure they Look, 16 burglaries in 16 days. Jewels and watches. Good ones. Well, it's got to stop. It's got to stop soon, you understand? We'll stay right on top of it, Ed. We're doing all we can. For two weeks, I've had half a dozen women calling me every day. Society women. Some of them figure they should get extra treatment. They're only DR numbers to us, Skipper. They all get the same attention. I'll try and explain that to some of them. They think you're in on the racket. Maybe you boys would like to take these calls some morning. No, thanks, Ed. All right, then, let's get some action. Keep the pawn shop operators on their toes and get after every known fence in town. That's all. I've got an appointment. All right, Ed. Check you later. Holding a call for you, Ben. Oh, thank you. Hello. Oh, hi, Max. What? What? Well, hold it. Be right down. First break, Joe. What do you got? Necklace and a watch. Both of them on the stolen property list. Where? Henry's Pawn Shop. Fifth and Main. Six minutes later at 8.25 a.m., Ben and I drove up in front of Henry's Square Deal Pawn Shop. Quick cash. No red tape. Watches bought and sold. The proprietor was Max Murphy, an old friend of Ben's. Well, pal, of all days, it had to happen yesterday. Took the day off and went fishing up at Big Bear. I left my nephew in charge, Harry. A real knothead, that kid. How do you mean, Max? Joe, if I told him once, I told him a hundred and once. Whatever you do, whatever they come in with the hawk, check it with the list. Check it with the stolen property list. What does he do? He forgot. He forgot. Oh, a real knothead, that boy. How old is he, Max? Thirty-two. A real knothead. I checked the slips from yesterday. Then I checked the stolen property list. There it is. Hot stuff. When does stuff come in, Max, do you know? About four o'clock yesterday afternoon. Can we look at it? Oh, sure. Uh, back here behind the car. There it is. Did you check out the serial numbers on the watch yet, Mac? When I found out, yes. They match to a T. All right, let's see. Yeah, description on this necklace matches, too. Let's have a look at your Bible, huh, Max? Yes, sir, Joe. Here you are. There's a deal right there. Here? Yeah, that's him. That's how he gave his name. Mm. Walter Tracy, 132 and a half Blackstone Court, Los Angeles. Let me check the book for the description, Matt. Oh, sure. Yeah, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Max, thanks. We'll be checking with you later. Sure, Joe. Anytime. Sorry. All right, Max. See you later. Uh, you fellas take it easy. Right. 
Daddy. I want to check and see if we're clear, Joe. Yeah, I will. 80K to control one. 80K to control one. Are we clear? Control one to 80K. Stand by. Good lead, Joe. Got a description in here. Yeah. It's too bad Max's nephew had to slip up. Control one to 80K. Call your office immediately. Call your office immediately. K Matrix wonder what that's about. I don't know. I'll call in. You got some change? I'll use Max's phone. Use your phone a minute, Max. Oh, you bet. Sure. Help yourself. Thank you. Two five two four. Two five two four. Burglary, Levine. This is Ben, George. You got something? Hot one. Universal loan shop, sixth and Barton Place. Guy just took in a couple of rings. He checked too late. What you mean? He checked the form after the guy left. It was signed Walter Tracy. <laughs> there they are, Sergeant. Both rings. Fine quality diamonds. Don't you usually check your stolen goods list before you take in stuff like this? Usually, yes. Last night, no. I don't know what I was thinking about. Can we have a look at your buy book? Right here. There it is. Walter Tracy. 699 Olive Street. 145 pounds, 5 foot 9, dark hair, build, thin. We'll have to slap a hold on these rings. I know. I should have thought. Can you think of anything else that might help us to identify the man? Well, no. Had a light suit on. Nice cut. Very well dressed. Thank you. That's all for now. Here's a card. If the guy happens to drop back, give us a call, will you? Sure will, Sergeant. Say. Yeah? I've got some nice watch pens. Yours look gold. Can I interest you? No, thanks. Some other time. Come on, Ben. That afternoon and the following morning, despite our alert and our warnings, two more pawn shops called in with reports of stolen watches taken in. We checked them out. The serial numbers on the watches matched those on the stolen property list. On the pawn shop account books, the loan was listed under the name Walter Tracy. The addresses were given as number 12 St. Vincent Place and 700 East Flower. The descriptions of the man were the same. Slight build, well-dressed, about 145 pounds, 5 feet 9 inches tall, dark wavy hair. We had the name and description distributed to every pawn shop in Los Angeles and surrounding communities. Through our informants, we checked up on every known fence in the city. For the next two nights, we received no reports of stolen jewels. That made up for the double burglary the night before. On June 19th, the box score read 18 successive nights, 18 successive jewel burglaries. At 3.25 in the afternoon, Ben and I sat down to check over the late incoming reports. Got anything, Joe? No, not yet, no. Mm, nothing here. Maybe the guy's left town. Nope. No such luck. Take a look. That's it, number 19. He may set a record. Well, he's making monkeys out of us, isn't he? Look, man's watch, lady's watch, Chinese amber necklace, diamond shirt studs, and a bracelet with two large rubies. He's getting ambitious. How's the value listing? Let me see. $1,800. One haul. I'll get it. Burglary Friday. Yeah. What? Yeah. Be right down. Stall him. Let's go, Ben. Where? Kaplan's down on East 2nd. Walter Tracy's in there now, trying to hock a gold watch. Ben, cover the door. I'll give it look like I'm shopping around. Right, but watch your step. We don't know this guy. Yeah, stay close to the door, huh? I'm sorry. That's the best we can do on the Look, Mac, this is gold. 21 jewels. Well, that's the best I can do. Ah, drop dead. Plus, well, the best I can do. Don't get sore. Yeah, sure. See you later. That's him, Sergeant. Wallet Tracy. I stole him as long as I could. All right, I'll check back with you later. Did you spot the guy that just came out? Yeah, I went up straight. Let's follow him. Hustle it. You spot him, Ben? Straight ahead, about 15 yards. He's crossing the street. Yeah, let's get up a little closer. We'll lose him, sure, if the light changes. Come on, run for it. What's the traffic light? Yeah. That was close. We might have spotted us. It's going faster. Come on, Joe, run. Yeah. Don't lose him. 
crowd's not helping. Hey, hey, wait a minute. I thought you're a cop. You're chasing somebody. All right, let go of my arm, mister. Let go. Well, you don't have to get tough. Lousy cops take the owner's street. I'm going to write the mayor's office. Come on, Joe. He's running for me. Yeah, I see him. Watch the signal up ahead. Hurry, Joe. Almost up to me. Into the parking lot. Hey, you. Stop. Look out, Joe. A gun. Yeah, I see All right. Get away. All get right, away, smart guy. Oops. Nice job. Yeah. He's too fast for an honest man. Let's take him in. When we got back to headquarters, Walter Tracy was under technical arrest. We took him directly to the interrogation room. We searched him thoroughly. We had him take everything out of his pockets and put it on the table. Then we had him take all the money he had in his wallet, count it out, and hold it in his hand. What is all this routine? That's all the money you have on you? $47.17, right? Yeah. Okay, keep it in your hand. Ben, shake him down. All right, Tracy, take off your coat, shirt, tie, and your shoes and socks. What kind of a pitch is this? I'm no hood. Take them off. Two-bit cops. You're not pinning anything on me. I don't care what you do. Sleeves, pockets, lining. Nothing in the coat, Joe. Get his shirt. Take it light with the threads, huh? Cost money. How about the trousers, Ben? Let's see. Cuffs, pockets... No. Let me get the belt. Zipper on the inside of the belt? No, it's clean. Shoes are okay. All right, Tracy, let's see the soles of your feet. I hope you don't mind. Uh, they're dirty. Why don't you take a shower? Let's see. All right, Joe, nothing. Put your toes back on. Yeah, thanks. All right, Joe, what's your name? Huh? I said, what's your name? You telling jokes? Walter Tracy, you know that. Your real name. How old are you, Tracy? 27. Where do you live? No place. Just got in town a couple of days ago. Where are you from? Salina, Kansas. Where you been sleeping the last two nights? The park, Pershing Square. Clothes don't show it. Pretty natty. I had them pressed. Where? Down by the square. I don't remember. You ever been arrested before? No. Where'd you get this gun, Tracy, the one you pulled on us? I didn't know who you were. Could have been a couple of hoods. <laughs> you kind of look like it. Where'd you get the gun? I won it in a crap game coming out on the train. Where'd you get the watch? Graduation present. You want to run a make on him, Joe? The gun and the watch? Yeah, I'll call him. Go on, check. You can't prove a thing. Pawn shop records, Gilmore. Gil, this is Friday. Can you give me a make on a watch? Sure, Joe. Go ahead. Time master, yellow gold, man's wristwatch. Okay. Case number 716F23. Right. Movement number B351708. Got it. Okay. Now give me a make on this gun, huh? 32 S and W automatic. Serial number 579461. Okay. Call me back. Right. What's your station number? 2572. I'll ring you, Joe. Thanks. Having fun? What'd you do with all those jewels you stole? When do I get out of here? I don't think you're gonna get out. You got nothing on me. How tall are you, Tracy? Get your tape measure. Five nine. How much you weigh? 140. I'm 27. My name's Walter Tracy. I come from Salina. I've been in town two days, and I don't know what you guys are talking about. You sound smart. You don't act it. And you're flying Brian Copper. What'd you do with those jewels you stole? I don't know what you're talking about. What color are your eyes? <laughs> I don't know. I'm colorblind. What color would you say your hair is? You colorblind, too? You ever been arrested before? Straighten out. He asked me that. I'm asking you. No. You ever done any big time? No. All right, I don't care if you're level with us or not. We're going to make you on those prowl jobs, all 19 of them. Sure, sure. You guys are smart. You got in Los Angeles two days ago, is that right? Yeah. You don't know anything about any jewel thefts? That's what I said. And how come your name and your handwriting's on the account books in four pawn shops in Los Angeles? Not mine. You can't prove it. We can, Tracy. Come clean. What'd you do with the stuff you stole from 1250 Moraga Drive, June 5th? I didn't steal any stuff. What'd you do with the rings and watches you took from 1400 Placerville Road, June 9th? I wasn't in town. What'd you do with the diamond dress pins you stole June 13th, 123 South Van S? Did I do that? You're not only kinky, you're a bad liar. You prove it. Porter, get you a saw buck, your prints bounce, Tracy. Our handwriting man's gone to work on those signatures of yours. You haven't got a chance. Now, come on. Where'd you hide this stuff? You can't prove a thing. Where'd you say you've been sleeping the last two nights? In the park, Pershing Square. You want a map? 
clothes sure look nice. I said I had them pressed. But you can't remember where? No, I can't remember where. That a crime? Friday time. Joe, this is Gilmore. Here's the stuff you asked for. Let's have it, Gil. No make on the watch, no make on the gun. Okay, Gil, thanks a lot. Yeah. You're in up your neck. You said that, didn't you? You're gonna talk, Tracy. <sighs> kind of tired. All right, we'll let you sleep on it. Come on, Ben, let's book him. All right. I'll get your jobs, coppers. Sure. Come on. We took Walter Tracy to the county jail and had him booked on suspicion of burglary. He was still sullen. We knew we had the guilty man. Now we had to prove it. As it often happens, the victims never see the burglar. They only know he's been there. They can't identify him, but they can identify their property. Our job was to find the property. When we did, we'd have Walter Tracy. And the 19 victims would have their property returned. But Tracy wasn't talking. We knew he'd never talk unless he thought it might help him. We took the problem to Ed Backstrand. Smart punk, Skipper, but he's done time before. How do you know? Tried him out last night when we brought him in. He talks like it and he acts like it. But he won't cop out. Are you sure? He won't talk in a hundred years. He knows he's got us in a spot. And one thing's sure. We're not going to send him up without finding the loot first. He's planted the stuff somewhere in the city. We've got to find it. Ben and I have got an idea, Ed. It's not going to be easy, but it might work. What is it? Tracy tried to soak some of the stolen property at four separate pawn shops in the downtown area. Yeah? At each one of those four pawn shops, he gave a local address. Now, we're sure he must have a room or an apartment someplace in town. All right. Where? That's where guesswork comes in, Skipper. Every one of those addresses he gave falls within a certain area. How big an area? Oh, uh, you got that street diagram, Joe? Yeah. Here it is, Ed. From uh, Figueroa here to San Pedro. And from uh, Pico down to First Street. The area's about 12 blocks wide, 14 blocks long. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of territory. How are you going to cover it? On foot. We'll take Tracy with us. Plenty of legwork. You sure it's the answer? We've got to find the stuff, and it's the only way we can figure it. Hotels, apartments, rooming houses. There must be hundreds of places he could stay in that territory. It'll take a couple of weeks. Yeah, on foot it will. All right. It's tough, but it's your idea. Go to it. <laughs> An hour after we left Chief Backstrand, we got Tracy out of his cell in the county jail and started our canvas of the appointed area. We took the usual precautions and handcuffed Tracy's wrists to our own. We started the search for his hideout at First Street and Figueroa. It was a warm day in Los Angeles. The temperature was 91. After the first three hours, I could tell Ben's feet were ready to give out, and so were mine. We couldn't even have the comfort of complaining. That had encouraged Tracy, and he was cocky enough already. He cursed and Your threatened every step of the way. My legs off. All right, quit pulling, will you? Come on, Tracy, up the stairs. Another one to check. Warm day, Joe. Yeah, a little. What do you mean, a little? Must be 110. Yes? What is it? You the manager? Yes. Could you tell me which apartment this man has in your house now? Who, him? Yes, ma'am, this one. Never saw him before. He don't live here. All right, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Hot, ain't it? When are you gonna get wise? Come on, Tracy. Well, that finishes this side of the street. You want to cross over, Joe? Yeah. Let's go. I'm hungry. I want to eat. After we cover the other side of the street. You can't do this to me. I'm gonna get a lawyer. I'll have your jobs. Both of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on. We only got a couple of hundred places to cover. Hi, gents. What can I do for you? You the manager? I run the place, yeah. Which room does this man have in your place? Him? You made a mistake. He doesn't live here. All right, thanks. My feet are killing me. Wait till I get a lawyer. I'll burn both of you dumb cops. What do you think you're doing anyway? All that day and the day after that and the day after that, Ben and I, with Tracy handcuffed to our wrist, canvassed the designated areas from hotel to hotel, from rooming house to rooming house, and the apartments, too. Every day, our feet ached a little more, our pace slowed down, Tracy got more irritable, and the weather got hotter. The second day, it reached a high of 92. The third day, 94. The fourth day, 94. Police regulations say plainclothes officers must wear a coat and necktie on the street at all times. We wore our coats and neckties. The search continued into the fifth day. Our pace got even slower. Ben and I started to lose heart. 
After a while, we forgot our object was to recover the stolen jewels. All we wanted was to find Tracy's hideout. We knew we were right. We knew Tracy was our man. It was a point of pride. Whether your feet hurt or not, you don't give in to a thief. Yes? What do you want? You the landlady here? I am. Which apartment does this man have in the building? Well, none of them. He's not one of my tenants. Thank you, ma'am. Come on, Tracy. By the sixth day, all three of us had special pads in our shoes. Our feet ached worse than ever. Tracy let us know about his every three minutes. By late afternoon of the sixth day, we'd covered more than half of the designated area. The temperature was 95. You guys gonna go on forever? I'm sweating like a horse. I'm getting tired of your moaning. That looks like the manager behind the desk. Yes, sir? You the manager? Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Can you tell us which room this man has in the hotel? Him? Mm -hmm. He doesn't live here. Hey, uh, you fellas look awfully warm. Like to cool off in the lobby? We're air-conditioned. No, thanks. I'm hungry. When do we eat? You're always hungry. You got the biggest mouth on a cop I ever saw. Oh, All yeah. right. Uh, yeah. I'm hungry. I want to eat. Now. Wait till I give this story to the papers. Mistreating innocent guys. They'll break you. All right. Come on. Up the stairs. I'm going to get a lawyer tonight. I'll show you. Yes? Why, Mr. Baker, where have you been? We questioned the landlady, a Miss Elizabeth Hunter. She told us that Baker, alias Tracy, had rented an apartment from her about two months before. That's all the information she could give us. Tracy clammed up. He would admit nothing. We asked Miss Hunter to accompany us as a witness. We took the elevator up to Tracy's apartment on the sixth floor. Miss Hunter, Tracy, Ben, and I. Down this way. Here. Do you want me to open it? Please, Miss Hunter. What? There's a girl. Walter? What is it, Walter? I told you to get out of town if I didn't come back. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave without you. I thought you slept in the park. Ah, uh, take a jump. Where is the stuff hidden? All right, Ben, handcuff him to a chair. The girl behind him. We'll find the stuff ourselves. All right, Tracy. All right, you next. I haven't done anything either. See, you can't prove it. Billy, shut up. That's better. No talking between you two. If there is, we'll separate you. All right, Ben, you take the living room here. I'll try the kitchen. And get a window open. It's hot in here. All right. Sergeant, you will be careful of the furniture. Yes, ma'am. I had no idea. You, Mr. Baker, of all people. Don't talk to him, please, ma'am. Oh, yes. <gasps> Tin cop. Why don't you spell? Ben, look. It's only the beginning. He's got the stuff scattered seven ways for Sunday. We're going to need help. In the milk bottle? Yeah, two rings, three loose diamonds, and this bottle of mayonnaise. We found some kind of a brooch in it. A couple of watches taped to the underside of the kitchen sink. All right, you. Convinced? Okay, Ben. Call back, Strand. <laughs> There was a definite possibility that Walter Baker, alias Tracy, had stored some of his stolen loot outside his apartment. We stood little chance of ever recovering it unless we got him to break. Ben called Chief Backstrand, and in ten minutes he arrived at the apartment with another man from burglary detail, George Levine. Together we went over the four-room apartment foot by foot. We found jewelry, watches, loose stones in every conceivable place. In cartons of cottage cheese, in jars of cold cream, in the garbage can, everywhere. Who's your girlfriend? All right, I'll ask her. What's your name? I said, what is your name? Billy. Billy Crawford. He didn't do anything. He didn't. All right, Billy. Maybe you can tell us. Where's the rest of the stuff he stole? He didn't steal. He didn't steal anything. Billy, shut up. Keep quiet, you. Ed, wait a minute. What? Just a minute. I want to look over here. Papers. Taped to the underside of that top drawer. What is it, Fred? No, no, you can't. You can't. Look at these. All right, you found them. I'll talk. No, Walter, don't. They're all papers. He's an ex-con. Yeah, I'll cop out. Don't do it, Walter. Billy, shut up. Dumb dame. The rest of the stuff, where is it? On the roof. Inside the ventilator, the one near the front, you'll find a couple of paper bags. That's it. Levine? Got it, Chief. I'll check it. Your papers say you did time in Oregon. What for? Fell for robbery. Did five. I owe him seven. What about the girl? Walter, I'm going with you. 
Her? I don't know. You figure it. All right, Friday. Romero, take the girl to Lincoln Heights and book her. We'll take him. Right, Ed. Come on, Ben. No. No, Walter, I want to go with you. I'm sorry, ma'am. This way out. All right, easy, lady. No, no, wait a minute. Just a minute. Walter? You're a dumb damn belly. So long. Walter. All right, come on. Let's go. What's the matter? You feel all right? He lied. He said he loved me. He lied to me. Don't feel hurt, lady. He lied to everybody. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Walter Baker, alias Walter Tracy, was tried and convicted on three counts of first-degree burglary and received the maximum sentence prescribed by law. He is now serving out his term in the state penitentiary. A hold has been placed on him by the state of Oregon, where he will serve out seven years for violation of parole. Billy Crawford, Baker's accomplice, was tried and convicted of receiving stolen property and is now serving time in the state penitentiary for women. You have just heard the 11th in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official police files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Warden Clarence A. Larkin of Folsom Prison, Sacramento, who, on the evening of September 24th, 1937, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, you'll want to listen this Saturday evening to a pair of adventure shows featuring two well-known Hollywood personalities. You'll enjoy Brian Donlevy, star of Dangerous Assignment. Also on Saturday's schedule is Richard Diamond, private detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell. Listen to both of these exciting programs this Saturday over most of these same NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. An armed gang of blitz bandits has started to work in your city. Their pace is fast. Four and five robberies each night. The criminals are not amateurs. They're well-armed, dangerous. Your job, get them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, October 23rd. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of robbery. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the statistician's office, and it was 11.42 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. How'd it work out, Joe? Any good prospects? Well, I don't know how good they are, but I got a handful. How many did you get? Well, let me see. 15, 18, 22. Ethel down in the stats office ran them on the IBM for me. There they are. Hmm, let's see. It's a gang of three men working on foot. Blitz robberies. They only take cash. M.O. is tie-ups. Work from 8 to 10 at night. One of the gang's tall, the other two short. And these are the men the machine sorted out? Under that heading, yeah. If our information's wrong, then so is the machine. Got a good bunch of candidates here. Descriptions match up with what we got. They seem to. Check the names on that list, Ben. Some of the smartest thieves in the country. Yeah. Tommy Willis, 
Ray Grandpa, Kemp Satelli, Manny Roberts, George Cross, Mario Kosky. Reads like June graduation at San Quentin. Yeah. George Cross and Tommy Willis are in town. We know that. And Kosky, he's around a couple of weeks ago. And what about the rest? The big field? Have to check them out, I guess. Might as well start at the beginning. Did you go through the overnight reports yet? Yeah. No restaurants, no liquor stores. That makes five days the gang's laid off. Well, they can afford you, can't they? 18 robberies in 24 days, that's a pretty good haul. This stop-and-go strategy of theirs, Joe, it got me. Yeah. They work hard for a week in one area, and then they lay low. If they just keep going, we might have a better try at them. Hey, Joe. Yeah, Chandler. I fell out here to see you, Joe. My name's Decker. Decker? Henry Decker? Didn't say. Want to see him? Yeah, send him in. Right. All right, Mr. Decker. This way. How are you, Joe? You're looking good. Oh, Hank Decker. How are you? I'm fine. Well, what are you waiting for? Applause? Come on in and shut the door. <laughs> Hank, this is my partner, Ben Romero. Ben, Hank Decker. Hi, right, Hank. How are you, Ben? Hank and I are in service together. Yeah, I just dropped in for a visit, Joe. Are you busy? No more than usual. Sit down. Oh, thanks. I remembered you telling me you were on the PD, so I figured I'd drop around and get an inside track. How do you mean? I just filed with civil service to take the exam next month. Figure I'd like to work at being a cop. He shell shot, Joe. <laughs> Great pep talk you boys hand out. You sure you want to be a cop? Oh, look, I'm 30 years old, Joe. I'm married, high school education, about a year of junior college. What's your wife think? She's not sold. Well, that's why I dropped in. How about coming out to the house for dinner tonight? You want me to sell her? Just talk to her. Seven okay? Yeah, seven's okay. All right. Glad to have met you, Ben. Same here, Decker. See you again. All right. Bye, Joe. See you tonight, Hank. Well, what do you think, Ben? Ought to make a good cop. We had a list of 22 possible suspects. By 5 o'clock, Ben and I had checked out two of them who might possibly have had a hand in the Blitz robberies of the 18 liquor stores and restaurants in the past 24 days. Number one man was Thomas Willis, Caucasian, age 29, 5 feet 11 inches, 175 pounds, dark hair, blue eyes. Number two man was Mario Kosky, Caucasian, 5 feet 6 inches, 170 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes, large scar under his chin, running across his throat, up to and behind his left ear. According to our informants, and after questioning some of their associates, either Willis or Kosky or both could have taken part in the Blitz holdups. We showed their mugs to the victims, but none of them could give us definite assurance that either Willis or Kosky were in the holdup gang. At seven that night, I went out to Hank Decker's house for supper, met his wife, Linda, his four-year-old twin boys. We talked about the army, played with the kids for a while. Before we sat out to eat, we put the boys in bed. Hank was in the kitchen carving the roast. His wife closed the door to the kids' room, and we started downstairs for the kitchen. What do you think of our two atom bombs? Oh, they're fine kids, Miss Decker. Hank told me that you were worried about him wanting to join the force. I was 12 years old when my father was shot down. He was a policeman in Des Moines. He was only 37 when he died. I wouldn't know what to do if anything like that happened to Hank. What do you want me to say? But does Hank really want it? Can't you talk him out of it? You're his wife. Can you? No, I think it's his choice, Miss Decker. He's going to have to make up his own mind. I'm sorry. If it's what Hank wants, I guess I worry too much. A lot of women marry cops. They have, and they will, and they all worry. Hank will be all right. Will you guarantee it, Joe? During the next month, I heard from Hank Decker only once, who was studying hard. During the same month, Ben and I were working hard, trying to find some kind of a concrete lead to break the Blitz gang. There had been no subsequent holdups which seemed to tie in directly with the gang or its operation. From the list of possible suspects which Ben and I made up, 18 names had been eliminated for one reason or another. Either they were in jail at the time of the robberies, out of the Los Angeles area, or out of the state. But four names remained. George Cross, Tommy Willis, Mario Kosky, Julian Brock. During the latter part of the month, George Cross was booked on a minor charge, and we questioned him at that time. He showed no knowledge of the holdup. Nearly two months after the robberies were committed, Ben and I were still without a solution as to the whereabouts of the gang. Never known a blitz gang back like this way before, Joe. Once they get wound up, they usually go until they're caught. Yeah. 
You get out those telegram checks to the east yet? Last night, 4 went home. Sent out all three. Willis, Kosky, and Brock. I'd like to find just one of them. Chicago might have something. That's Kosky's old hangout. Willis, too. Mm. What about Brock? He's from Kansas City, isn't he? Yeah. I got a wire, too. Might have an answer from one of them tomorrow. That's a slow job. We'll have to wait it out. Yes, so. No follow-up from the victims we told Sue. I'll get it. Robbery Friday. Oh, hiya, Joe. Hank Decker, congratulate me. What for? I just passed my written exam. Got the letter this morning. How about that? That's fine. When do you take your physical? Oh, not till the end of the month. Next week, I take the oral and agility tests, then the physical. If I get by them, I'm in. Well, you're going to have a full month at the police academy after the test. It's a lot of work, Hank. Oh, it can't be any worse than these tests. It's a tough 30 days out there on the hill. Law, court procedure, evidence, combat fighting, target practice. You'll have to wade through all of them. You ever going to have anything encouraging to say? Yeah, when you graduate. I won't count on it. How's the job going? Slow. How's your wife feel now? About taking the job? Mm Mm-hmm. A little better. She said to say hello. Okay. Keep us posted, huh? I'll do that, Joe. Right. Bye. Hank passed his written test. Hmm. Sure anxious. Brandy, Romero, got a minute? Yes, careful. Come on, Joe. You got something, Ed? Yeah, those bitch robberies you're handling... Not having much luck. We were. Gangs disappeared. Not a trace of them so far. They leave town? Oh, we're not sure, Ed. We don't even have a good description. We're guessing most of the way. What are your guesses? You've had a couple of months to make them. Twelve of the holdup victims we talked to told us definitely that there were three men in the gang. Two of them short, one of them tall. We've just been working from there. All three of them have dark complexions. Started with 22 possibilities and got it weeded down to four. No, wait a minute, three. Yeah. Tommy Willis, Mario Kosky, Julian Brock. Willis and Kosky are eastern hoods, Brock's from the Middle West. And where are they now? Haven't showed their faces around town, checking some of the cities in the east. That's about all we got, Skipper. Uh, not much for two months' work. Thieves can't be that smart. Right now they are. We've sounded out every lead we had, Ed. We're doing our best. Either of you ever hear of a man by the name of Val Mishikov? No, I don't think so. Chicago gunman in the old days, wasn't he, Ed? That's right. I thought he was doing time in Joliet. Paroled last year. Got a tip he was spotted on East Broadway night before last. You figure it might tie in with our job? I don't know. Find out. If I remember right, Mishikov's brother used to be pretty friendly with Mary Olkowski. I helped send both of them up 13 years ago. Same rap. Robbery. Was that all you heard, Ed? Somebody spotted Mishikov? That's all. If you can track him down, you might get some kind of a lead. That's more than you got now. That night, and for the next two nights following... Ben and I had dinner downtown instead of going home, and then we spent the rest of the night covering the lower end of the city in search of Al Mishikoff. We got more than a dozen leads on where to find him from some of our informants, but none of the leads paid off. We kept missing him. No one knew where he was staying. No one knew, or no one would tell us. Worst thing about this job, Joe, leg work. He must be averaging 10 miles a night. My feet say 20. Yeah, almost midnight. Here's McCarthy's place. Let's try it. Right. Let's go down at the end of the bar, Ben. Yeah. Hiya, Ben. Good to see you come in. What's new? Oh, not much, Bert. Meet my partner, Joe Friday. Hiya, Friday. What do you fellas have? Looking for a guy, Bert. His name's Al Mishikoff, Chicago. You heard anything? He was in here earlier tonight. A couple of guys with him. Are you sure? What do you look like? Six feet, about 45, I guess. Big build. Sounds like him, all right, Joe. Is he staying in the neighborhood, Bert? He's down here? I don't think so. Most of those big timers stay uptown someplace. You looking for Mr. Club? I'd like to talk to him. How long ago was he in? Oh, about 8 o'clock. A couple of guys with him. They were talking about driving out to the airport. Something about Las Vegas. Uh-huh. There's an 840 plane for Vegas, isn't there, Ben? I think so. 840, 850. I can't recall which. Bert, do you remember the exact time they left? Exactly. No. But say, there's one of the fellas that was with Mishikov down there in the middle of the bar. Which one, Bert? Yes. One with a sandy hair, big chin. See him? Yeah. Want to talk to you? Come on. Pardon me. Pardon me. I'd like to talk to you a minute. Yeah, who are you? Police, Sergeant Friday. Oh, have a drink, Sergeant. No, thanks. I said I wanted to talk to you. Ah, Square John. Huh? Wait a minute, George. Square John wants to talk to me. Come on outside. We can talk better out there. I ain't done nothing. What's the pitch? I got a right to know. Let's go outside. Maybe I don't want to go outside. I think you better. Come on. All right, all right. Quit shoving, you dumb cop shoving people around. What are you trying to do? All right, down this way. 
Car's parked up the next alley, Joe. Hey, look, what's this all about, huh? I got a right to know. You were seen with Al Mishikoff tonight. Where is he? Who? Al Mishikoff. You want us to spell it? I don't think you can spell your own name. Nobody's asking you to play smart. Where's Mishikoff? Out of town. What do you care? Here's the car. All right, inside, you. Now, look, you got me wrong. I ain't done nothing. Where's Mishikoff? You and some other guy drove to the airport with him tonight. Let's have it. I'm clear, I tell you. I just drove out with him, that's all. Where'd Mishikoff go? Vegas. Took the plane for Vegas. When? About 8.30, quarter to nine. What's up, anyway? Who's the guy traveling with Mishikoff? Nobody. Who's the guy traveling with Mishikoff? Koski. I, I just met him tonight. Mario Koski, is that the guy? Yeah, I... I'm leveling. I ain't done nothing. Ben, get to a phone call the office. Contact Las Vegas police. Ask them to pick up Koski and Michikoff. When we got back to the office, we questioned the man we had picked up for almost two hours. His name was John Delmar, an ex-convict. He'd been paroled from Folsom Prison two months before after serving three and a half years for burglary. He said Michikoff was looking for a man to work with him and Koski. He didn't specify the work. Delmar said he refused the offer, but they parted on friendly terms. He said Koski and Mishikoff told him that they were going to Las Vegas for a few days and returned to Los Angeles. But when Ben and I checked back with the Las Vegas police the next morning, they reported that nobody answering the description of either Koski or Mishikoff was seen arriving or leaving the airport. We checked with the airlines and sent inquiries to law enforcement agencies throughout the entire area. No sign. Three weeks went by. Still, no sign. Nothing in the overnights, Joe. No, not a thing. Same here. Reno, Sacramento, San Francisco. Nobody's seen him. We've got to come out sometime. We can wait. Yeah, we can wait. Gets on your nerves. Let's check with Backstrand. Maybe he's got a job for us in the meantime. You're getting as eager as your friend Hank Decker, Joe. Incidentally, how'd things turn out for him? He passed all his exams, putting in his month's training at the academy now. He should do all right. Oh, yeah. Hi, right, Mike. Skipper busy? Not in his office. Won't be until afternoon. What's the matter? Got a lecture at the police academy this morning. Thanks, Mike. Come on, Ben. Ben and I drove out to the police academy near Elysian Park. We went out to check with Ed Backstrand on the Blitz robberies, not to listen to his lecture. When we walked into the classroom, he was just finishing up, so we sat in the back of the room and listened. It was a pretty good speech. Because of the alertness of the arresting officer, his talent for memorizing detail, and his knowledge of how a criminal acts under a given set of circumstances, the arrest was made. Well, that's about it, gentlemen. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> now, uh, when I ran this speech over at home, my wife said it wasn't a very good talk, but at least it came out on time. <laughs> now, it seems I'm two minutes short, so I guess I failed on both counts. <laughs> but if I may, I'd, I'd like to use the few minutes that are left to tell you what I think of being a cop after 24 years. For one reason or other, you men have chosen the career of a police officer. Well, let me tell you right now, without any qualifications, it's a thankless job. Maybe you can't see it now. Maybe you think I'm exaggerating. But when you graduate next week and get that uniform on, your whole lives are going to change. You're uh, going to lose friends, a lot of them. They'll want parking tickets fixed, some other favors. You'll have to turn them down, so you'll be a heel, a fathead. When you're on the beach, you're going to meet the cream of society and the scum, the lowest. Sometimes you won't be able to tell the difference. Some of you will have to work with thugs, stupid gangsters, dope addicts, cheap women, all the human garbage you can find in a big city. You'll come home at night and take a shower to wash off the dirt, but you still won't feel clean. That's a job. When you buy a box of candy and bring it home for your anniversary, the neighbors will tell you chiseled it. When you save up a few dollars and buy a new car or some furniture for the house, well, it's draft. People are going to want favors. They'll offer you things, a free beer or a new dress for your wife. If you take it, you're a chiseler. If you don't, you're a tough cop. Well, here's a piece of advice. Take nothing from anyone, no matter how good a friend he is. Pay for everything you get and don't ask favors. Treat everybody alike, no matter what they look like or what they believe in. You don't play favorites. There are going to be times when a few men in the department get out of line. The newspapers will play it up because it makes good reading and the average John public will love it because that's the only way he can pay you back for that traffic ticket you gave him. Being a good cop is a hard job, but it's a good one. 
Let me warn you just once more. It's one of the most thankless jobs on earth. That's all, gentlemen. <laughs> The following week, Hank Decker graduated from the police academy and hit the transfer list for a regular assignment. He drew a job of teaching combat firing and boxing at the academy. He didn't like it, so he put in a request for a transfer and waited. For the next six weeks, Ben and I waited, too, for some sign of the Blitz bandits. There wasn't any. The only possible suspects, Mario Kosky and Al Mishikoff, had disappeared completely. We kept a close check on every possible avenue of information. Still, no sign. Ben and I were transferred to the night watch on robbery for a few weeks, and that gave Hank Decker a chance to drop in and visit with us a couple of hours when he went off duty at the academy. He was still as eager as ever. Hi, Ben. Joe, anything new? Hi, Hank. Nothing here. What about the academy? Oh, big news. Mm. What's up? Getting a transfer starting next Monday. Gonna start on a beat. Thought you were all tied up with that boys' club you started out there. Oh, I was, but Hanson's gonna take over when I leave. Oh, the kids sure love it. Free swimming in the pool, boxing lessons. We teach them everything. Where's your beat gonna be, huh? Central, right in the downtown district. Might learn something, huh? You'll learn a lot. You want to forget most of it. Look, it's a quarter after seven. Don't you ever go home for dinner, Hank? Oh, getting the wife used to it. This new shift's gonna be night work, you know. You wait till you're on it for a year, and then you tell us how you like it. A year? I want to be in the detective bureau after a year. Well, you're not even going to last a year if you don't get home to dinner. Your wife's called twice this week already. She calls me. Okay, when did she call tonight? She hasn't, Jen. Oh, I guess I better head her off. Let me know if anything breaks, huh, Joe? I'd like to tag along. Okay, Hank. Well, on your way. Okay, good night. So long. Good night. Yeah. How eager can you get? Were we like that when we started? Not me. I never had that much energy at one time in my whole life. Hot shot, Joe. I'll get it. At 767 East Broadway... A liquor store to 11 and sluggy at 767 East Broadway. A liquor store to 11 and 767 East Broadway to 11 liquor store. Let's go. Seven six seven East Broadway, King's Liquor Store. We pushed our way through the small crowd outside the door and into the shop. Two patrolmen in uniform were already interviewing the proprietor. He had two large gashes on his head just above the right temple. He was trembling and badly shaken, but he managed to give us a good description of the holdup men. Yeah, I can tell you what they look like. Three of them. One short, one tall, husky, another short, fat. You remember what they were wearing? Uh, coats. All three, dark coats. Uh, one of the short men, he had a big scar here on the throat like, like this. After the three men robbed the store, they slugged me and tied me up. Turner, this man's hurt. You call an ambulance? On the way, Sergeant. That's fine. We have just one more question, Mr. King. Here's a handful of pictures. We'd like you to tell us if any one of these men were in the gang that held you up tonight. Let me look. There you are. Take your time. No. No, not him. No. 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 Oh, this one. Here. Here. He, he took the money from the register. Would you look through the rest, please? Are there any more? Uh, let me see again. No. No. Oh, here. Another one. Uh, the fat one with the scar. This is him. I think he's the one that slugged me. Thanks, Mr. King. Here's our card. We'll be contacting you later. Turner, will you and your partner take the crime report? We've got some checking to do. Right, Sergeant. Thanks. Come on, Ben. Yeah. Kosky and Mishikov. You picked out both of them, Joe. Yeah. yeah. It certainly did, didn't it? Attention, all units. Attention, all units. Wait a minute. The southeast corner of Broadway and East Third, a liquor store and restaurant, 211, Post 3. All units. The southeast corner of Come Broadway and East Third. Come on, Ben, let's roll. When we got to the liquor store and restaurant at Broadway and East Third, Ben and I knew for certain that Kosky and Mishikoff were back in the city and working hard. Their M.O. matched down to almost the smallest detail. We put a call through to communications, and the entire Central Division was alerted. Then we called Chief Backstrand and told him the news. He assigned a special detail from the Metropolitan Unit to patrol the area until further notice. But at 9.23 p.m., before they pulled out of the police garage, the Blitz Bandits added two more liquor stores and one more restaurant to their list of victims. Early the next morning, Ben and I met with Chief Backstrand in his office. You got a make on that third man yet? We ran his description through R&I early this morning, Ed. 
Closest candidate's a guy by the name of Julian Brock. He's done time here in New York. Any tie-up with Kosky or Mishikov? Mama Sheet says he knows Kosky pretty well. And that's good enough. Now, how do you think you're going to get these thieves? We've got the alert out, Chief. Special detail from Metropolitan Division's been briefed. Communication's all set. All right, here's a tip for you. Tell the men if there's a hold-up call that only the car in the area of the hold-up will handle it. These thieves are no amateurs. Let me try some decoy trick. Tell the men to stay in the area they're assigned to until they receive a call. Check? We'll take care of it, Ed. You are going to be on hand tonight? And when do you figure on starting? We'll have the full detail out by 6.30. Play it safe and start at 4. Why chance missing him? At 3.30 that afternoon, we left the police garage with a special detail from Metropolitan Division, and we started to cruise the central area. We weren't looking for any action the first few hours, and we didn't get any. The 5 o'clock traffic in the downtown area was heavy as usual. Hope that gang holds off till after 6. We couldn't get out of this traffic if our lives depended on it. Well, we'd probably do better on foot if it wasn't for radio contact. Control 4 to 80K. Control 4 to 80K, your location. Get it, will you, Joe? Yeah, wait till I get the mic. 80K to Control 4. 80K to Control 4. Our location on Spring Street between 2nd and 3rd. 80K, stand by. 80K, call your office, code 2. Call your office, code 2, KMA 367. 80K to control 4, Roger, KMA 367. Yeah, now what do I do for a parking space? You know, you're lucky. That guy up ahead there, he's pulling out. Good, that hasn't happened to me in six months. Okay, hold on, Ben. I'll be back in a minute. Yeah. Two five one one. Two five one one. Robbery, Chandler. This is Friday, Bill. You want us? Yeah, I just met a Joe. Chief wants to talk to you. Hello, Friday. Yeah, Ed. Cruiser car just brought in a guy answering the description of Mario Kosky. Yeah. Get over here right away and question the guy. If it is Kosky, we can all go home early. Ben and I went back to the office and questioned the man who gave his name as Conrad Larkin. He was Kosky's approximate height and weight, same color hair, same color eyes. The resemblance to Kosky's picture was evident. We questioned him thoroughly about the Blitz robberies, and then we checked out his fingerprints. The coincidence was hard to overlook, but we were satisfied. The man was not Mario Kosky. There was a phone message on my desk to call Hank's wife. I called her, and then we checked with Chief Backstrand again and started for the police garage. It was 10 minutes past 6. Hey, Ben, Joe, wait a minute, will you? Oh, hi, Hank. What's all the excitement? I heard about those jobs last night, the Blitz gang. How about tagging along tonight? What's the stare? Hey, suit yourself, Hank. When are you due home for dinner? I told the wife I'd eat out tonight. You sure you're not due home for dinner? No, not tonight, Joe. Uh, did you have any luck yet? Not so far, Hank. Maybe later on tonight. Come on, here's the garage. How close did you come to the gang last night? Not close enough. Two steps ahead of us, all the way. They sure must work fast. Five jobs in a row. All right, Hank, let's don't rub it in, huh? Hey, Ben, watch it, will you? Yeah. Woman driver. How about it, Joe? You think I can make you out of it? Talk to Ed Backstrand. He might get you a transfer after a while. Yeah, I might try it. Joe, look across the street. There's a guy coming out of the bar. Where? In front of the bar. He's standing there. Guy in the dark oh. coat, you see? Yeah. Two other guys behind him. Who is it? I can't be sure. Ben, you better pull up. That's looks just like his picture. All right. Come on. All right, hold it, mister. We want to talk to you. Run for it, Al. Come here. Watch it, Joe. Hank, get out. Get down. Two of them down, Ben. Other than one up alley. Let's go. Did they get Hank? Yeah. All right, hold it right here. All right, Kosky. Throw out your gun and come out with your hands up. All right, let's return the fire. Come on. Hey, he had his chance. Yeah, grab his gun. Let's get back to Hank. Hmm? Did you get the guns from the other two? Yeah, they're dead. Hank got them both. All right, one side, please. Officer, did you call an ambulance? Yeah, they're on the 
her way. Get Come on, Ben. There. One side, please. Will you let us through? Thanks. How you doing? That's a good job. Ben, will you get the crowd black? Give him some air. Would you just move back? Joe, all right, easy, Hank. They'll be here in a minute. Hank? Hank. How's it going, Joe? Gone? Yeah, come on. What have you got, Joe? Phone message from Hank's wife. For you? Yeah. You returned the call? Before we left the office. Who was it? She wanted me to remind Hank. He was due home for dinner at 7 o'clock. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. You have just heard the twelfth in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Patrolman James Frank Goggin of the Cleveland Police Department, who on the morning of January 13, 1939, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, you'll want to listen to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell, heard Saturday on most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to auto theft detail. In three months, more than 250 cars have been broken into. Property mounting well into thousands of dollars has been stolen. Two youthful members of the gang have been apprehended. The all-important brains of the criminal ring, the leaders, are still at large. Your job, get them. <laughs> Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, March 2nd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night shift out of auto theft. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the interrogation room, and it was 10.58 p.m. when I got to room 26, chief of detectives office. Real tough kids, aren't they? Yeah, they won't admit a thing. Now, sit down. Thanks. When did you pick him up? About 8.30 tonight in the parking lot behind the Star Theater out on Sunset. He was lifting the radio out of a 48 convertible. He's had lots of experience. The report says you picked up a 19-year-old girl with him. She was waiting for the guy in a parked car across the street from the theater. The car was full of loot. Uh, the first real break we've had on those auto burglaries in three months, and it's no good to us. Well, neither one of them will talk. They won't even admit they know each other. You run makes on them? Just did. We've been questioning the boy for an hour, getting nowhere. Uh, what's his name again? Freeman. Stanley Freeman. Oh, yeah. Age 20. Address, Butte, Montana, down here for a vacation. Uh, he doesn't lie very well, Ed. He's never been to Butte, Montana in his life. Knows less about the town than I do. Well, get to him. Right, Ed. Where'd you put the girl? 
We had a policewoman take her to our office. We can talk to her when we finish with the boy. Well, what's her story? Hasn't any. She won't even open her mouth. Nineteen years old, probably needs a good spanking. Now get him to talk. Right. Did you run a make, Joe? Yeah, he's clean. Get wise, huh, Flatfoot? Look, you're in a bad spot, son. That kind of talk isn't going to help. Says you. We caught you red-handed trying to steal a radio that didn't belong to you from a car it didn't belong to you. Is that right? That's enough to send you to San Quentin, boy. You better give us the story. Shut up. We've got all the evidence we need for him. Maybe you don't realize how serious this is. We've had more than 250 car burglaries in this city in the past three months. Over $200,000 worth of the property has been stolen. That's a lot of money. So what? So you're the number one suspect, young fellow. Your method of operation in breaking into that car tonight is the same used in most of the other burglaries. That means you're not going to be tried just for this job tonight. What are you getting at, Flatfoot? Listen, son. In the state of California, breaking into a locked car is a felony. You can go to state penitentiary for that. And we're going to file a complaint of burglary with the district attorney in the morning. You say you're from Butte, Montana. All right, I don't believe you. But we'll make sure. Ben, go down to our office and call the news photographers. Stanley here is going to have his picture on the front page of every newspaper in Los Angeles tomorrow. Right, Joe. No. You can't. I won't let you. I got my rights. What's the matter, youngster? Everybody wants his picture in the paper. Yeah, well, I don't. I won't let him. We got your picture already, Freeman, remember? They took it when they fingerprinted you. You can't use it. You can't. I'll get a lawyer. Reporters will be over in a couple of minutes. We have to give them your story and your picture, too. Or this one. You won't. You won't. Give it all to right, me. All right, all right. Give it to all me. All right, Freeman, get your hands off him. Now sit down. All right. Now let's have it straight. Oh, don't let him use the picture. Don't let him. You can't. You can't. We got to have the truth, son. <laughs> now look, you're 20 years old. You know right from wrong. You'll have to take your medicine. If you cooperate, we'll do all we can to help. I... I live out in the Wilshire District. All I wanted was a little extra money. We didn't take much. We didn't think it was so wrong. It was stealing, Freeman. You know that's wrong. Where do you live out there? Piper Avenue. 821 Piper. You won't give him my picture. You live there with your family? Yeah, my mother. Father's dead. Uh, promise me you won't give him the picture. My mother, she'd see it. Oh, uh, promise me. You're working with a gang on those auto burglaries. We know that. Now, who are they? Where are they? And what's the setup? I can't. They get me for it. Who'd get you? I can't tell you. I can't. Who's your girlfriend, Stanley? The one you were with tonight? Joanne. Joanne Miller. Where does she live? Piper Avenue, same as me. Lives on the same block, 866. Is that her home? She live there with her folks? Yeah. Mother and father. They work. And you got her into this. Isn't that the story she gave us, Ben? I did not. I didn't. It was her. She said a bunch of kids were doing it. It was quick money, something to do at night. She started it. All right, Romero. I'll go see the girl. You stay here with Freeman. All right, Joe. Just stay put in that chair, Freeman. Hello, Joe. You and Romero handling this case? Yeah. I'd like to talk to the girl a few minutes, Marge. Would you stand by? Right. I'll sit over here. Thanks. All right, miss. What's your name, age, and address? I told this lady cop 15 minutes ago I'm not saying anything. All right, then we'll tell you. Your name's Joanne Miller. You live at 866 Piper Avenue. You live with your father and mother. Both of them work. You're a liar. That's not me. You're 19 years old. You live on the same block as your boyfriend, Stanley Freeman, and you're the one who got him mixed up in this gang. Isn't that right? No, it's not right. It's not. I didn't do anything. Well, that's only half the story. Freeman told us everything. You want to hear the rest? No. Stan wouldn't tell you. He wouldn't. He told us how you got him mixed up in it. Quick money. That's what you told him, didn't you? No, it was him. I can prove it. The rest of the kids will tell you. He got me in this. Ask them, they'll tell you. It was Stanley and Fred Milford and George Jansen. They started it, all three of them. All right. Will you tell the story to a police stenographer? I'll tell him everything. He's not blaming this on me. Marge, will you go get the stenographer? Right. 
Now, how many persons in this gang of yours? Oh, about 10 or 12. And it's not my gang either. He got me into this, and now he's trying to lie his way out, blaming me. How long have you been doing this, burglarizing cars? Me? Oh, only about two weeks. It was supposed to be fun, something to do at night. The rest of them have been at it a couple of months. Who's the head of the gang? I told you, it's him, Stanley, and Fred Milford and Jansen, all three. I only started going out with him two weeks ago, maybe less. All right, Joanne. Tell it to the stenographer the same way. The stenographer will be here in a minute, Joe. Okay, Marge, thanks. Stay with her. Right, Joe. Just about a closed case, Ben. The girl gave us a full confession. She didn't. Oh, you're not tricking me again. She didn't. She told us you're one of the leaders of the gang, Stanley. Said you got her into all this. The other two are George Jansen and Fred Milford. About a dozen kids in the gang, all of them about your age. Isn't that right? She's lying, can't you tell? She's lying. She got me into the gang. Well, she did. She's Milford's girlfriend. Ask her. Oh, she can't lie out of that one. She got me into it. I can prove it. Who was the real leader of the gang? Milford. He, he started it. He organized the whole thing. He collects the stuff we get, and he delivers it. Jansen helps him do it. What do you mean, he delivers the stuff? Where does he deliver it? Oh, somewhere in Dogtown, I think. Down around South Main, near the railroad yards. Who's it delivered to? Oh, I don't know exactly. I heard Jansen mention the name once. Myra, he said, it's, it's supposed to be a big secret. Myra, that, that's all I remember. Where does Jansen and Milford live? Oh, Jansen rooms down on East Flower. 1042, I think. It's, it's a rooming house. And Milford lives two blocks over from me on Quincy. 234 Quincy. He lives with his grandmother. Got that, Ben? Right. All right, let's pick up Milford and Jansen. It was ten minutes past one when Ben and I returned to headquarters with George Jansen and Fred Milford in our custody. In Jansen's room at 1042 East Flower Street, we found two fur coats, a box full of new car accessories, an S&W 38 revolver, and a 45 automatic. When we picked up Fred Milford at his home, we discovered five deluxe car radios hidden in the garage, plus a valuable assortment of cameras, cigarette lighters, and clothing. Both Jansen and Milford refused to talk. But when we got them to headquarters and showed them the signed statements of Stanley Freeman and the girl, Joanne Miller, they broke. Milford, um, where else did you and your gang operate besides the Wilshire district? No place, only out there, that's all. Same type of car burglars have been committed all over the city. You're telling us your gang didn't have a hand in them? It's the truth. Our territory was Wilshire District. We didn't go outside. You mean some other gang's responsible? I don't know. All I know is we didn't have any part of them. Is there another gang, Milford? Maybe. I don't know. You find out. It's none of my business. It is your business, Milford. You admit you and your gang committed 55 jobs in the past three and a half months. That leaves about 200 jobs to be accounted for. That's right. You figure it out. We have figured it out. I think you and your gang of young thieves pulled every one of those 250 jobs. There isn't any other gang. That's the story the district attorney's going to get. You're crazy. There is. I know there is. Then give us the information and save yourself a lot of trouble. Well, we're not the only ones. That's all I know. Milford, do you know how many years you get for auto burglary? I told you, we're not the only ones. There must be a couple of others besides us. Vince Mahoney, he's got a gang. Where does Mahoney operate? West Hollywood and Beverly. Where does he live? I don't know. Honest, I, I only met him a couple of times. Where'd you meet him? I don't remember. Where'd you meet him, Milford? Delivery. I met him down at the delivery place a couple of nights. When you delivered the property you stole from cars, is that right? Yeah. Where was that? Down by the railroad yard. Where? Chavez Street. It's a little alley off East Main. Who'd you deliver the stuff to? I told you, our name's Myra. That's all I know. We meet her and some guy on Tuesday nights. We give them the stuff and they pay us off. Mahoney delivers the same night I do. Do you meet her every Tuesday night? Yeah. You're going to meet her this Tuesday, tomorrow night? I don't know. I guess so. Same place? Yeah. Are you the only one she deals with? Sometimes Joanne. near are Joanne. I know what you're thinking. You want to use me to trap Myra. Well, what's it worth? You know better than that. How about it, Milford? Oh, what else can I do? Give me another cigarette. <laughs> By 3.30 that morning, the signed statements and confessions were piling up fast. Milford gave us a list of the names and addresses of each member in his gang, and within an hour, they were all under questioning at headquarters. Most of the suspects, about one-third of them girls, 
ranged in age from 18 to 21. As they told their individual stories, the scope of the case grew until it covered most of the city. By late afternoon of the next day, Tuesday, March 3rd, three more gangs operating in Venice, Bel Air, and North Hollywood have been apprehended. They confessed to more than 175 burglaries from locked cars during the past three and a half months. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I met with Chief Backstrand in his office. How many admissions you have now? Over 50, Ed. Here are the gang leader's statements. Mm-hmm. What's their story? Well, it's pretty much the same. They all say this woman, Myra, set up the operation. You mean she got the kids and put them to work burglarizing cars? Well, not exactly. She picked the leaders, contacted them in bars or on the street, asked them if they wanted to pick up some spare money getting auto parts for it. Then she didn't tell them to go out and burglarize cars. Well, not in so many words, Ed, no. After they brought in auto parts for a couple of weeks, she told them to bring her everything they could find, outside the car or inside. Those are the words she used. Five of the kids dictated those words into their signed confession. Oh, that should hold in court. What else did you get on this woman? Oh, she taught them how to work, told them to wear gloves, all angles. Uh, well, we got most of the small fry. Now, where do we find this Myra woman? Any description on her? Yeah. Kids say she's about 33, 34. Good-looking redhead. Five feet five, about 120. Well red. No description on the guy she runs with. You run a make on her yet? Yeah, no previous record. We set up a stakeout for her tonight. Two of the gang leaders have volunteered to go along, this Milford and Vince Mahoney. Uh, good. Down on uh, Chavez, where she usually meets them? Yeah, that's right. When? 11.15. That's the regular time for the meet, according to the kid. All right, I'll be at home. Call me. I don't want to miss out on this one. When Ben and I left Ed Backstrand's office, we went home for dinner and a few hours sleep. At 9.30 p.m., we were back at the office. We met the men in the special detail, which Backstrand had assigned for the stakeout that night. We briefed them on their duties, and then we got Fred Milford and Vince Mahoney out of their cells. To avoid any possible suspicion of the presence of a trap, we had Milford's permission to use his car in the stakeout. The car, which he had said he had driven to the delivery meetings with the woman, Myra, at least a dozen times before. We arrived at the stakeout area, Chavez Alley in East Main, at 9.58. The meeting was scheduled for 11.15. The moon was out, but the sky was overcast, and there was a cold wind blowing from the east. Hey, what time you got, Sergeant? Mm, About 10. Why, Milford? Getting nervous? No, just wondering. How you cops gonna rig this thing? In just a couple of minutes, we're going to plant you two in Milford's car parked up there in the alley. Now, you stay there until Myra shows up. We'll do the rest. Yeah, I know, but what'll we say? Suppose she asks for some stuff. We ain't got any. You won't need any. You won't have much time for talking. Well, suppose she wises up. Maybe she'll pull a gun. Maybe. Does she carry one? No. Never saw her with one. Don't worry, Milford. We'll make sure you're not in danger. She's got an awful temper, that redhead. Got mad at me once when I squawked at the prices she was paying us for radios. What was she paying you, Mahoney? Ah, an eight-tube radio, good shape, seven bucks. <laughs> she got all the gravy and you got all the grief. You're not kidding. Joe, hmm? are you? Yeah, Steve, what do you got? Well, the men are all staked out, Joe. I got the area covered from every angle. All right. You got an extra man to stay in Milford's car? I'll handle that myself. Fine, thanks. Okay. All set, Joe? Yeah. Now, Milford and Mahoney, we're going to put you two in your car now. There's going to be an officer with you, so there's no need to be nervous or afraid. You just sit in the car and act natural. When this Myra drives up, don't leave the car. Have her come to you. You got it? Sure. Okay. All right, Joe, let's go. Sure is cold out. I don't even have a heater in my car. You stole enough of them. Okay, Steve, here they are. All right, boys. Milford, get in first behind the wheel. Okay. Honey in the middle. Now I'll sit in the back. We'll be parked in that garage across the street, Steve. Got a perfect view of the alley. Okay, Ben. Check with you later. All right. Mean night, Joe. Yeah. Come on. It's cold here in the garage, isn't it? Yeah. It might be a long wait. What time you got? Six minutes past ten. Thank you. Hey, Joe. What is it? Uh, it's nothing. 
thought that passing car was turning in the alley. Relax. It's early. Lonely place. Dark. Gets on your nerves. That's it, Ben. Half past 11. Nothing yet. Somebody might have tipped her off. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Well, let's wait it out anyway. Joe, that blue coupe yeah. there just turned in the alley. Let's go. Come on, run, Ben. Bye. All right, off with you, fella. Quick, you're fighting. Who'd you get, Steve? Uh, here he is. Just drove up in the coupe. Got out and called Milford Mahoney by the first names. He's in on it. What about the girl? No sign. The kid was the only one in the car. All right. Tell them in the stakeout's offered and I'd have them report back in. We'll take the kid with us. Okay. All right, young fellow, this way. What do you cops think you're doing? I ain't done nothing. Look, sport, we heard that from 54 different kids yesterday. We're tired of that line. Come on. When we got back to the office, we took the boy to the interrogation room and questioned him. He gave his name as Matthew Leiter, age 21. He wouldn't break until Vince Mahoney definitely identified him as a member of his car burglary gang and a special favorite of the red-headed woman they called Myra. Then Leiter copped out and told Ben and I that he had talked with Myra as late as 10 o'clock tonight. He told us that she had heard that the police had picked up some of the gang members and she asked Leiter to drive down to the Chavez Alley meeting place. He was supposed to tell Milford and Mahoney that the weekly delivery date was off until further notice. We questioned Matthew Leiter for an hour and a half. Uh, you told us a little while ago that you talked with this woman, Myra, late tonight. Yeah. Where'd you talk to her? At her home? At her home? Don't be stupid. Nobody knows where she lives. I met her at a bar. Which bar? Julia's. Out of Santa Monica. How did she contact you? Called me at home. She's not such a bad dame. She treats you right. Sure, that's why you're in jail. Did you ever call her on the phone? I don't know her number. None of the kids do. She's smart. She taught me all I know about the racket. You'll have a rough time getting her. Maybe, but we'll get her. Ben and I left the office at 2 a.m. and went home to bed. We reported in at 8 that morning to Ed Backstrand. The three of us went down the street to Koken's restaurant for a cup of coffee. Nobody was in a good mood. We had most or all the small fry in the citywide burglary ring, but it seemed we were still a long way from cracking the inner circle. The latter kid said that none of them knows where she lives, what her phone number is, nothing. Pass the sugar in. Mm. I think we still have a few angles to study on that score. Right now, I've got some more bad news for you. What's that? You been through your mail this morning? No, not yet. We haven't had a chance. I saw the overnight reports. There were 32 car burglaries last night. 32. All the way from Wilmington to North Hollywood. How you figure it? I can't. This girl, Myra, must have an army of kids working for her. How much did they get, Ed? Any idea? A uh, rough estimate, about $3,000. Usual stuff people are foolish enough to leave in their cars. Watches, cameras, furs, expensive clothes. Ammo is the same. And uh, like the others. If the car happens to have a rigid handle lock, they slip a piece of pipe over the handle for a lever and break it. If that doesn't work, they pry open the wing window. Some of the windows were smashed out. Sounds like you're in an awful hurry, Joe. Yeah, maybe this Myra wants a few big nights before she peddles the stuff and gets out. And if we're going to get her, we can't waste time. Any suspects picked up last night, Skipper? None. Well, where did they hit most of the car? Outside the Pan Pacific. The parking lot. Hockey game going on. Must have been 4,000 cars for them to pick over. They picked the best. As usual. Well, you better get on it. There's one way to handle it. What's that? She works fast. You work a little faster. We got back to the office and we went over the reports one by one. Then we called the young gang members to the interrogation room and questioned them separately and re-questioned them. We got nowhere. Many of them had met Myra on the street, in the bar, but not one of them had any idea where she lived. At least that's what they told us. Ben had a hunch that Matthew Leiter knew more than he was telling. We had him brought to the interrogation room and all that afternoon until 10 o'clock that night with interruptions for his meal periods, we talked with Leiter. He would admit nothing more than what he'd already told us. Yeah, it's got me beat, Joe. Yeah. Now, let's check with Ed. Good morning, Joe. Ben? Hi, Mike. Skipper in? Just went down the hall for a minute. Be right back. Hold it a minute, will you? Yeah. Chief of Detectives always handing. Yeah. Well, you, Joe. 
Oh, thanks. Hello? Yeah. He does? We'll be right over. Oh, we're Sergeant Hopkins over at the jail. Oh, yeah? Matthew Leiter's got something to tell us. Says it's important. <laughs> Have a chair here, Ladder. Yeah, thanks. All right, you wanted to see us. I'm getting even with that Dame Myra. I'm squaring with you. Yeah? She told me if I was picked up, she'd have me out in a couple of hours. She promised me a lawyer if anything happened. Said she'd get me bail. All right, where can we find her? I don't know if she's there now, but you can find out at Francisco Motors. Big used car lot. Garage, too. It's out on Melrose past La Cienica. What's the time? That's where she fenced most of the stuff we stole. Some old guy she buddies with runs the place. Big shop in the back. Store a lot of hot stuff there. Barney. Uh, yes, I... We're through with him. Take him back. We checked with Chief Backstrand, and then we drove out to the Francisco Motor Company. We located it on the corner of Melrose and Geneva Avenue. It was a big layout. It consisted of a large used car lot sign bannering the slogan, Deluxe Auto Accessories lowest prices in town. Along the back end of the lot, there was a large L-shaped garage. We found the man in charge, and he gave his name as Paul Hackett, the owner of the car lot. In the garage, we found the entrance to a large back storeroom. It was loaded with thousands of dollars worth of auto radios, spotlights, cratefuls of assorted car accessories. Special closets built into the walls of the garage contain racks of fur coats, suits, dresses. Below that, Smaller boxes containing watches and cameras, all wrapped in tissue paper. You can save all of us a lot of time and trouble by talking to us now, Mr. Hackett. Where is Myra? I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Can you explain what we just found in your garage? I didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was stolen. Well, which is it, Mr. Hackett? Make up your mind. I bought it. But I didn't know it was stolen. You can't prove I did know. I think we can prove it, Mr. Hackett. Some of those stolen car radios stored back there, the serial numbers are filed off, and this workbench here is full of filings. I... I didn't know. You'll have to do better than that. How does Myra figure in? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. It's all right with us, Hackett. We found the stuff, and we got you. If we don't find Myra, you'll be doing time for two people. Stand still. <laughs> you can't. You can't do this to me. I don't know anything about it. Come on, Hackett. We're taking you in. All right, get in the car. Come on, in the car. Am I going to jail? You're going to jail. All right. I'll take you to Myra. Packett told us that Myra lived at 1345 Munich Drive in Beverly Hills. He said that he was Myra's husband. He told us that he'd been in a legitimate garage business for 10 years before he married Myra. She talked him into the ragged. He identified 1345 Munich Drive as their home. When we got there, we found stores of stolen property similar to those found in the garage. Myra was not there. Hackett had no idea where she might be. We sat down in the living room and waited. One hour, two hours, three hours. After five hours of waiting, the monotony started to wear on everybody's nerves, especially Hackett's. And the whole thing, it was her idea. I should have known, all hers. She did this to me. I won't take it alone. Where is she? You tell us, Hackett. I told you, I don't know. She couldn't have gone. She didn't know. I'm not going to take right, this quiet alone. Quiet down, quiet down. That you, Paul? Thought I heard you talking to some. Who's he? The police, Myra. The police. Your smart kids told them the whole story. What are you talking about, my smart kids? What are these cops All doing right, here in the living room? Oh, get your dirty hands off me. Get away. These kids are right, Joe. She got a damn Yeah. Who do you think you're... There, that ought to hold you for a while. All right, come on, you two. Let's go. All right, copper. You win. Stupid husbands. How many times did I tell you? Don't trust those kids. Don't store their stuff in the garage. Don't open it for anybody. Get a lawyer. No, you knew better. Dumb jerk. The idea of having those cops camping in the living room waiting for me. Why didn't you warn me? I'm going to divorce you. That's what I'm going to do. I'll stick you for plenty. Jerk. All right, inside, you two. You got a smoke, Ben? Hmm. Yeah. Right here. Thanks. A 
were just thinking. More. Those kids were right. She's a pretty nice looking woman. Yeah. Nice face. Beautiful figure. Mm hmm. Sure talks a lot, though, doesn't she? Yeah. Hey, Joe, remind me to take home some flowers to my wife tonight, will you? <laughs> The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Paul and Myra Hackett were tried and convicted on seven separate counts of receiving stolen property. They are now serving out their sentences in the state penitentiary. Realizing that most of the young persons involved in the case were influenced by the strong personality of Paul and Myra Hackett, a separate investigation was made into the backgrounds and home life of the young offenders. In most cases, they were found to be basically good, and they were placed on probation and returned to their homes. You have just heard the 13th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Detective Harry William Vosper of the Seattle, Washington Police Department, who on the night of July 21st, 1949, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. And now, an important announcement. Starting this Saturday, September 3rd, Dragnet will be heard at a new time over your NBC station. Consult your local newspaper for the new listening time. And now, speaking in behalf of the producers and the entire cast of Dragnet, we would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your many kind letters of encouragement and approval. Remember, next Saturday for Dragnet, this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. usually heard at this time, has moved to a new time period on Sunday night. Be sure to hear Larry Douglas and Kay Arman on the new Pet Milk Show, tomorrow night on NBC. And now, here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed. To protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to a homicide detail. A man's wife has suddenly dropped from sight. On the surface, it appears only as a routine missing persons case. You start to investigate. Suspicion grows. There is evidence of possible foul play. Your job, find the woman or find her murderer. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, September 15th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of homicide. My partner is Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from lunch, and it was 12.56 when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Waiting for you. Hi, Ben. Al. Hi. I hear you got something for us. Uh, here's a report right here. A gardener by the name of Eric Kelby called in the day before yesterday. Said his wife disappeared from their home out in the valley Sunday night. Says he thinks she left him. That happens every day, Bargetti. No, not this way, it doesn't. Uh, Walsh and I went out yesterday to interview the guy. Story doesn't add. Why not? Uh, none of her clothes are missing. None of her luggage. She even left her pocketbook behind, full of money. Found out from the neighbors a missing woman is a 17-year-old boy by a former marriage. So what? An only child. Mother dotes on the kid. Shouldn't even say goodbye to him. How did this Eric Kelby impress you? Pretty grouchy with Walsh and me. No cooperation. 
Wants to find his wife, doesn't he? I don't know if he does or not. No help, I'll tell you that. Can I see that report a minute now? Here you are. Magnus Trumbull Kelby, age 39. Kelby's her second husband. The first one died a little after the boy was born. Mm-hmm. Disappeared Sunday night from her home, 546 Blasco Road, between 7 and 8 o'clock. When did Kelby call in? Monday afternoon. Said he thought his wife might be spending the night with her sister. When he found out she wasn't, he called us. You meet the boy while you were out there, Borgay? Yeah, that's another thing. Kid came riding in on a bike while we were talking to one of the neighbors. Trying to talk to him, but the old man came out hustling him inside the house. Then he starts eating us out. Hmm, what'd he say? Told us it was our job to find his wife, not to go prying into his stepson's affairs. Well, that's a new slam. How about her friends and relatives around here, Al? Any besides his, her sister? Mm, Walsh located a couple of her aunts. I think he's checking at them. I'll tell you, boys, this is one I'll bet on. Maybe. You got the names of Mrs. Kelby's relatives? Oh, yeah. They're right over here. Sure wish you had a chance to talk to that boy. Yeah. How's it feel to you, Ben? Mm, I don't know. Notice anything else funny about the guy, Al? Well, I don't know. Now, here's those names, Joe. Thanks. Kelby was upset, all right. For some reason, he didn't strike me as reacting the way a normal guy reacts when his wife disappeared. All right, Al. How would you react? Mm -hmm. Bargett is worrying again. Oh, now, listen, boys. It's no fooling matter. This is one I'll bet on. It's a homicide. All right. How about a copy of this report? Yeah, uh, where will I get the phone? Missing persons, Bargetti. Who's that? Oh. Uh, yes. Yes. About what? Oh, sure. All right, sir. Four o'clock. Yeah. Goodbye. That was Kelby's stepson. What do you want? Think something's happened to his mother. <laughs> In police work, missing persons detail is not a department separate in itself. It is organized as a part of the Homicide Bureau. According to Bargetti, who took the call, the boy said he suspected his stepfather, and he didn't want him to know of any meeting between him and police officers. He would meet the officers that afternoon at 4 p.m. in a restaurant on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Fairfax Avenue. At 3.15, Ben and I left the office and we drove out to the meeting place, the Dairyland Fountain and Coffee Shop. We arrived there at 3.45. At eight minutes to five, the Kelby boy still had not arrived. Youngster's not very prompt. Well, let's wait a little while longer. Yeah. Smoke? Yeah, thanks. Want some more coffee? No, thanks. I guess the boy isn't going to show. Think something's happened? Fifteen minutes after we left the coffee shop, we drove up in front of the gate of the Kelby Nursery on Velasco Road. The house itself was set well back on the property, which covered about four acres. The entire nursery was surrounded by a six-foot steel wire fence. It looked like almost every available foot of ground inside was planted with some kind of a flower or shrub. Kelby met us at the gate. Yes? What do you men want? Police officers. Are you Mr. Kelby? Yes. What do you want? Well, if you'll shut those dogs up for a minute, we'd like to ask you a few questions. I'm busy now. Can't you come back tomorrow? Pretty important, Mr. Kelby. I think we better talk right now. All right, if you have to. Fred, Giant, down. You too, honey. Quiet. All right. Now, what do you want? Mind if we come inside? These watchdogs of mine are pretty vicious. We can talk here at the gate. All right, Mr. Kelby. This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. We've been assigned to look into your wife's disappearance. Oh. Did you find anything yet? Nothing definite. Maybe you can help us. Would you tell us exactly what happened the night your wife disappeared? What do you mean, what happened? Well, when did you last see her? When did you first notice she was gone? We finished up Sunday night dinner about 7 o'clock, and I laid down for a nap. Agnes went out on the front porch for some air. Woke up a little before 8 and went outside to look for her. She was gone. Nobody saw her leave, Mr. Kelby? Not that I know of. Maybe some of our nosy neighbors, I don't know. How about your stepson? Wasn't he around Sunday night? Bruce? No, went out to a show. Some other kid. When did he get back from the show? About 10, I think. Why? Where's your stepson now? Who are you looking for, my wife or my stepson? Both, Mr. Kelby. Where's your stepson? Gone. I took him over to my sister's in Alhambra. Been feeling bad since his mother disappeared. Figured the change would do him good. When did you take him over to your sister's, Kelby? This afternoon. What's that got to do with it? We'd like to talk to Bruce. No, no, I can't allow it. The boy's too upset. 
I can't allow it. I'm afraid you're going to have to allow it. Listen, mister, you can get off this property right now. No cops giving me sass. Nobody's giving you sass, Kelby. We want to talk to your stepson, that's all. He might give us a clue as to the whereabouts of your wife. And I say you can't see the boy. It's more you cops couldn't find thorns in a rose patch. I'll get somebody else to look for Agnes. It's my business anyway. Nobody else's. It's our business, too, if anything's happened to her. What are you talking about? You better get your coat, Mr. Kelby. We're taking in for questions. <laughs> You come through that gate, and I'm going to let these dogs go accidentally. I'd hate to shoot the dog. Now go on in the house and get your coat. Harry Kelby turned and made his way up the path and into the house. Five minutes later, he came out. Without a word to either of us, he came down the path, closed the gate behind him, and got into our car. On the way back to headquarters, he chatted pleasantly about the weather, the nursery business, and his dog. When we pulled up in front of the city hall, we met the reason for his sudden change in temperament. His lawyer was waiting for us at the door. We took Kelby to one of the interrogation rooms. His lawyer tagged along. We tried to question him, but the lawyer objected to two out of every three questions we asked. It was hopeless, and he knew it. So did the lawyer. We released Kelby, but we did get the name and address of his sister where the stepson Bruce was staying. After they left, Ben and I got back in the car and drove out to Alhambra to check on the boy. Forget he had this and take right, Joe. A real sleeper. Yeah. I'd like to know how the stepson missed that date with us this afternoon. Well, if the kid called us from the house, his stepfather could overheard him. Possible. Sister's house ought to be along this block, shouldn't it? Yeah, let's see. 1408, 1406. All right, Joe, a great cottage, 1402. Right. That's a nice-looking little place, isn't it? Well kept. Yeah, it's a nice neighborhood. I wonder how the lot prices run out here. Somebody's coming. Yes, what is it? Police officers, ma'am. Are you Miss Kelby? Bertha Kelby, yes, that's my name. Why? We talked to your brother earlier today, Miss Kelby. He said that you brought his stepson, Bruce, here to stay for a while. We'd like to see him. Bruce? Yes, he was here till about, oh, an hour and a half ago. I went to the store, and when I came back, he was gone. Have you any idea where he might be, Miss Kelby? Well, I telephoned my brother Eric's place just before you came to the door. He's not there. I don't know where he might be. I'm worried about him. He seems so upset. It's business about his mother's disappearance, you know. Do you mind if we came in and looked around, Miss Kelby? Well, no, not at all. We went in and looked the house over from one end to the other. There wasn't a trace of the boy. We drove back to Kelby's nursery and satisfied ourselves the boy wasn't there. Then we came back to Alhambra and we kept an eye on Miss Bertha Kelby's home until midnight. No one came or went. At five minutes past midnight, the lights went off in the living room and a few minutes later in the back of the house. The next morning, when Ben and I checked in for work as usual at 8 o'clock, we met with Captain of Homicide, Frank Kearney. What makes you two so positive there has been any foul play in this Kelby thing? Well, that's just it, Cap. We're not positive. It's a whole setup. It smells bad. For instance? That lawyer. If a man's innocent, he doesn't need a lawyer to sit with him in the interrogation room and tell him not to answer questions. Number two, that kid's telephone call. Maybe he doesn't get along with his stepfather. It happens, you know. Maybe he's trying to get back at him for something or other. Maybe. Then why is Kelby hiding him out? You sure he's hiding him out? No other way to take it, Cap. <laughs> the Kelby woman walked away from her home Sunday night. Nobody saw her. She took nothing with her. No clothes, no luggage, no money. You checked with the family doctor. Yesterday. He told us Mrs. Kelby was in perfect health. We double-checked the wanderer's file and the repeater's file and missing persons. Couldn't find her name in either one. How about her relatives in town? I haven't had a chance to talk to them yet, Cap. We'll check them this morning. Well, one thing's certain. The woman couldn't have gone very far. We checked the sheriff's office, the jails, the hospitals. We sent out a teletype and an APB. Every cop in the city has her description. She's been gone almost four days, but nobody's seen her. How does that add up to you? It doesn't. You better move on it. Check every one of Mrs. Calby's friends and relatives. Right, Frank. Then try the neighbors. As long as I've been a cop, neighbors have been able to tell everything about anyone. <laughs> All that day, Ben and I made the rounds. First stop was the Western National Bank, where Mrs. Kelby maintained her account. Her savings statement showed a total balance of $31,564.17. Her separate checking account had a balance of $842.71. At the Farmers Mutual, we found the record of an insurance policy issued to Agnes Trumbull Kelby. It was a 20-pay life policy covering the insured in the amount of $30,000. The beneficiary was listed as the insured son, Bruce Trumbull Kelby, if living upon the receipt of such due proof. If not, the insured's husband, Eric J. Kelby. 
the time we finished checking her financial status, the odds were piling up fast. From only casual reports, we knew that Eric Kelby was a frugal man. If he was greedy as well, if he wanted and needed money badly enough to kill, then he had all the motives necessary to murder his wife. Maybe his stepson, too. Ben and I started to make the rounds of Mrs. Kelby's friends and relatives. Our first stop was at the apartment of Agnes Kelby's sister, a talkative maiden lady in her early 60s. Agnes just isn't that kind. Oh, I'm worried sick about this. I really am. And Bruce, the poor lad, he must be heart sick. And Eric, what does Eric say about all this? He says he thinks his wife left him. Left him? Why, that's ridiculous. How strange. Can you think of any good reason why your sister would leave Mr. Kelby? I? Why, no. They had tiffs, of course, small ones. But, of course, there was that argument about Bruce. The two of them always seem to be arguing about Bruce. How do you mean, ma'am? Oh, well, raising the boy and all, you know. Last time I talked to them, they were kicking about whether or not Bruce should be paid for working in the nursery for Eric. And the strangest thing, Eric seemed to be so upset about it all. Imagine. All on account of paying the boy a few dollars for good, honest work in that silly nursery. Well, you know, I'm the outspoken kind, and I just told Eric. Eric, I said, don't be an old meanie. Pay the boy. That was the extent of the information which Mrs. Kelby's sister had to offer. Next, we called on an aunt, Mrs. James D. Trumbull, 83 years old. She could hardly understand our questions, let alone answer them. She hadn't seen her niece, Agnes, in a year. After that, we paid a visit to one of Mrs. Kelby's friends, a Mrs. Lillian Humboldt. Well, I'm sorry, Sergeant, but I can't think of any good reason why she would leave him. Unless that silly business about Bruce got out of hand. You know, maybe Eric is just a little jealous. Next, we called on Daisy McLeod, who worked as a day maid for Mrs. Kelby. Officer, what Mr. and Mrs. Shelby thought, what they said, what they did, it's none of my business. I come in the morning, I do my work, I do it well. I'm not the nosy type, and I don't try. I take half an hour for lunch, and when I'm through, I take my pay, and I don't expect tips, and I take the bus home. I'm not the peeking through the keyhole kind, sneaking around corners, listening. But what I couldn't tell you about that man. Exactly what do you mean, Miss McLeod? Oh, he's a hard man, you know. They're always arguing about the boy. Bruce this, Bruce that. He's a nice boy, I think. He's never done anything to me. Oh, but the arguments. Him and her all the time. Should the boy be paid for working? Shouldn't he? Why? Why not? When Ben and I finished with a list of Mrs. Kelby's friends, relatives, and employees, we started out on the neighbors. None of them saw Mrs. Kelby after 6 p.m. the night she disappeared. Two of the neighbors said they saw the porch light burning after 7 p.m., but both said the porch was empty. Mrs. Kelby was not sitting in her chair at the usual time after dinner. According to them, that was one of her habits. It was 10 minutes to 6 by the time Ben and I got back to the office. The light was still burning in Captain Kearney's office. Full day, Joe. Not a mile. Yeah. I wonder what the captain's hanging around for. Let's find out. Get anything? Pretty good luck, Cap. Good. I've got some more for you. Just walked in five minutes ago. What do you mean, Frank? Who walked in? Bruce Kelby. He's waiting in the next room. We went in the next room and met Bruce Kelby. He was small for a 17-year-old, dark-haired and a little on the sickly side. He told us that he couldn't keep the date he made with us on the phone because his stepfather apparently did overhear the conversation and drove him directly to his sister's home in Alhambra. We asked him why he was so sure that his stepfather was responsible for his mother's sudden disappearance. For one thing, all three of us usually go to the early show on Sunday night. Eric, Mom, and me. But last Sunday, Eric said he wasn't feeling good and he wanted Mom to stay home and take care of him. Then he told me to go on ahead to the show, so I did. What time did you get home, son? About 9.30, quarter to 10. Mm. What was your stepfather doing when you got home? Sitting in the living room, reading the paper. You notice anything unusual about the way he acted? Well, he was nervous and jumpy, more than usual, I think. Anything else? Yes, sir. When I came in through the front yard, I noticed the dogs had mud all over their paws. They'd been out somewhere in the nursery plots. And they won't go out in the plots unless Eric's with them. He doesn't want them to trample the seedlings. What would your stepfather be doing out in the nursery at night? Does he usually do some work at night? No, sir. None of the plots are even lighted. Only the greenhouses. And the paths in the greenhouses are usually graveled, aren't they? No mud around. It's my job to see that the greenhouse paths are kept gravel. I know they're not muddy. I, I fixed them the day before, a Saturday. What do you think it means, son? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to think about it. I, I just know he's done something. He's done something to her. 
Did your stepfather give you any reason for keeping you away from the police officers the other day? No, sir. He said people were getting nosy, and he said it might be better for me over at Aunt Bertha's. She's his sister. Do you think your Aunt Bertha might know where your mother is? No, we hardly ever see her. We don't know her well at all. We've heard your mother and your stepfather argued about whether you should be paid for your work in the nursery. When I started to work for him, he promised he'd pay me. I was saving up to buy a 31 Model A. And then after a couple of months, when he didn't pay me, I asked him. He told me I ought to be glad to work for him for nothing. And your mother argued with him over that. Sure, it was her money that bought the nursery anyway. How'd you get away from your aunt's place last night? Well, Bertha had some shopping to do, and she left me alone. She locked the door to my room. Even the screen over the window in my room was nailed down, but I kicked it out and got away. I uh, stayed at a friend's house last night. Thought about where you're going to stay tonight? I don't know. But I'm not going home. And I'm not going back to Bertha's place either. I'll get a room. How'd you like to stay at my house a few days? Sure nice of you, sir. Maybe I'd better not. Mom might not like it. Oh, I'll take care of that. Now let's hop out and get some dinner. Sure darn nice of you, sir. All right, son. Come with me. What do you think, Joe? He could be lying. Yeah. Now what, Cap? Shall we bring Kelby in again? No, not yet. He's found out by now from his sister that the boy's gone. He probably figures the police station is the first place he'd come. Wouldn't do much good pulling him in now, Ben. We couldn't even question him. Ten to one, his lawyer would be waiting for us when we got back. That's the problem. How do we get to this, Kelby, without his lawyer finding out? Well, what about the early morning, Cap? Say tomorrow, about 5 or 6 a.m. Think you'd be looking for us then? Yeah, that might do it. We can just get by that pack of hounds he owns without waking the whole neighborhood. Might work. If we could just question him alone. I've got an idea it wouldn't take much to make him cop out. All right, give it a try. Get out there in the early morning and bring him in for questioning as quietly as possible. I'll be in at 6 a.m. If you want me before then, call me at home. All right, Frank. Kelby's got a smart lawyer. It's going to be plenty hard to convict him without a body and corroborating evidence. He's got four acres out there, Cap. You can hide a lot of bodies in four acres. Well, that's what I mean. This case isn't ending. It's just beginning. The next morning, Ben and I met at the office about a few minutes past 4 a.m. We had a cup of coffee and a donut at an all-night restaurant, and then we started for the Kelby place out on Belasco Road. We took four pounds of fresh horse meat with us to keep the dogs quiet as they raised a fuss. It was 28 minutes past 4 when Ben pulled the car to a stop a few hundred feet from the gate to the Kelby nursery. We got out of the car and made our way down the road to the gate. I reached in and tried the latch. It was padlocked. The dog started in. Okay, Ben, looks like we'll have to jump the fence. Toss some of that horse meat over to him. Yeah, yeah. here. That's it. Come on, let's climb. Keep an eye on those hounds. Looks like they could chew your legs off. Yeah. Here comes the third one, Ben. Toss some more meat. Yeah, there you are, boy. Go get it, go get it, boy. Look, Ben, light's going on in the house. Come on, let's make it fast. Who is it? Who's there? I'll set the dogs on you. Police officers, Mr. Kelby. What? What are you doing out here this time of night? You're under arrest, Kelby. Get your coat. You cops are asking for a peck of trouble. Get your coat. Where's my stepson? What have you done with him? What have you done with your wife? You're going to pay for this. I'll have your job. That's not the first time we heard that, Kelby. Let's go. Lights burning in the captain's office. Yeah. All right, Kelby, in here. I'm free for this. Mark my word. Ben, take him in the office here and stay with him. I'll see if Frank's in yet. All right, Joe. Come on, Kelby, inside. Friday, you bring in Kelby? He's down in the interrogation room. Ben's with him. Somebody saw you. Don't think so. They must have. Kelby's lawyer is sitting in the next room. Kelby again refused to answer any questions without the advice of his attorney. We released him. That day, Captain Kearney sent out two men to keep an eye on the nursery and report on all of Kelby's movement. Shortly after 7 o'clock that night, just after nightfall, we tried once again to bring in Kelby for questioning without his lawyer's knowledge. It didn't work. A little after we booked him, his lawyer obtained a writ of habeas corpus. We had to release him again. 
The two men assigned to stake out the Kelby place reported definitely that somebody was tipping the lawyer whenever unknown visitors showed up at the nursery and drove off with Kelby. There was nothing we could do about it. Next morning, Kearney came up with a lead. I had a long talk with the boy last night. Accidentally, I think he's given us a pretty good lead. Yeah? There's only one way we'll ever get a conviction. That's by finding the body and evidence to tie Kelby in. Yeah, that'll do it. Where do we start looking? In a new rose bed next to one of the greenhouses in Kelby's nursery. Hmm? The kid came up with it last night. How come? First, Kelby's crazy about saving a dollar and making one. Yeah. In the nursery trade, especially where you have a limited area to work in, like Kelby, you cultivate every foot of ground. Every bit of soil you've got is planted with something. Mm Mm-hmm. Kelby's not the type to waste anything. Especially he's not the kind that would let ground life fallow when he could plant something that might bring in a few dollars next season. Bruce tells me his stepfather has every inch of those four acres planted. Every inch. Except a six-by-nine-foot plot of ground in that rose garden. Oh, that sounds like a long shot to me, Frank. The boy said he prepared that piece of ground for planting late Saturday afternoon. His stepfather wanted it ready for Sunday morning. The plot of ground's still vacant. Might have planted it yesterday, Cap. When's the last time you checked? Mm, before I came to work this morning. I called the men on stake out next to the nursery. They told me the plot's still empty. Mm-hmm. It's worth a chance, Frank. When do we look it over? Tonight. I don't want Kelby or his lawyer to know a thing until we find that body. Well, how are we going to work it? We'll order up a crew from the crime lab. They can take probings through that plot and all around it. They can tell us without any guesswork how deep that ground's been worked over lately. When do you want to start? Be here in the office at 8.30 tonight. If my hunches are any good, we'll find the body. It was ten minutes past nine that night when we got to the Kelby place. Lieutenant Lee Jones and his assistants, Kearney, Ben, and two other men from Homicide. The men on stakeout told us that Kelby had left about 20 minutes before in a dark blue coupe. Ben brought along the usual supply of horse meat for the dogs so we didn't have any trouble there. We found the empty plot of ground in the rose bed next to the greenhouse, exactly as Bruce described it to Kearney. Ground's been worked over all right, boys. At least four to five feet down. All right, Lee, let's start digging. Romero, take care of the dogs. Watson, grab one of these shovels. Right, Cap. Hey, mm-hmm. you ever said these dogs were vicious, didn't he? Yeah, why? Look at these hounds. They're no more vicious than a lively cold, look. Higgins, get that light over here, will you? Thanks. What is it, Lee? Let me see. Teeth. A set of false teeth. Been in the ground long? Don't think so, judging from the shape they're in. How far down would you say, Yarley? A couple of feet. Ground's real soft. Lee, come here a minute. What is it? Body. Here's the shoulder. All right, you men over here with Watson. Get the dirt off the face. Romero, you got a picture of the Kelby woman? Yeah, I'll cap it. Let's see. Oh, here it is. Thanks. Get the light down here. Then she paid off, Frank. That's her. Ben and I went back to the car and notified communications to broadcast a want for murder on Eric Kelby. His description, together with the description of the car and license number of the car he was driving, was rebroadcast every 15 minutes. Then we went back to check the house. We found the front door unlocked. We went inside and looked around. In one bedroom, we found clothes scattered over the bed and the floor. There was only one old suit remaining in the closet. On the table next to the bed, we found an airline's timetable. We got to the phone and notified communications to alert all police details at railroad stations, bus terminals, and airlines, and then to send out an APB on the teletype. After that, we checked with the airlines. One of them told us that a man answering Kelby's description had booked passage for Mexico City. The plane was scheduled to take off at 10.40 that night from Burbank Airport. Ben's watch said four minutes past 10. We called the detail at the airport and alerted them. Then we drove over to check in person. It was 10.35 p.m. when Ben and I took up our positions just inside gate three, where passengers were boarding flight 72 from Mexico City. He's cutting it close, Joe. Got about four minutes more to make that plane. We waited. The crowd got thicker as departure time came closer. At 10.39, Eric Kelby came through the main entrance, across the terminal, through gate three, into a pair of handcuffs. Ah, I don't understand. What does this mean? We found your wife's body, Kelby. What? I don't know what you're talking about. In the rose pack next to the greenhouse. Your lawyer can't help this time. Mexico City. Would have been a nice trip. Expensive. I'll plead insanity. I didn't know what I was doing. Be a nice vacation next year, Joe, Mexico City. I'm going to talk to my wife about it. I didn't mean it. She slapped me. We were arguing about the boy. I didn't mean it. I don't know if you did or not, Kelby, but you killed her. Come on. You missed your plane. 
The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Eric Kelby was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He is now awaiting execution in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 14th in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to William J. Weston, Jr. of the Washington, D.C. Police Department, who on the evening of March 4th, 1945, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. <laughs> Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, you'll want to listen to Richard Diamond, private detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell. A pet note show usually heard at this time has moved to a new time period on Sunday night. Be sure to hear Larry Douglas and Kay Armin on the new pet note show tomorrow night on NBC. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A 22-year-old girl has disappeared. A letter has been received. It demands $30,000 for the girl's return. The letter is signed, The Wolf. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, October 18th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief detective. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the staff's office, and it was 3.26 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Got those mud gas for you. Here they are. Thanks, Harris. Backstrand leaves you? In a minute. I'm going out with him. What's the address out there, the Sullivan place? 814 Castro Boulevard. You go straight out Santa Monica, take a left at Castro. I remember. You ready, chief? Yeah, man. Friday, you call Romero yet? Right now. Get on it. This one we don't fool with. Yeah. Come on, Harris. Sorry to wake you, Ben. This is Joe. How you feeling? Oh, hi, Joe. What time is it? 3.30 a.m. How do you feel? Oh, a lot better. Be back to work tomorrow. You'll be ready in 20 minutes. I'll pick you up. 20 minutes? Okay, what's up? You remember Martin Sullivan, vice president of the Third National Bank? Sullivan? Yeah, yeah. What about him? He's got a 22-year-old daughter. Well, he had one. She's gone. Time, Joe. Where are we heading? Sullivan home out on Castro Boulevard. Ed's out there now with Harris. Mm. Any leads to work on? No, nothing so far. The girl disappeared a little before one o'clock yesterday afternoon. At eleven last night, he got a letter. They want thirty thousand dollars. 
Sullivan hasn't got that kind of money. Yeah, I know it. Poor guy's almost out of his mind. Fill me in. How did it happen? Well, the guy took the girl out of business school. He had her called out of class. Told her her father was sick, said he was a friend of the family. And how about the teachers? What was their story? Said the girl didn't want to go with the man at first, but he finally talked her into it. Kept telling her her father was dying. That's about as low as it come? Yeah. Did he use a car? Witnesses said it was a blue sedan. They didn't get the license number or the make. Did they remember what the guy looked like? About 5'9", 160, brown suit, dark hair. Hmm. Nothing else? No. Here's a copy of the letter. The usual. Read it. Yeah. Yeah. I have your daughter, Judy. Get, uh, what, what's that? 30000 $30,000 quick if you want her back alive. Don't call police or I'll kill her. Contact you later. Signed, uh, what was it? A wolf. Oh, a wolf, huh? I can think of a better name. Come on, here we are. You've got the original note, Joe. You know. Lee Jones down at the crime lab. He's checking it for prints and handwriting. Well, if it was... Oh, hi, Dave. Uh, right on the house, boys. Just waiting for you. Thanks, Dave. Hi, Joe. Ben. In the living room. Oh, thank you. That's the way I see it, Mr. Sullivan. Now, you understand exactly what you have to do? Yes, sir. I'll do as you say. All right. Here are the two men who will help you. Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero. Homicide. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you do? How do you Mr. Backstrand, I... Uh, I are you sure about all this? He, he might get frightened. He, he might do something to Judy. I... Believe me, Mr. Sullivan. It's the only way. I know how you must feel, but you can't do anything else. Oh, all right. I, <clears throat> I want to see Mrs. Sullivan first, I... I'll be ready in a moment. Any developments? Yeah. Come on back in the dining room. There it is on the table. Second note from the guy. Mm, telegram. When did this come? About half an hour ago. Guy phoned it into Western Union from a public booth. Couldn't trace it. I see. Yeah. yeah. Be at Elysian Park, 5 o'clock this morning, near Balkan Drive. Come alone. Bring 30,000. We'll return girl. Don't tell cops. Kill her if you do. The wolf. 4 a.m. now, Skipper. Not much time. I know it. We'll have to do as he says. No other way. Then Sullivan's going out there alone? You're going with him. You and Romero. You'll be hidden out in the trunk of the car. Any plan? Get him. That's all. <laughs> out the back door and into the Sullivan garage. We jammed ourselves into the trunk compartment and Harris closed the door on us. The latch was fixed so that the door could be pushed open from the inside. A few minutes later, Mr. Sullivan came out, got in the car, and we drove off. At three minutes to five, we pulled up at the meeting place in Elysian Park. We waited. Nothing happened. At five minutes past five, it started to thunder. That's all we need now. Thunderstorm. Stuff in here in this trunk, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Ben, listen. Oh, must be. I wonder if he's seen anything. Sounds like he's pacing up and down alongside the car, doesn't he? Yeah, that's right. Can't hear anything else. Can you? No. You better stay undercover. Yeah. The rain was dark, man. I wonder what happened to the wolf. Cold feet, maybe. Let's wait it out. Joe. Yeah. What time you got now? Move over a little. Let me get my watch in. Yeah. A little past 5.30. Sergeant. Sergeant. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Do you think he's coming? He's asleep. It's getting daylight. We better wait it out, Mr. Sullivan. Now, look, don't come back here again. If he's watching, you might tip him off. Oh, oh all right. All right. Where's your anchor? Yeah. I hear it. It's coming up the road toward us. It's stopping. Yeah. Coming over to 
our car. You ready? All right. Don't feel the sound of it. They're coming back here, and I'll watch it. Sandy, Romero. That you, Ed? Yeah, the meeting's off. Come on out. All right. <laughs> Got a cramp in my leg. I'm cramped all over. Mr. Sullivan, drive back home. We'll contact you then. Oh, all right. Oh, all right, Chief. Ben, Joe, come on over to the car. What's the story, Ed? The guy had no intention of following through with this meeting tonight. Well, how come? He told us. He phoned at 5 o'clock. Tried to trace the call. He wouldn't stay on the line long enough. What did he have to say? He wanted more money. Bragged about how smart he was. How we'd never get him. But he knows Sullivan's called in the police. Sure. Said he didn't care. We'd never get him anyway. Yeah, pretty cocky. Pretty smart. Take my word for it. He's no dummy. Control 1 to 80K. Control 1 to I'll get it. 80K to control one, 80 k to control one, go ahead. 80K, go to your office, go to the Go to your office, go to the Get ready to go. All right, Romero, let's roll. More than 12 hours have passed since word of Judy Sullivan's disappearance has been phoned in the homicide. During that time, an all points bulletin containing the descriptions of the suspect, his car, and the girl have been sent out on the teletypes to law enforcement agencies throughout the area. The same descriptions were broadcast over the police radio every hour. The Sullivan home has been placed under strict surveillance, and Mr. Sullivan instructed not to contact the suspect without knowledge of the police. He'd raised almost $10,000 in cash to buy him off. The serial number on each one of the bills has been copied by a police stenographer and then rechecked by a homicide officer. So far, the wolf, as he called himself, had made three separate contacts, but he'd covered his tracks well. We knew that he was somewhere in the city, 500 square miles of it, and we knew we had to find it fast. It was 18 minutes past six when we got back to homicide. Hi, Chief. Hello. You got something for us, Mike? Here, this letter. Special delivery. Came in about 25 minutes ago. Can I see that, Mike? Yeah, that's him. Yeah, according to the postmark, he must have mailed it right after he grabbed the girl. Mm, listen to this. Stay away from Sullivan. If the kid's found dead, it's your fault. Stay away, the wolf. All right, Mike. Get it over to the crime lab and have Lee check it for prints. Right, Chief. Lee find any prints on the second note, Mike? Two. Running through R and I now. Friday, Romero. Get down there and see if they got a make. I'll call out to Sullivan's and check with Harris. Right, Ed. Let's go, Ben. Who's watching the Sullivan house beside Harris? Uh, Carpenter and Davis. Max Stan's afraid the girl's father's trying to make a deal with the guy. Has he tried it yet? No, he hasn't yet. You couldn't blame him if he did. Worried sick. Oh, yeah. Here we are. Hi, fellas. Just coming down to see you. You got something, Larry? Those two prints Lee Jones listed off that letter. Got a make on them from the single print file. Good, Larry. Let's see, huh? There it is. Pull the whole package on them. Donald Alfred Keeper. Looks like a real bad one, doesn't he? Donald Alfred Keeper, male, Caucasian, age 29, 5 feet 8 inches, 170 pounds, brown eyes, dark brown hair. He had one previous arrest for forgery in Los Angeles 10 months before. Keeper's occupation at the time of his arrest was listed as bank clerk at the Third National Bank. Ben went back into the files and pulled the crime report. Then we called Ed Backstrand. There's the answer, Skipper. At the time Keeper pulled that forgery job at the bank, Mr. Sullivan was one of the vice presidents. Mm, go on. Sullivan was the one who preferred charges against Keeper and thought that he was prosecuted. Where's this Keeper now? Well, let me see. He was placed on probation, and on May 16th this year, he returned to his home in Omaha, Nebraska. That's 1380 Mackinac Avenue. All right, Romero. Get Omaha on the phone and have him check out Keeper. Right, Skipper. Friday, take Keeper's package and this note down to Don Myers. Have him check the handwriting. And get over to the crime lab and see what Jones lifted off that last letter we got. All right, Ed. The faster we work, the faster we'll put this guy behind bars. Now move. How's the writing compared, Don? What'd you find? It yeah, looks good. See you? Plants as crosses. Double oops as L. Open A's. Pressure on the downstroke. Donald Kiefer, the wolf. Same handwriting. <laughs> Lifted three prints off this last note, Joe. Brought them out to the iodine fume gun. They match with the first. Thanks, Lee. Did you find anything else? I don't know. It'll help you much. We examined the paper for watermarks and texture. Both notes are written on the same kind of paper. Impressions show both pieces of paper from the same tablet. Check the density of the carbon and the pencil they used. Both specimens match. Same pencil. <laughs> By mid-afternoon, Donald Keeper's description had been broadcast throughout the area. Bulletins were dispatched to all departments, and an APD was teletyped to the entire state. 
Men were stationed at every post office in the city to watch for notes that might come through the mail. The bus depots, railroad terminals, the airports, and all the main roads leading out of the city were under strict surveillance. The entire Los Angeles area was broken down into single square mile districts and a house-to-house -house canvas was started. A squad of men were assigned to cover each square mile. Outlying towns and cities were requested to do the same. By 5 o'clock that afternoon, the greatest dragnet operation in the history of the city was underway. We were sure Donald Kiefer was somewhere inside. At 12 minutes past 5, Ben got the call back from the Omaha police. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. 6X-ray 419. Nebraska place, right. Well, thank you a lot. Yeah, bye. They had a make on the car. Lots more. The Omaha cops looking for Kiefer, too. Want him for a robbery there two months ago. Yeah. And that robbery used a stolen 1939 blue sedan. Nebraska license plate, 6X-ray 419. Well, how about his family and his friends back there? They all been checked? Yeah, they said Kiefer left Omaha about six weeks ago. Didn't know where it was heading. Well, get that car description of communications, huh? APB, teletype, and broadcast. I'll tell him. Yeah, right, Joe. Right in, Romero. Yeah. What are you tied up with? We well, just got a call from Omaha. Make on Keeper in the car. Give it to me. You two get out to the Sullivan house as fast as you can. See Harris. What's happened, Skip? Martin Sullivan's disappeared. <laughs> How'd it happen? About three this afternoon, Mr. Sullivan got a phone call. Said he had to go down to the bank. I went with him. He had me wait in the reception room, and he went in his office. After waiting ten minutes, I got suspicious and went in. He was gone. That's it. Did he get any more money? This morning. Five thousand dollars. You get the serial numbers off the bills? Yeah. Shouldn't let him get out of my sight. Forget it. Right now, we've got to find out where he's gone to meet Kiefer. You talked to Mrs. Sullivan about it, Harris? She says she doesn't know anything about it. Let's try her again. Come on, let's go inside. Hi, fellas. Hi. Where's Miss Sullivan, Dave? Back in the sitting room, lying down. Doctor's with her. Come on. What time you got, Ben? Mm, 6.35. I'll get it. Hello? Well, where are you? Oh. Where are you now? Where are you now? We'll be right out. That was Martin Sullivan. He met with Kiefer. Of Morro Canyon. Did he get his daughter back? Yeah. Wrapped in newspapers. All cars in the area were notified that a contact had been made with Kiefer. We got in the car and drove out to Laurel Canyon. The entire area had been blocked off. We found Martin Sullivan standing in the middle of the road at the end of East Winding Way. 500 feet down the hill was a private residence where Sullivan had telephoned him was the only building in the immediate vicinity. A few yards beyond the point where East Winding Way ended, back in a clump of tall grass, we found the body of Martin Sullivan's daughter. We notified the crime lab, and she was back stranded in the corner. Despite a severe state of emotional shock, Martin Sullivan tried to tell us the story. He said, Judy was all right. I believed him. I wanted her back. Judy. Tricked the officer, the one watching me, said, come along, no police. Did you see his car, Mr. Sullivan? I wanted her back. I wanted you to back. I... I did as he said. I drove here at six o'clock and I waited. I put the money on the front seat, like you, like you said. Did he get the money, Mr. Sullivan? And I... I got out and left parking lights on. I stood up there by the end of the road, waiting. Mr. Sullivan. And he drove up. He took the money. Then he came up to me. He had a gun. I wanted to shoot him. Had a gun. Did you see his car? He said she was up there beyond the road, tied to a tree. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan, did you see his car? I went to look for Judy. <laughs> he drove away. She wasn't there.
Before he went into a state of complete collapse, we showed Martin Sullivan a picture of Donald Alfred Kiefer. He definitely identified him. The information was immediately relayed back to Central Division, rebroadcast to the entire police radio system. A teletype was dispatched to sheriff's offices, and communications were sent to police stations throughout the country. The house-to-house -house search throughout the entire city intensified. The dragnet in which we hoped to trap Donald Kiefer was drawing slowly inward. It was 12 midnight. Friday, did the papers get a list of the numbers on that ransom money? Yeah, it got them in the final net edition. Two and a half pages of serial numbers. Gave it a big spread. Look at these pictures of Kiefer here. All over the front page. The more the better, Romero. I hope this town never forgets that face. Good reminder. We don't make deals with killers. Hi, right, fellas. Come on over. Find anything yet, Lee? I'm checking over these towels here. Found them wrapped around the girl's body inside the papers. Funny thing about those papers. What's that, Lee? They're all yesterday's. Every story about the girl's disappearance has been clipped out. Maybe the guy's making up a scrapbook. How about the towels, Jones? Any laundry marks? Not a one so far, Ed. Every one of them was clipped off. Pretty smart. The morgue post the body in? They're doing it now. Yeah, nasty one. Yeah. Did you get any footprints or tire marks out where they found the body? Lots of them. All cast. Bossy and Taylor are checking them now. One thing. What is it, Jones? I don't know. I'm going to see him here. This towel. Wait a minute. Joe, that pair of slippers there. Yeah. There you are. Thanks. Just back under the seat. There. That's one tag he missed. Any markings, Lee? Yeah. Greenway Apartments, Los Angeles. One look at the apartment was enough. In an adjoining garage, we found the car which Keeper had used, a blue sedan. Nebraska license plate 6X-ray 419. When we got back to the office, Chief Baxter and immediately issued a cancellation of the warrant order for the blue sedan. And then he ordered a detail of men to stake out the car in the event Keeper decided to come back for it. Here's the coroner's report, Joe. Oh, let's see it. Hmm. Cause of death, strangulation. Time of death, Monday, October 18th, approximately 2 p.m. One hour after we grabbed it? Uh, I can't be right. Skipper in his office? No, he's out for a minute. Hey, Joe, Ben, take the call up 2503, will you? Thanks, Mike. Go ahead. Would you give me the call on 2503, please? Thanks. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, when? We'll be right over. Some of the ransom money, Ben, just showed up. Beverly and Highland. Come on. The man's name was Ralph Donahue. He operated the used car lot on the corner of Beverly and Highland. He told us that early that morning he sold a dark blue late model coupe to a man who gave his name as Fred Sims. The man paid for the car in cash. Donahue told us that he checked the serial numbers on the bills after the man had driven away. Serial numbers check out, Joe, every one of them. If I only thought to look, officer, and you know I generally do, I'm the suspicious kind anyway, but, well, this morning I must have been asleep. We got the full description on the car, Ben? Yeah, Joe. All right, let's get it on the air right away. I saw his mug in the paper while I was waiting for you. Too late. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Ten minutes past three that afternoon, another piece of the ransom money turned up at a busy downtown department store. The clerk was unable to remember who gave her the bill. The detail throughout the general downtown area was strengthened. The house-to-house -house search of the entire city for Judy Sullivan's murderer went on. The afternoon dragged into the early evening. At 20 minutes to seven, Ben and I had a hamburger and a cup of coffee in the drugstore at East Broadway and 3rd. And then we got back in the car, checked with communications, and started cruising the neighborhood again. At nine minutes to eight, a man answering the description of Donald Keeper was seen crossing Sunset Boulevard just below Highland. Seven minutes later, the same man was reported near the intersection of Hollywood Boulevard and Las Palmas. Communications relayed the information. At 21 minutes past eight, our car, 80K, along with a dozen others, were concentrated in the Hollywood Boulevard area from Gower Street to La Brea, Franklin Avenue to Santa Monica Boulevard. At 24 minutes past eight, Another piece of the ransom money was passed at a cigar store on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Hawthorne Street. The number of men and radio cars in the area was redoubled. Plain clothes officers were stationed at every intersection to keep an eye on pedestrian traffic. At 18 minutes to 9, the dark blue coupe which Keeper had bought that morning was spotted parked in an alley just below Hollywood Boulevard and Coinga. We called Ed Backstrand. City Hall. 2503. 2503. 
chief of detectives all this hand. Is Friday Mike the chief there? Yeah, wait a minute. He's just going out the door. Ed, it's for you. Thanks, friend. Friday, Ed. Just spotted Keeper's car, the one he bought this morning, parked in an alley off Coenga. Harris and I are on our way up there now. We'll take care of the car. You take care of this call. Just came in. What do you got? The theater on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Fairview. The girl in the box office just took in a $10 ransom bill. Yeah. She got a good look at the man who passed the bill. She says it's Keeper. <laughs> All right, Ben, come on. Yeah. You've got the list of serial number? Right here. Let's check at the window. Yes, sir. How many, please? Police officers. Sergeant Romero, Sergeant Friday. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Rayburn, the police are here. Would you step around to the side door, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. Margie, relieve Francis for a minute. Francis, come here. Bring that $10 bill with you. Sharp girl, officer, that Francis. Sharp. Here it is, Mr. Rayburn. Um, all right, Sergeant. There you are. $10 bill and the list of serial numbers. Check out all right, Ben. That's it, Joe. Good work, man. You reported the man came in about a half hour ago. You're sure it was Kiefer? Yes, sir. I had his picture in the box office just behind the change machine. I recognized him right away. And as far as you know, he hasn't left the theater. That's right, sir. All right, Mr. Rayburn. I'm sorry. I'm afraid we'll have to interrupt the show. Anything you say, Sergeant. Anything. Ben, you keep an eye on the front exit. I'll call communications. All right, Joe. 80K to Control 4. 80K to Control 4. Control 4, clear all frequencies. The Sullivan murder suspect, Donald Kiefer, has been located in the theater on the southeast corner of Hollywood Boulevard in Fairview. Have all units surround the area. 80K, Roger. Attention all units. Attention all units. Assist 80K at the theater on the southeast corner of Hollywood Boulevard in Fairview. The Sullivan murder suspect has been located in the theater. Call ahead, 80K. Control 4. Have all units converge in the general area, Hollywood Boulevard and Fairview. Unit 62R to block off the intersection at Hollywood Boulevard and North Cherokee. Stop all pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Unit 61A to block the intersection at Hollywood Boulevard and Hudson Street. Stop all pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Unit 71 and 72R to block the alley behind the theater. Unit 66 and 67R to assist at main entrance to the theater. Within a few minutes, the one-half-mile area around the theater was completely blockaded. Every exit and entrance to the theater was covered. At 9.23, we met Harris and Ed Backstrand in the theater manager's office. Backstrand outlined our plan of operation. At 9.28, a detail of 14 men walked down the side aisles on the main floor of the theater and took up their posts on either side of the orchestra pit. The picture was stopped and every light in the theater was turned on. Ed Backstrand, Harris, Ben, and I went down the aisle and up onto the stage. Backstrand made the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry to interrupt the picture, but this is important. We're police officers. We've traced the murderer of Judy Sullivan to this theater. He is in this theater now. And we're going to search the theater row by row, and we'd like to ask your cooperation. There's no need to be panicky or afraid. Those who wish to leave now may do so. Leave by the main entrance. Each one of you will be checked as you go out the door. And for the benefit of the man we're looking for, don't try to escape. Every exit is covered, and the entire area is blockaded. Don't place any more lives in jeopardy. Come on, Ben. Backstage, Joe. We can make it from there. All right, let's go. Come on, hustle it, Ben. Yeah. The next building. You'll probably try to jump for it. All right, watch it. I think this girl leads out to the roof. There he goes. All right, keeper, hold it. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. I give up. Throw your gun down. Over here. Don't shoot. Don't. Let's get him. All right, coppers. I got it figured. They won't top me for this. Didn't know what I was doing. Put the cuffs on him, Ben. Get away from me, you crumb. Ooh. You shouldn't have hit him, keeper. Ooh. All right, Ben. Try the cuffs now. Yeah. Come on. Let's get him in out of the rain. What's the hurry? Why spoil a good rain? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Donald Alfred Keeper was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. <laughs> You have just heard the 15th in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton.
Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Deputy United States Marshal John B. Glenn of Boise, Idaho, who on the morning of July 31st, 1940, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. Theater Guild on the Air returns tomorrow night on NBC. Other in NBC's great parade of new shows. <laughs> NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Homicide Bureau. A police officer has been shot, mortally wounded. One of the suspects has been apprehended. The other is still at large. Your job, find him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, November 16th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, two of the detectives. My name's Friday. It was 11.58 a.m. when we got to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, second floor, room five. Treatment room. All right, made good time. How's Ben, Mr. Doc? Got to the lungs, Ben, three times. He's going fast. His wife with him? They bring him down now. Can we talk to him? Then make it fast. Come on, Joe. Yeah, this way. John. John, it's Friday in Romero. They want to talk to you a minute. No. Doc. Doc, it burns. My chest. Burning up. Nurse? Yes, doctor? Are the hypodermics? Uh, yes, doctor. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right, fellas. Don't take too long. John, it's Joe Friday. Can you tell us how it happened? Joe. Joe. How did it happen, boy? Can you tell me? Can't figure it, Joe. Why'd he do it? We gotta find out. Now, how'd it happen? I don't know. I was directing traffic. East Broadway and First Street. Gray Cooper. Pulled up for the stop. Gray Cooper. How many men in the car? How many, John? Two. <coughs> Gray Cooper. Pulled up for the stop. In the pedestrian... Pedestrian lane. Went over. Gonna ask him to back up. Back up out of lane. Just gonna ask him. Yeah, John, and then what? Driver. Dark hair, eyes. Dark. Went over, gonna, gonna ask him. Back up. Pointed a gun. No reason, pointed a gun at me. All right, easy, John. Take it easy. No reason, Joe. No reason he fired. Hurry it up, Joe. Yeah. No. What about the other man in the car? Did you see him? Can you describe him? Yo. Yo, did you get him? Great coupe driver. Guy with him. We've got the driver, John. He's upstairs. The other one got away. We gotta find him. You gotta help us. My wife. Somebody send for Dora. She's on her way. She'll be here in a minute. Now, can you tell us the other man in the car? What did he look like? Great coupe. What did he look like? Don't press him, Joe. <laughs> Great coupe. The driver. Where had a gun? Dark hair. Yeah, Dark hair. I know the other man, John. We got the driver. What did the other man look like? Send for Dora. Come on, Ben. Thanks, Doc. Okay. You going, Spray? Yeah. John got any kids? Two. Always pick a family man. The 
thing's got a phony ring to it, Ben. You don't just pull a gun and shoot a man. Not if you're sane, you don't. Here's the stairs. The guy we got is as sane as they come. And how do we explain it? All I know is that hood shot John Bemis, and I want to know why. Mm. Might be a lead in that car he was driving. Maybe. Come on, here we are. Phone message for you, Friday. Came in a few moments ago. Thanks, Davis. From R and I. They got to make. Take a look. No make or warrants on James Vickers, Greg. Let's talk to him. Come on. Yeah. Minor wound, Joe. Bullet penetrated the fleshy part of his hand. Didn't touch the bone. Thought this guy had an arm wound, too. Just a neck, man. That officer you shot, Vickers. He's dying. Is he? He's a family guy. Got a wife, two kids. Has he? Why did you shoot him, Vickers? Ask him. We did. Then you know the reason. Said there wasn't any reason. That's right. Look, we're going to make you on this, Vickers. You know that, don't you? I don't know anything. Why'd you shoot him? Shut up. Why'd you shoot him? Joe. Yeah. Davis? Yeah? Stay with him. Bye. Doc, get us an MT slip on this guy, will you? We'll be back in a minute. Come on. Man. All right, Joe. Have it ready. Too big, punk. Easy, Joe. Oh, easy nothing. I've seen too many good cops like Bemis cut down by punks like that Vickers. Getting mad won't help. Come on, down the stairs. Yeah. Back to see Bemis? Why? Just for the record. I want to see if the doc thinks it's okay for us to bring Vickers down. I'd like to have Bemis definitely identify him as the guy who shot him. We've got three good witnesses. An identification for Bemis will clinch it. I want to see Vickers get everything he's earned when he goes to court. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> he went fast, Joe. Yeah. Got his wife? Yeah. Did he make it in time? No. Did he say anything that it helped? No, it might. He said a prayer. <laughs> Two six two five. Two six two five. Auto records, Crowley. Joe Friday, Vince. What about a make on that car used in the Beamer shooting this morning? Yeah, Joe. I've been trying to get a hold of you. Where are you now? Georgia Street, second floor. What about the make? Car was reported stolen yesterday afternoon. Registered to Harold Simpers, seven one six Everett Street. Report said the car was taken from a parking lot at Grand and Wabash. Okay, Vince. Thanks. What about the guns they found in the car? Lee Jones still had them over at the crime lab. He's running them through. No words yet. No. You make out the impound report on the car, Joe? Yeah, recovery report, too. They're still dusting for prints. MT slip ready, Doc? Yeah, right here, Ben. Medical card, history, MT slip. You ready, Vickers? Yeah. All right, put out your wrist. Put the cuffs on him, Ben. Watch his hands. You saving me for the hot lights? All right, let's go. I'm not going to jail. You're in jail now. Looks like a hospital. Bars on the windows, aren't they? All right, come on. Give me a smoke. Here. Okay. Light. What do I get if I open up? No deal. Might talk, make it attractive. Who was the other guy in the car? Hitchhiker. I always give rides. Then why'd he run when we chased him? Maybe he was scared. You're part of a gang. Maybe. Who was the other guy? What's it worth? Oh, come on, Vickers. You're wasting our time. Where are we going? All right. My hand hurts. I want to call my own doctor. You hear me? Yes. That cop pulled his gun first. I can prove it. Yeah, down the stairs. Easy, huh? Where are we going? I said, where are we going? All right, what's it worth if I talk? I could tell you all about it. Let's make a deal. You'll tell us anyhow. Think so? All right, you, out the door. Uh, wait a minute, huh? Cigarettes out. All right, Ben, light it. Yeah. Nice of you guys. Thanks. Oh, oh, get up, Ben. Stop. 
He's crossing the street. Fire over his head. Watch the crowd. Vickers! Joe, he's running for that car. All right, let's hold it, Vickers. All right, stop him, Vickers. He's stopped. Come on, Joe. All right, come on. Get back. Please. Let us through here. Let us through. Can I call a doctor, Joe? No, he wouldn't be interested. The guy's dead. James Vickers, murder suspect, address unknown, died almost instantly at 1.13 p.m., November 16th, while attempting to escape. His body was taken to the county morgue where it was posted. All the personal effects found on the body were listed by the coroner and a receipt for them given to our office. At 8.35 the next morning, Ben and I met with Chief Detective Zed Backstrand. Those four guns they found in the car Vickers was driving, they're all U.S. Army property. Where were they stolen from, Skipper? I don't know. Each one of the guns is stamped U.S. Army, that's all. Well, that makes it easy. The coroner find anything on the body? Nothing to tell us why Vickers decided to kill a traffic cop. What did Bemis say before he died? He was on traffic duty yesterday morning down at East Broadway and First. At 10.35, a gray coupe pulled up for a stop sign. Vickers was driving. Mm -hmm. Bemis started over to tell him to back up out of the pedestrian zone. Vickers pulled a gun and shot him. How'd they catch Vickers? Chased him three miles before he piled into a lumber truck. The guy with him got away. Fine. Check door and I. No make or warrants on Vickers. Kick back right in on his fingerprint. All right. What's your guess, Friday? I don't have one, Ed. Vickers could have been hopped up. Doc Stanley over at Georgia Street said no. He checked him. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Backstrand. Yeah, hold on. For you, Friday. Sure thing. Friday talking. Yeah. Yeah, good. Be right over, Lee. We're in business, Ed. Crime Lab just found Vickers' address. <laughs> It is, Joe. Thanks, Lee. Let's see, huh? Silver Dollar Hotel. Received a Mr. James Vickers, $6.50, room 345. Where'd you find it, Lee? Under the front seat, in with the tools. Anything else? Not a thing. How about prints? Two. Kind of smudged. Hope we can run a make with them. No prints on those four guns, Lee? Smeared. Not enough to classify. Yeah, this is it, Ben. That's all we got. Come on, let's see if we can make it pay off. We located the Silver Dollar Hotel on East Grand between 16th Street and Pico. It was an old type frame building with a brightly colored neon sign jutting out over the sidewalk just above the dark entrance. The manager's name was Luther Gage. We showed him a picture of James Vickers. He definitely identified him as one of his former tenants. He told us that Vickers had stayed at the hotel one week in room 345 and that he had checked out two days ago. Was Vickers staying here alone, Mr. Gay? Yes, alone, quiet man. Did he have any visitor? Maybe. Wouldn't know. Paid his bills. Spent most of his time away from the hotel. Good tenant. Did Vickers have any friends here in the hotel? Mm, maybe. Fell in the room next to Mr. Vickers. He still lives here. Two of them used to be kind of thick. Can we look at that room Vickers stayed in, Mr. Gage? Mm, let's see. Yes, it's still vacant. All right. This way. This man Vickers was friendly with. What's his name, Gage? Mm, Knight. Raymond Knight. Room 343. Is he in his room now? No. Went out about 8 this morning. Here's the elevator. How well would you say Knight and Vickers knew each other? Couldn't say. Good tenants, both of them. Pay their bills. Did they go out together? Seem to know each other well? Wouldn't know. I don't pry. Look, this case involves murder, Mr. Gage. We told you that. We'd appreciate your cooperation. Cooperation? Don't pay the rent, Sergeant. Third floor. This way. Here. Three, four, five. Open it up. Mr. Nothing. Pretty clean, Joe. All my rooms are clean. You didn't mean it that way, Mr. Gage. I wonder if you'd show us Knight's room now. That's next door, isn't it? Hmm, I don't know about this. Poking into other people's rooms. Not regular. Neither's murder. Come on, let's go. Does Mr. Knight have this room to himself? Sure ask questions, don't you? No, Knight has a friend staying with him. About two weeks now. Not in much. Be in now? Don't think so. Oh, I... Ben, watch it! Oh, rough, that's you! Oh, oh, oh. Bad shot, Mr. Gage, look out! Come on, get up! Ben, 
Dad? He's out cold. Look what you've done to the room. I thought you said Knight wasn't in. He isn't. This is his friend. Great friends. 45 automatic in his hand. 38 snub nose in the bureau. Another 45. Look in his bag. I don't pry. He pays his bills. Good tenant. Yeah. Can I get outside on this phone? Mm, yes. All outside calls are 10 cents. Yeah. Here. Have to keep the book straight. Sure you do. Who's going to pay for the damage? Ask Mr. Knight's friend here. Well, say... Why worry? He pays his bills. Good tenant. I called Ed Backstrand, and he sent out a special detail to stake out the hotel and bring in Raymond Knight if and when he returned. Ben and I drove to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital where Doc Stanley patched up the cut on Ben's scalp and treated Raymond Knight's friend for simple cuts and bruises. From papers found in his wallet and in the hotel room, he was identified as Frank Gannon, 9896 Wasatch Street, Kansas City, Missouri. When we got to headquarters, we had Gannon taken to the interrogation room where we questioned him briefly. He told us that he was a self-employed watch salesman, and that he was in the city on a business trip. He admitted friendship with Knight, but not with Vickers. We booked him at the county jail for assault with intent to commit murder. The three guns found in the hotel room were turned over to the crime lab. We reported back to the office. Show my head's pounding like mad. That Gannon's a mean. Yeah, it's a nasty crack. I got some aspirin in my desk. Might help. You know. Hi, boys. Rough day. I don't get much rough already. Message for you on the desk. Oh, I'm gonna eat. Starving. Right, Jason. What is it, Joe? Mm, Joan's got to make on those prints he lifted off the car. Let's see. Yeah, something else to know on James Baker. Uh -huh. Wanted 10, 14, 43. Desertion, U.S. Army. That could account for those stolen army guns. Yeah. What about the make on those prints Lee found? Let's take a look. Vance Taylor. Good solid record. Four burglaries. Two armed robberies. Two assaults. Wait a minute. Here's the mama sheet. Mm -hmm. All right. Born so and so, age 36. Height. Mm -hmm. Alias John Fields, Harold Grant, Tom Bissell, Joe. Hey. Yeah, alias Raymond Knight. The other man who rode in the car with James Peters the morning he shot down traffic officer Bemis finally had been identified. Vance Taylor, alias Raymond Knight. Well, that still didn't explain the unprovoked murder. It didn't explain the four guns found in the car or the three guns found in the hotel room. An assortment of arms like that could mean something big, but we didn't know what. Gannon's sudden willingness to shoot it out in the hotel room meant something, too. We didn't know what. We had Gannon brought back to the interrogation room. Hi, Gannon. Have a seat. Everything all right? I'll bet you're worried. No, we're not worried, Gannon. You ought to be. Don't make me laugh. You're tied in with Raymond Knight. That's enough for us. You send me up for it. We're going to try. Big talk. How long did you know Vickers? I didn't. Oh, funny. His prints are all over one of those guns we found in your room. I'm not worrying. Then well, you better start, Gannon. Vickers and Knight killed him. If you run with him, your hands are dirty, too. My room was Knight, that's all. Knight didn't come back to the hotel. Where is he? We're not that close. You share your guns and your friends. That's close enough for us. I don't know, Vickers. You mean you didn't know him? I said I don't know him. We got Vickers, Gannon. He's dead. Good story. Okay. Come on, Gannon. Let's get out of more. Down this way, Joe. It's cold today, isn't it? Yeah, it's damp. Bad sinus weather. No. What is all this? Never seen a corpse before? No, I, I'm not in this. Take me back. I don't want to look. You can close your eyes. Take me back. I don't want to look. Here we are, fellas. Slam 45. This way, Gannon. I, I get sick. I don't want to look. Throw back the sheet, Fred. <sighs> Take a no. good look, Gannon. No, he's Knight's friend. I'm not in it. Who is in it? I don't know. I... Take me out. I'm sick. All right, Fred. Thanks. Okay, boys. Interrogation room, Friday. Joe, on stakeout at the Silver Dollar Hotel. No sign of Raymond Knight. Keep you posted. Okay, Dave. Thanks. How long does this go on? I can call a lawyer, you know. And you better call one right away, Gannon. We just picked up Knight at the hotel. He's incriminated you. You're a liar.
Sure. Like we were about Vic. We'll prove it to you, Gannon. The officers are on their way in now. They're going to put Knight in the next room. You can listen to him. Look, I came here to sell watches. I ain't in this. Gannon, you and Vickers and Knight were planning a job, a big one. We know that. You want to wait till you get on the witness stand to tell your story? It's all right with us. Well, didn't take too long to break this one. Smoke, Joe? Yeah. Thanks. Gannon? Smoke? What are you going to do? Nothing. There's still a little time. They bring in Knight. You haven't got Knight. I haven't unwrapped him yet, Joe. You want to check me out? Okay, open him up. Mm-hmm. Give him a good shuffle, huh? You're going to have some time on your hands, Gannon. Want to learn a new card game? No. Nah. Suit yourself. Good game for two. Better with three. Sure, a lot of coin. Yeah. You got two decks there. First off, this game is quite a bit like gin rummy. Yeah? There are eight of every suit. Four jokers. Jokers count 50 points. Mm-hmm. Red threes count 100 points each. If you get a black three, you can freeze the deck. Oh, I see. I shouldn't say deck. In this game, they call it the pack. The pack? What's a pack? Well, it's the discard pile. Same as in gin. If you get a red three, you can freeze it. No, it's a black three. Well, what happens when you freeze it? Nobody can pick it up. Oh, I see. All right. Let's see a lot of dummy hand here. Fine game, Gannon. Sure you won't change your mind? You don't want to play, Joe. All right, now I'm two-handed. You deal out 15 cards, see? How many can play? As many as six, I think. I've only played up to four. You play partners with four? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, got your cards. I catch 15. Mm-hmm. 14, 15, right. Now, now what do I do? Well, I guess you better lay your hand open. That'll be the easiest way to show you. Okay. Let's spread them all out over there. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't have a great hand there. You got a couple of black threes. You can use those. Yeah, that's fine. They count 100 apiece. No, no, no. Those are red threes. Black threes don't count anything. Oh, red threes. That's right. Do you remember what black threes are for? Yeah, you can use them to freeze the pile. Pack. That's right. The pack. Well, you know what I mean. All right, now, look, you see, I got a joker here. Jokers are wild. Do you remember how much they count? They're wild. 100 points. No, red threes are worth 100. Jokers count 50. You don't explain it very good. I don't understand. Well, how simple can it be? Gannon's not even playing. You get it, don't you, Gannon? Okay, red threes count 100. Jokers count 50. Black threes, you can you can freeze the, pi- uh, the pack. Yeah, good. Now, hold on to that, will you? Now, black threes freeze the pack, but that's not the only card that can do it. No? No. Deuces can do the same thing. You see, the only difference is if you use a deuce, which is also wild, you have to have a natural pair in order to pick up the pack. Now, with a black three, it's only it. good until... I knew it wouldn't work. It was sour right from the start. Baker's killed a cop. Ben, I'm not in it. Stenographer. I'm right, coming on. I'm taking no raps. Johnny, the stenographer. Right, Ben. All right, Gannon. Too late. You haven't got time. 20 after 1, they're going to do it. Do what? Payroll. Brazier Company. Messenger leaves at 120. He's got the payroll. 30 grand. They're going to get him. Where does the messenger leave? 120. You're too late. I'm not in it. Where does he leave? 120 leaves the bank, I think. No, maybe the company. Where's the company? Third and Spring. They're going to get him. Where's the bank the messenger goes to? Up the block, Second National, Third and Hill. Where are they going to get the messenger? By the alley, Clay Street. I'm not in it. Ben, check it. Get out of communications. Have him put out a call to block out the area. Give him the details. All right. Johnny. Yeah, Joe. Stay with this guy. Davis? Davis. Brazier. Brazier. Manufacturing. Olympia. Good afternoon, Brazier Manufacturing Company. Give me your payroll division. There's a police department emergency. Oh, what's this, sir? Your payroll division. It's an emergency. One moment, sir. Come on, hurry up. Mr. Hopkins, this is Sergeant Friday, Police Department. We've had a tip your payroll messenger is going to be held up today. Has he left your building yet? The messenger? Yeah. Oh, my, he left early today. Went out the door about ten minutes ago. Thanks. Second National. Second National. Second National. What's your order? Friday, what's all the excitement? Did you break that guy in? Wait in a minute, Ed. No time. Hmm. Good afternoon, Second National. Give me the manager on duty, please. Emergency. One moment, please. One moment. Come on, come on. 
I'm sorry, sir. The line is busy. Would you get away? Give me the chief teller. Thank you. Chief teller, Waters. This is Sergeant Friday, Police Department. Emergency call. Has the payroll messenger from the Brazier Company left the bank yet? Well, uh, I wouldn't know, Sergeant. Uh, just a moment. I'll have your call switched. Yeah. Operator. Beatrice, would you give this call to Miss Chalmers? Uh, it's important. Thank you, Mr. Waters. Miss Chalmers, good afternoon. Miss Chalmers, what's the matter, Friday? Are you sick? Yeah, I'm sick. Miss Chalmers, good afternoon. Miss Chalmers is a sergeant, Friday, police department. Has a payroll messenger from the Brazier Company left the bank yet? From Brazier? Why, yes, not more than two or three minutes ago. And he had the payroll with him? Of course. Thanks. Got a tip on a payroll stick. Are you coming? Then yeah, let's go. Ben, down this way. Coming. Let's hustle it. Down the stairs. Communication get the story? You got it on there now. Where's this Brazier Company? Third and Spring, about five blocks from here. Come on, here's the garage. All right, come on, hit it. Let's make time. Get the radio on. Just warming up. All units. Attention, all units. On 3rd Street, corner of Play Alley, 211. A bad messenger. Suspects are headed west on Play Alley. Suspects are armed. Code 3. 11R, take a call. Cars are closing in fast. 4th Street up ahead, Ben. Might meet him at this end of Play Alley. Hold on. Pretty quiet at this end. Not much you can do without. Hey, hey, look. Coming out of the alley now. Guy with the police. Brown coat. Guy with him. Pull up, Ben. Let's go. All right, you two, hold it. They're running for it. Come on. Ben, what's this about? Let's go. Come on, they're losing it. I see him up ahead. They're turning on the hill street. Romero, come on. Where are you, Skipper? You see him, Joe? Heading for the subway terminal. Yeah, they're going into the crowd. Don't lose them. All right, I'll take the ramp to the left. Then go with him. I'll take the one to the right. You see him, go. No, I lost. Now, wait a minute. There they are. Over the turnstile. Come on. Go. Go. They're off the platform. They're crossing the tracks. That's not one of them. Come on. Over the turnstile. Come on, there. Go the other gun. Down into the tunnel. He's crazy. Come on, after him. Hug the side. He's trapped, Ben. There's a train coming through. You, come back. You're trapped. Ben, get out. Hug the side. You all right, Joe? Yeah. Not for you. Mm-hmm. You want to check? No, I don't think it's any use. Yeah. Well, let's go. I wonder why he tried so hard, Joe. I don't know, Ben. Some people are like that. You can blow the whistle all you want. They never know when to stop. <laughs> just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Frank Gannon, the only surviving member of the holdup gang, was tried and convicted of the crime of assault with intent to commit murder. He is now serving out his sentence at the state penitentiary. <laughs> You have just heard the 16th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Private Richard H. Taylor of the Washington, D.C. Police Department, who on the evening of December 13th, 1946, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. <laughs> came to you from Los Angeles. Phil Harris likes a great deal about the South. We like a great deal about Phil Harris. For instance, we like his beautiful blonde wife, Alice Faye. In fact, we like the Phil Harris-Alice Faye show, and it just happens that it returns to the NBC air tomorrow. Why don't you take our advice and listen to one of the funniest shows around anywhere? That's the Phil Harris-Alice Faye show tomorrow on most of these same NBC stations. You're tuned for the...
stars on NBC. NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide. A mad killer is loose in the city. In every instance, he leaves the murder weapon behind. There are no fingerprints, no clues to the killer's identity. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was off duty reporting back in on an emergency call. It was 3.57 a.m. when I got to the basement of the city hall. The carpool. Let's go, Friday. Sorry to call you back in. Couldn't be helped. All right, Ben. Okay, Skipper. What's it, Ben? Double murder. When? I don't know. Found out about it oh, 40 minutes ago. Got any ideas? Roughly same M.O. Was that 6413 Norwich, Skipper? No, 6430. What do you mean, the same M.O.? The same guy. Brick that killer. How many does this make? Counting tonight, four. We got anything at all? A smudged fingerprint. We can't even classify him. Sounds like a smart operator. We gotta get him. We have to shake down the city from one end to the other. Big job, Skipper. Big killer. At 4.26 a.m., we pulled up in front of 6430 Norwich Drive, a small group of bungalow apartments facing on an oval-shaped garden court. Two uniformed officers were stationed at the door to the apartment. Hiya, Chief. Hiya, fellas. We went inside. Wellbert from Homicide was waiting for us. This way. In here. Well, there they are. Yeah. Mother, daughter. Joe, on the floor beside the bed. Yeah, a red brick. <laughs> Miss Hafters, we know how you must feel about all this, but would you please try to answer a few more questions for us? Yes. All right. Oh, Margaret. Miss Hafters, how long have you known Mrs. Diaz and her daughter? Nine years. This November, they moved next door. I remember it so well. We got along right from the start. And as far as you know, the only close friends the mother and daughter had live right here in the apartment court? Yes. Margaret was a pretty girl, but she was no chaser, no boyfriend. Very close to her mother. The two of them, very close. Did they keep any amount of valuables in the apartment? Money, jewelry, things like that? Oh, no. Mrs. Diaz and Margaret didn't have much, you know. Very modest income. They both worked. And you can think of no good reason. Oh, no, no. Oh, poor Margaret, poor Mrs. Diaz, lying in there. Well, Berg. Yes, Sergeant. Would you show Ms. Hafters back to her apartment? Sure, Sergeant. Thank you, Ms. Hafters. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Oh, Mark. Oh, Mark. Well, Joe, let's check with Ed. He's back in the bedroom. You get anything from the neighbors? The usual, Ed. No jealous boyfriends, ex-husbands, nothing like that. Boys find any evidence yet, Skipper? I'm still working on it. You got any theories? 
Well, we know the killings were all done by the same guy. Mm -hmm. Cut the same pattern out of the window screen. Cut the same pattern with a glass cutter out of the window. Reaches in and flips the lock. All right, where's that leaving? Now, before he gets inside, he makes sure there are only women in the house. That means he probably watches the house for a few days. Yeah. Once he gets inside, he wants only one thing, to kill. He's never taken any valuables. As far as we can tell, he's never searched for any. What kind of a man works like that? I think the guy's kill crazy. Hey, fellas. Yes, Donnie? Here's a break. Two fair prints. One thumb, one forefinger. What'd you get, Pete? Only got nine points. Not enough to go into court, but enough to make him. We'll know him when we get him. Yeah. Found the prints on the lens of the old lady's eyeglasses. Probably knocked him off the night table when he went after her. And when he was done, he put him back on the table. Yeah. Had blood on his hands, see? Yeah. That's funny, isn't it? Why would he go to the trouble of picking up the woman's glasses after he killed her? We'll ask him when we find him. Hi, Ben. Joe. Might have something for you. We can use it, Link. Hold it just a minute. Yeah. Crime lab, Joan. Yeah. Yeah, all right. I'll tell him. Right, Ed. Backstrand. If you're through checking the victim's clothes by 8 o'clock, you can knock off for sleep until noon. What if we're not through? Take it up with the chaplain. Here's what I wanted to show you. Over here. A couple of cash. Bare footprint. That's right. Those from the Diaz place? Found them outside the dining room window in the flower bed. Take a look. Mm-hmm. Good cast. Size 9. 10. Uh, missing toe there, huh? Left foot, first toe. That's lucky. Well, the guy took his shoes off before he went in that house. That's the way it looks. You leave any other prints, Lee? Three, with the shoes on. Here they are, here. Yeah. How would you say the guy is built, Lee? Oh, from the impression, pretty heavy man. There's no full length of stride, or I might give you an idea of his height. How about the bricks, Lee? Here they are, all three of them. Used this one in the first murder, this one in the second, this one last night. Leaves them around like calling cards, and there's no way to check them. You'll never get a fingerprint off a common red brick like this, Ben. The surface is too rough. Well, we got an idea of his weight. We know that the first toe's missing from his left foot. That's something. The one we had yesterday. We can check that missing toe in the amputation file, Joe. Yeah. Well, we better get back. Pete ought to have those prints ready, too. Thanks a lot, Lee. Okay, fellas. Hey, they post the bodies yet? Yeah, they're doing it now. Same as the first two. The brain? Concussion, hemorrhage. They didn't have a chance. Hold it a minute. Crime lab, Joan. Sure, just a minute. Either one of you fellas. I'll get it, Joe. Okay. Pierre Romero. Yeah. Good, we'll be right over. They got a make on those two fingerprints. Okay, Joe. Single print file. Made him on the index finger. Let me see, Pete. Take a look, Ben. Yeah. Doesn't look like a killer, does he, Joe? Kind of nice looking. That's right, Pete. They said the same thing about John Dillinger. The name at the top of the make sheet read Carlos Richard Monterey. Male, Caucasian, age 19, height 5 feet 11 inches, weight 165 pounds, dark brown hair, dark brown eyes. Last known address, 1663 Naples Street, Los Angeles. Previous arrests, one. Auto theft, February 8, 1936. That was all. Ben and I had been expecting more. The information on the mama sheet for Monterey was 13 years old. So was the picture. So was the description. So was the address. In 13 years, a man can change in a thousand ways. So can his habits, his appearance, his address. In 13 years, everything can change except two things. A man's fingerprints and a physical deformity. Missing toe on left foot. Carlos Richard Monterey. Here it is, Joe. 1663 Naples. Yeah, come on. Somebody's coming. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. What is it? We're police officers. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, yes. Um, would you like to come in? Thank you, ma'am. 
Monterey. Would you mind telling us your name? Monterey. Isabel Monterey. What is it you want? You're married? Yes. My husband is Francisco Monterey. Would you explain why you are here? We thought you might be able to help us. We're looking for a man named Carlos Monterey. I don't understand you. We're looking for a man. We'd like to talk to him. Do you know where he is? Yes. Carlos is dead seven years ago. He fed my husband, Tony. And does your husband know Carlos, or did he know him? He was his brother. What about your husband's parents, Miss Monterey? Where are they? They're both dead some time now. Have you ever met Carlos? No, never. I have only heard of him. What have you heard of him, Miss Monterey? Do not ask me. This is important, very important. Francisco would not like it if, if I told you. It's important, Miss Monterey, believe it. Carlos is sick. His mind. For eight years, Francisco has not seen him, not heard from him. He thinks he's dead. But he only thinks so, Miss Monterey. No one has told him his brother's dead. He just thinks so. What else is there to think? Where's your husband now? At his work, his store, in the last street near Maine. Grocery. Monterey Carroll Grocery. Here's your change. Thank you, Mrs. Myers. Now, look, officers, you know how it is. You don't like to let these things get out. That's why I trust you. You can trust us, Mr. Monterey. We just want to check on a few things. Oh, fine. Always glad to help out if I can. Can you tell us if your brother was ever in a mental institution in his life? Oh, I know there was nothing wrong. 1923. Got a little bad, so Mom and Dad had to put him away for a while, just till he calmed down. I remember the day. Sometimes... Dumb, stupid kid. What do you know? Standing there by himself in the train, crying. Public nurse, stupid way he cried. What do you do? I cried too. I was only 10, Sergeant. I saw him go. He was alone. Later on, Mr. Monterey, your brother was released from the state institution. Yeah, he was 16. And then he started running around, playing tough, carried a gun, lived by himself. He never came around. He dropped from sight about... 1938. You haven't heard from him since then? Nothing. Never seen him. Do you know of anybody who might have seen him? Ooh, there was a girl he had. Uh, Anita something. On Soteo Street. Uh, Anita Martin, yeah, that's it. Soteo Street. Maybe she's seen him. Ask her. Maybe she's seen him. Carlos? Carlos Monterey? Uh, not in a year. Miss... March he was in, when I was working at the Peacock, down on South Main. He came in, we talked for a while, that was all. And you haven't seen Carlos for the past two months or so? I tell you, no. Has he written to you? Has he phoned you? No. Oh. One, three weeks ago he phoned. Here, he left a message with my girlfriend. But he didn't call back again. Now that's it, that's all I know. Thank you, Miss Martin. Here's our card. If he does call, uh, he'll let us know. Yeah, I'll let you know. You liked Carlos, is that it, Anita? Liked him? No, I didn't like him. He was funny, but he was nice. You know, I pitied him. Why did you pity him, Miss Martin? Well, he was a good fellow who was strange. He just could smile, you know. He had a nice smile, but you could tell he was never laughing. There was something in his mind. Something. Oh, I don't know. At least a year, closer to two, I haven't seen Carlos. No letters, not a card, nothing. He was in the East the last time I heard. When was that? A year ago, January. I was in here. Sent me a calendar. Sometimes he could get along fine, very well. Other times, terrible. He couldn't keep him down. How did he manage to stay out of jail that way for sending? I don't know. Sometimes he should have been in jail five times over. And you say you don't know of anybody who might have a recent picture of Carlos, a snapshot? No. No, no one I can think of. Okay, Vincente, here's our card. If you do think of somebody, let us know, will you? It'll help. Sure, glad to. If I hear of anybody. What kind of a day is it outside? Hot? Hot. By 5 o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I were certain of one thing. Carlos Monterey was in the city of Los Angeles, somewhere. We drove back to the office and told Ed Backstrand about our interviews with Monterey's relatives and his friends. 
Inquiries and requests for further identification and information on him were immediately relayed to the state mental institutions. The 13-year-old picture of Monterey taken from the files was copied and distributed with a note of caution as to the age of the photograph. An APB was sent out. Stakeouts were placed at the home of Monterey's brother, at the brother's store, and at the apartment of Anita Martin. A special detail of 300 men was ordered to join the dragnet already in operation. The details at the airport and the bus terminals were alerted, as well as the details at the Union Depot and the main post office. By 6 o'clock that night, almost 1,000 men were actively working at the job of tracking down Carlos Monterey. At 6.30 p.m., Ben and I drew a four-hour relief period. We drove out to Ben's place, and his wife fixed us some dinner. At 10.30 that night, we reported into the office, picked up Ed Backstrand, and we drove out to join the manhunt. We cruised with the dragnet operation until 5 o'clock that morning. Ben and I took turns driving. Actually, the tremendous job of scouring 500 square miles of city for one man was only beginning. Unless there was an unexpected break, the search for Carlos Monterey could wear on for weeks. It did. Night after night, the manhunt went on, and day after day, there was no break. Sixteen days later, on a Sunday night, I went to bed early. I read a while, and then I turned off the lamp and went to sleep. Hello? Righty talking. Sorry, Joe. Get in here as fast as you can. Hmm? What's the matter? That girl Monterey knew. The one you talked to? Yeah. She left her apartment, went to her girlfriend. Yeah? She's dead. There it is. Ordinary red brick. Down it by the body. How long has she been dead, Skipper? Well, she was seen alive about an hour and a half ago. Got three bare footprints, good length of stride. Found them down in the lot beside the house. What do they look like? Same guy. First toe missing from the left foot. The same weight impression. Should be about 5 foot 11. That checks out with what you got, doesn't it? All right, so it's the same guy. What about those shoes we found, Lee? Yeah, they correspond. They were impregnated with foreign matter. What'd you find? Articles of lettuce leaf, dry onion skin, traces of red cabbage. Maybe a vegetable counter. Maybe. What about the city wholesale market down on Front Street? What about any market in Los Angeles? No, Lee, that wholesale market is big enough to hide anybody. Hundreds of transients work in there. Some of them even sleep there. For a guy like Monterey, it'd be perfect. That's a fair guess. Check it when it opens. They open at 2 a.m. 2.30 now. All right, get back to the office and pick up as many extra men as you need. Get down there right away. Okay, Ed. Now, you know he's a rough one, so watch it. On Monday, June 23rd, at two minutes past 3 a.m., we pulled up at the city wholesale produce market. With the exception of 54 police officers in plain clothes who mingled with the buyers and sellers, business went along as usual. The market itself covered almost three square blocks in the lower part of the downtown area. It was divided off into hundreds of individual stalls by flimsy wooden partitions. To make the search even tougher, the place was crowded. For the first 45 minutes, we had the men circulate at random through the crowd on the chance that one of them might spot Carlos Monterey from the 13-year-old picture. It didn't happen. After that, we started a systematic canvas. We talked to the customers, we talked to the managers of the different booths, we gave them Monterey's description, we showed them his picture. Nobody recognized him. We checked the employment records one by one. Not a sign. Sorry, Sergeant. I'd like to help. I've never seen the guy. Okay, Mr. Snyder, thank you. We sure picked the sweet jobs, don't we? Oh, yeah, we could spend a year at this. Oh, Sergeant, Sergeant Friday. Yeah, Kamansky. Did you find something? The guy at the booth over there against the far wall. Thinks he might have hired Monterey a couple of days ago. Come on, Ben. Where? Over there, Sergeant. You sure on Monterey's picture? Yeah, he thinks it might be him. <laughs> Mr. Fresnetti, this is Sergeant Romero, Sergeant Friday. Yes, I told you, boy, Sergeant. This fellow Carlos, I hired him to help uh, last Thursday. Big rush for me now, so I hired him. You sure he's a man? In the picture? I think so. A little older, maybe. Oh, but I know faces. He's the man. You, you're looking for him? You say you hired this man last Thursday? That's right. It's a big rush for me. Now in the morning, I, I hire him Thursday. He worked uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. 
But he don't show up this morning, so I got to no use. It's too many men to pick it from. He don't show up, I let him go. What kind of work did he do for you? Same as he did for Schiller down there. Heavy work. Moving the stores, they're cleaning up. What kind of produce does Schiller handle, Mr. Franzinetti? Fancy, very fancy vegetable. It's a choice. New potatoes, expensive red onions. Schiller sells to the big hotel. Does Schiller handle brown onions, Mr. Franzinetti? Oh, only the best. Big dealer that Schiller sells it to the big hotel. How long has this Carlos been working around the market? Oh, I don't know. Is it just the like of the rest? First he worked for me, then uh, Largo Massini, then a Schiller. Hey, why are you looking so hard for him? He, he stole something? He murdered somebody. Him? My money? Murder? Do you have any idea where Carlos lived? Oh, me? No, no. And if he comes back here, I tell him to get out. I got nothing to do with this trouble. No, you'll tell him nothing, Mr. Fresnetti. Here's our card. If you see Monterey again, call us. Say nothing to him. Oh, sure, sure. Henry. Uh, Joe, call the chief at the office, will you? Message just came in. Thanks, Al. Come on, Ben. Yeah, there's a phone booth. See? No, I don't. Where? Straight ahead, little to the left. Oh, yeah. You got a nickel? Let me see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you are. Thanks. I'll see what Ed wants. Hi, Mike. Ed there. Ed, take it on extension two, will you? Thanks, man, talking. Friday, Ed. Move fast on this one, Joe. What's up? Main post office. Carlos Monterey picked up a letter le there less than five minutes ago. Come on, Ben. There's Ed over there with Welberg. Yeah. Traffic short jammed up around here. Hi, Ed. Friday, Romeo. You all set, Welberg? All set, Chief. Spring Street to San Pedro. Sunset the first. Got it covered. Good. What's the story? Post office detail tipped us off. Five minutes after eight, a man answering Carlos Monterey's description picked up a letter at the general delivery window. That was 16 minutes ago. Who spotted him? Sam Lane. Got a look at him just as he was leaving the window. Called to him to stop, but Monterey ran. Lane called me, and we threw a net over the area for six blocks around. And Monterey's still somewhere inside this area? I don't know how he could have gotten out. What's next? Well, I'll give him an hour to break for it. After that, we start a house-to-house -house search of the whole area. Stop all pedestrian and vehicular traffic for identification. You're going to jam up the depot traffic. That's cheaper than murder, Romero. Get going. The first hour, we counted off in five-minute segments. Like Backstrand, we felt close enough to Monterey to touch him. But he still wasn't there. The north and south ends of the blockade started to move in, slowly. Searching every store, every house, every conceivable place where a man might hide out. In the meantime, Ben and I worked the Spring Street side of the blockade, watching the faces of the pedestrians as they came through, one by one, examining all vehicles and their drivers. The morning wore on, the sun came out, and it started to get warm. By 11 o'clock that morning, Monterey still had not been found. The temperature was 93 in Los Angeles. It was still climbing. The search went on. At 10 minutes past 2 p.m., Backstrand made the round. How's it look, Skipper? Not good. Going slow. How much longer do you figure? I don't know. It'll go to after dark, that's sure. District down here is like a rat's nest. Yeah. Nothing? Nothing. But he's someplace inside this blockade. He's got to be. Any chance of getting relief for the men in our squad? Some of them been working straight through since yesterday. Uh, I'll see. Check with me around five this afternoon. Thank you, Skipper. Keep a sharp lookout. One slip. That's all it takes. The search went on. At 3 o'clock that afternoon, the temperature was 95. We sweltered and we waited. At 3.45, Backstrand sent a squad of men into the Union Depot to search it from top to bottom. There was one false alarm when one of the men thought he saw Monterey slipping out a side door into a taxi. He turned out to be a train conductor. At 25 minutes past 4, Backstrand passed along the order to our detail to start moving in, house by house. It was a tedious job and it went slow. The men were tired. At 5.30, the relief squad showed up. Ben and I stayed on. After another two hours of house-to-house -house searching, the trap was narrowed down to a three-square block area, a single block wide and three blocks long. It started to get dark. Backstrand ordered out batteries of floodlights. By 8 p.m., the cordon closed in around the last two-square block. Line for all set, Skipper. Ready to move. Good. What do you think? I will know pretty soon, one way or the other. Frank, keep that traffic moving. All right, you two, get going. See you later, Skipper. 
Joe, let's take a look in here. Okay. Sure is an old building. Yeah. Where'd Kamansky go? I don't know. He's here a minute ago. Oh, wait. There's his flashlight. Down at the end of the corridor there. He's signaling. Yeah, come on. Kamansky? Yeah. Down below, Sergeant, in the basement. Come on. Monterey? He's been there, I think. Yeah, this way. Where? Over here. Now, watch your step. The light's bad. There he is. Says he's the janitor. Oh, my head. He's been slugged. All right, come on. How'd it happen? Can you tell us? Yeah, a man, a big man hit me. I came down to empty the baskets. He hit me and ran. Ran over to the new building. The new building? Is that the one next door? Yeah, just a few minutes ago. Nobody's come out of this building for the past half hour. Every door in the place is guarded. No, no, not the doors. He went through the tunnel. I saw him. Over there's the tunnel. I'll take a look, Joe. Mm. Yeah, the tunnel. Next to two basements. Same company, old building, new building. Tunnel connects the basement. Joe, come on. Yeah. Kamansky, get out the back strand. Tell him what's happened. Right, Sergeant. Call an ambulance. Right. All right, man. Through the tunnel. Watch where you're going. The light's bad. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. That a door up ahead there? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Good. There's a stairway. Come on. Watch the doors. Joe, the elevator. They're both on the third floor. Let's head for the stairs. Ben, come on. One more floor. Yeah, right. Come on, hurry. Yeah. Look, top of the stairs. There you go. All right, hold it, you. Duck in the elevator. Joey's going down. Well, we'll never make it on the stairs. No, look. Another elevator. The control lever's bent. Let's try it anyway. Yeah. All right, kick the control lever. Kick it, Ben. That's good. All right, Ben, knock the lever back. Come on, quick. Yeah. What's the matter? No, it's jammed. We're going fast. All right, let's kick it. Here. Yeah. Now, that does it. Can you reach the door control? Wait just a minute. I'll see. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's still in the building. Both elevators are here now. Yeah. Down the hall, Ben, the office on the left, I think. Yeah. Hey, here we are. All right, keep clear of the door. All right, Monterey, put on that gun and come on out. I'll kill you! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! Okay, Joe, let's take it. Watch it, Ben. He's throwing everything he can get his hands on. I'll kill you! Come on! Come on! I'll kill you! Get away! I'll kill you! Oh, oh. All right, Monterey. Come on, you! Okay, Ben, take him. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> nice looking guy. Clean cut. Yeah. Doesn't figure, does it? What's that? My wife would say he doesn't look like a killer, does he? What's a killer supposed to look like? The story you have just heard is cruel. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Carlos Monterey was examined by five different psychiatrists appointed by the Superior Court and was found to be sane. He was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 17th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to motorcycle patrolman John Kramer of the El Paso, Texas Sheriff's Department, who on the afternoon of April 26, 1940, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. Dragnet.
You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. A gang of hijackers has started to work in your city. Truckloads of valuable merchandise have vanished. The thieves are clever, seem to have a foolproof system. Your job, find them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, March 6th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the record bureau, and it was 5.35 a.m. when I got to room 2A. Interrogation room. Read this to him, Ben. Yeah. 2,600 dozen nylon stockings, 45 bolts of silk, 58 cases imported perfume. Where are you dumping this stuff, LaValle? That's what we want to know. I told you the truth. I have nothing to do with it. I don't know anything about it. What was this stolen way bill doing in the cab of your truck? How many times do I have to tell you? I don't know. Your fingerprints are all over it. You must have carried it there. I didn't carry it there. Somebody's out to frame me. How many in the hijack gang, Lavelle? I'm not in a hijack game. I told you I don't know. When are you going to let me go? Who's the head of the gang? I don't know any head of the gang. I want to get out of here. You're covering for somebody. I'm not covering for anybody. You take the rap for all this, you're going to have a beard down to your knees by the time you get out. I'm not taking any rap. Then let's have it. I'm tired. $42,000 worth. You know who took it? You know where it is. They could have disappeared anywhere on their way from the east to a thousand places. Nothing was missing from those shipments when they came in on the train. Everything was there when they were unloaded at the warehouse. Then I don't know. I don't know. Every dollar's worth was accounted for when it was loaded on the truck. Well, where is it now? I'm tired. We've been here all night. Let me... Well, let me read it for you again. 2,600 dozen nylon stockings, 45 bolts of silk, 58 cases imported perfume. And you're trying to tell us somebody hijacked all that from the trucks without you knowing it? The trucks were loaded at the warehouse. We went out to eat. We came back, got in the trucks, delivered the stuff, and that's all I know. And while you were out eating, the receipts for the load disappeared, too. Is that right, Lavelle? I don't know where the way bills are. The shipping truck, that's his job. We talked to him. He says one of you could have taken the way. Well, then he's lying. I didn't take him. Then what was this way bill doing in the cab of your truck? I told you, I don't know. Somebody's trying to frame me. Why? I don't know. Somebody, I don't know why. Then you better come up with an answer, mister. Look, I'm tired. We've been here since six o'clock last night. We're all tired. Who are you covering for? What are you trying to build? I need that coffee left, Ben. It's cool. It's all right. You want some, Lavelle? No. Now, look, let's get one thing straight. We've been here all night. We can be here all day, tomorrow, the day after that, and the day after that. Yeah. we got enough to make you on this. You know that. We're going to stay with you. You tell us the truth, everything. I've told you all I'm going to tell you. We stay here for six months. You got it all. This is your home phone, Hillside 8321. That's right, 8321. What time's your wife get up, Lavelle? What do you mean? Ben, get an outside line. Yeah. You're not going to call my home. It's Hillside 8321, Ben. Outside, please. Don't do that. Don't. Not my wife. Please. All right. Ask the questions again. This time I'll give you the answers. Thomas Laval was 38 years old. He was a well-respected man in his community. Sometimes it's like that. You can question a man for hours, and he'll never give you any information. But somewhere in every man's makeup, there's a weak point. We were lucky enough to find Laval's. He told us that he would give us the locations where the hijacked goods were hidden. He told us the addresses were written on the ledge of a windowsill on the seventh floor of the Teamsters Union Hall. It was 8.30 a.m. On the seventh floor, is that right? Yeah. 
Do me a favor. Don't make it too big. Well, look, we have to walk through the hiring hall before we get to the elevators in the back. Yeah? These handcuffs. They'll see them, all the guys in the hall. They know me. Can't you take them off my wrists till we get in the elevator? Sorry, LaBelle. Well, I won't try anything, but don't make me walk in front of them with these on. Sorry. But just till we get in the elevator, can't you do that? I, I don't want the guys to see me. Well, here's my overcoat, LaBelle. Drape it over your hands here, and they won't see the cuffs. There you are. Come on. Hi, Tom. How are you? Hi. What's new, Tom? Not much. Let's take the elevator. Yeah. Cigarette? No, thanks. You? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Down this way. Let me show you. To the left. A window up ahead there. Yeah, this one. I don't see anything on the window sill. It's on the outside. Open the window and let me check. Yeah. Let me see you. Oh. Hey, ben, grab him. He's trying to jump. Hey, Get hey. back here. Get back. I go to you here. Go! Get him, Joe! I can't hold him. He's pulling me out. Hold on, Ben. Grab me. Joe! Joe! He's slipping! Try, Joe. Hold on. He's kicking loose. I can't hold him. Hold him, Joe! Ben! Oh. <clears throat> I couldn't hold him. You almost went with him. Let's get downstairs. What happened? Call an ambulance. There's been an accident. Thomas Laval was 38 years old. He was a well-respected man in his community. He died with the same reputation. We had a prisoner who'd met his death while in our custody. In cases like this, we had to have witnesses. By the time we got to the street, the usual accident crowd had gathered. Anybody here see the accident? What you want, witnesses? Yeah. Did you see it? Yeah, we saw it. Let's get their names, Ben. My name's Pete Garfield. This is Jack Morris. We'll be your witnesses. You'll probably be subpoenaed for the inquest tomorrow morning. Sure, we'll be there. We saw you push the guy out the window. We saw you kill him. The next morning at 10 a.m. in the basement of the Hall of Justice, Harold J. Lane, deputy coroner, city and county of Los Angeles, read the report of the findings of the autopsy on the body of the deceased Thomas Laval. As is customary at a coroner's inquest, the identification witness was called to testify first. Elizabeth Laval, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Be seated. State your name. Elizabeth Laval. What is your address? 1216 East Amarillo Drive. What is your occupation? I'm a housewife. What is your relation to the deceased? His wife. Have you viewed the body of the deceased in this office? Yes. Who was the deceased? Husband. Thomas Laval. Is there anything further you wish to add? Thank you. Step down, please. Joseph Friday. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Be seated. State your name. Joe Friday. What is your address? 4656 Collis Avenue. What is your occupation? I'm a police officer in and for the city of Los Angeles. Are you the investigating and arresting officer on this case? I am. Will you state briefly the facts relating to the death of the deceased? <clears throat> On the morning following the arrest by us of the deceased on suspicion of grand theft merchandise, he expressed a desire to assist us in the apprehension of suspects involved in these thefts and the recovery of property taken in them. Did he assist you? Well, he informed us that if we took him to the Teamsters Union Hall, that he'd be able to obtain addresses of the locations where the stolen property was cached. You then took him there? Yes, we did. 
What happened? When we arrived, he requested us to remove his handcuffs. We refused. The deceased then informed us that the addresses were written on a window ledge on the seventh floor. When we arrived at the window, under the pretense of searching for the addresses, he threw himself over the ledge. I grabbed his left leg to restrain him, but he kicked loose. Uh, did you at any time have any idea that the deceased planned such action? I did not. What did you do then? We immediately went to the location of the body and had an ambulance dispatched. Do you have anything further to state? No, I have not. Are there any questions from the jury? That's all, Officer Friday. Step down. Peter Garfield. Raise your right hand. Yeah. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yeah. Be seated. No. State your name. Pete Garfield. What is your address? 1654 North Pico. What is your occupation? Truck driver. Down at General Warehouse. Did you know the deceased? Yeah. How did you know him? I worked with him. And that cop's a liar, and so is his buddy sitting over there. Please confine the testimony of this inquest to facts. Were you present at the time the deceased met his death? I told you I was. And those two cops pushed Tom out of the window. Where were you at the time the deceased was pushed or jumped from the window? Jack and I just left the union hall. We were going out the front door when it happened. What attracted your attention? I heard him scream. When I looked up, Tom was falling. That cop was standing at the window watching him. Did you see the officer push him? Yes, I saw him. Did I understand you to say you were on the street outside the building at the time? Yeah. And you saw the officers push the deceased from the window on the seventh floor from your vantage point? Yeah. Isn't it true that that's a physical impossibility? What is? That you could have seen what you testified to from where you were standing. I know they pushed him. You know or you saw? I know that's so. I wouldn't jump out of a window. Then it's true you didn't see the officers push the deceased out of the window? No, I didn't see him. Is there anything further you'd like to add? They must have pushed him. Any question from the jury? That's all, Garfield. Step down. Dorothy River. Raise your right hand. Yes. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Be seated. State your name. Dorothy River. What is your address? 211 South Beverly Drive. And what is your occupation? I'm a stenographer at the Teamsters Union Hall. Were you present the morning the deceased met his death? I was. State where you were and what you were doing. I was in our office on the seventh floor doing some filing. Please state what you witnessed. The filing cabinet in our office is by the door. The office faces on the hallway and the door happened to be open. I heard a commotion and looked out. And I saw those two officers struggling with the man. Did you hear any conversation? Yes. I heard that officer there say, get back here, get back. The man outside the window yelled, let me go, let me go. This officer here, Officer Friday, said, he's pulling me out. Hold on, Ben, grab me. How far from the window were you? I'd say about 15 feet. Do you have anything else to add? Yes. As the two policemen started downstairs, Officer Friday said to me, call an ambulance. There's been an accident. Thank you, Miss River. Those officers didn't push that man out the window. They were trying to hold him. After hearing additional witnesses, the coroner's jury retired at 11.57 a.m. Eight minutes later, they returned with their decision. The deceased met his death voluntarily and by his own actions. The homicide detail continued the investigation of Laval's death. A week went by. With homicide working one side, we hoped that they might turn up additional leads in the hijacking case. Nothing turned up. It seemed that with the death of Thomas Laval, our leads came to an abrupt stop. On Tuesday morning, March 16th at 9 a.m., we got a call from Chief of Detectives Ed Backstrand. Now, once more, what about the weed bills on these shipments? You checked them? Everything we could. Talk to everybody and handle them. And talk to them some more. $42,000 in merchandise doesn't just disappear. 
And who's the last one to handle those waste bills? The warehouse shipment clerk. The bills were signed and stamped two hours after he filed them in his desk. They disappeared. What about the truck drivers? You checked them out? Talked to all of them. Nothing so far. Nothing was missing from those shipments until they left the warehouse. Is that right? Yeah. And somewhere in between the warehouse and the delivery points, $42,000 worth of goods disappeared. Somebody's got to be hijacking those loads. We know that. But how do we get to it? Maybe they're working alone. Maybe they're working with the truck drivers. It's one or the other. It's got to be. We just hadn't lost Laval. Well, you lost him. That doesn't close the case. You got a suggestion? Yeah, I got a suggestion. Crack it. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories from official police files. And now, an important announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to announce that starting next Thursday, October 6th, Dragnet will be brought to you by Fatima Cigarettes. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, the listener, for your excellent response to our efforts in bringing you these weekly authentic presentations of actual cases from official files. Your letters are the only indications we have that Dragnet is a source of your listening pleasure. We'd like to hear from all of you. Starting next Thursday, October 6th, over most of these same NBC stations... Dragnet will be heard weekly at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, immediately following the Supper Club. Check your newspaper for local release time. We stayed on the job. Another week went by. No leads. We spent so much time at the general warehouse where the merchandise disappeared that we almost got to be a part of the crew. We got to know everybody. We made frequent visits to the Teamsters Union Hall. It got us nothing. On Wednesday, March 26th, we reported in for work at 8 a.m. Friday, Romero. Yes, Skipper? You fooled around just long enough. They hijacked another load last night, $38,000. What outfit? Same, General Warehouse. Who's your contact down there? Ray Hobart, shipping clerk. Now hop down there right now and get the details. Right, Ed. There are two ways to solve this thing. Yeah? You can get those hijackers now or wait till General Warehouse goes out of business. Get on it. Hobart, who was the shipping clerk on duty last night? I was, uh, working for Siggy, Siegelmeister. He's out of the cold. <laughs> and you saw the stuff was loaded on the trucks, and you checked the way bill. Yeah, as usual. Everything as usual. Uh, checked the trucks out at 2 a.m., went back to the office, filed the way bills. You work a pretty heavy schedule, Hobart. You started at 2 a.m., and you're still on duty? Uh, it took the last four hours of Siggy's shift, at mm-hmm. 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. He had a cold. I was back here at 10 this morning to start my own shift. When did you find out the way bills were missing on that shipment last night? Uh, just before I went off. Maybe uh, half past five, quarter to six. Well, how about the truck drivers who handled that load, Hobart? You got them? Uh, let's see. I got it right here. Okay. Uh, here you go, Sergeant. Uh, Jack Morris and Pete Garfield. Jack Morris and Pete Garfield were brought in for questioning. We double-checked with Homicide and found that their reports on Morris and Garfield tallied with ours. No previous records. Both men had been tailed for a reasonable length of time since their testimony at the Laval inquest. Their actions failed to implicate them. Four days after the second hijacking, we got a tip from one of our informants down in the warehouse district. He told us that a man in a gray suit had been hanging around the coffee shop next to the Teamsters Union Hall. He was peddling nylon stockings, cheap. There had been other reports like this, which we had followed up, but none of them had paid off. Usually, such leads didn't pay off, but we couldn't be sure. They had to be checked. At a few minutes before five that afternoon, we found the nylon salesman in a gray suit in the back booth of the coffee shop adjoining the union hall. Look, man. Take a look. The finest. You can't do better. 51 gauge nylon. Look good, huh? Mm, Sure do, don't you, Joe? Yeah, they do. We've been looking for you, Max. Some of the guys in the union hall said that you'd be around. Sure, I saw lots of these around the uh, hall. Truck drivers, just like you, buying them like crazy. Good deal. Sure looks like it, man. How many pair can we have? Many as you want. Four bits a pair, you name it. You got a couple of dozen for us? A couple of dozen? Mm-hmm. No, not on me, but I can get them. Many as you want. Well, we're kind of in a hurry. Can you get them for us fast? A couple of dozen. Better make it three dozen, huh, Joe? Yeah, if you want. Three dozen. Can you get them now? A couple of hours I can get them. Same quality. Want to meet me here? Oh, I don't know. We wanted them for tonight. My wife's birthday, you know. Well, maybe an hour and a half. How's that? Three dozen, meet you here. Oh, look, Mac, uh, maybe we're both heading the same direction. Can we go with you and pick up the nylon? Save time for all of us. Uh, no, I don't think so. No. But can't you wait? Hour and a half? How's that? Never find a better bite. I'm sorry, Mac. I wish we had the time. Well, where do you have to go to pick up these nylons? Oh, way out. 
Sunset Boulevard near Fairfax. Can't you wait? I'll make it fast. Uh, can't we pay you and then go out and pick them up ourselves? Huh? No. Don't work that way. No. Can't you wait here? I'll make it fast. Uh, we ought to be home now, Joe. Yeah, I'm sorry, mister. We'll have to skip it. Yeah, maybe we can pick up something on the way home, Ben. Candy or something. Wife likes candy. Now, uh, look, fellas, I, I don't want to see you lose out on this deal. I'll meet you halfway. How do you mean? Uh, look, together we'll go out to Sunset and Fairfax, huh? Near the place. You wait there at the hamburger stand. And in five minutes, I'll bring you the stuff, okay? Oh, I don't know. We're late already, but... All right, it's a deal. I'll call the wife and tell her we're going to be a little later. Three dozen, is that right? Three dozen are the best. You can't do better. All right, I'll be back in just a minute. Chief of Detectives Office, Chandler. Mike, Joe Friday, Backstrand there? Out right now, Joe. Well, then do me a favor, Chandler. Make it fast. Get a couple of men out to Sunset and Fairfax as fast as you can. Tell them to watch for Ben and me. You got that? Yeah, what else? We'll drive up in our car with another man. Ben and I will get out of the car and go in the hamburger stand. The other man will walk off. Whoever you get, tell him to follow that man. You got it? Right. All right. Just tail him. See where he goes, see what he does. Okay, Joe, right away. All set, Joe? She got dinner ready? Yeah, just about. We better hustle. Sure. Best deal in the world. Let's go. At five minutes to six, we pulled up at the corner of Sunset Boulevard in Fairfax. It was almost dark. Ben and I got out of the car and started over for the hamburger stand on the corner. We caught a glimpse of Barcy and Kaplan, one of our detective cars, parked in a gas station on the opposite corner. They had their eyes on our man. When the traffic signals changed, the man crossed the street and headed down Fairfax. Barcy and Kaplan waited a minute, and then they took off after him. He turned at the next corner and disappeared from sight. Ben and I ordered a cup of coffee, and we sat down to wait. At half past six, we were still waiting. At five minutes to seven, I went across the street to the drugstore and called the office. Barcy and Kaplan hadn't been heard from. Their car, 105K, was not acknowledging calls. I had my call switched from communications to Backstrand's office. Well, they lost him, Friday. I don't know how they lost him, but they lost him. Well, who's out there now? Sullivan and Whitney took a detail out there. They're combing the neighborhood right now. Well, how did it happen? A man just doesn't disappear into thin air. That's what I keep telling you about that stuff that's been hijacked. The search for the nylon salesman went on all that night and most of the next day. From his description, we ran a make on him. No previous record. He had disappeared completely. We were right back where we'd started from. The only thing we could do was to start backtracking, requesting the people at General Warehouse, the truck drivers, the shipping clerks... We kept a close check on Garfield and Morris, and when we went back to the only possible lead still remaining, Mrs. Laval. She could tell us nothing more than we already knew. When we left her, we started on the neighbors for the second time around. For the rest of the day, we canvassed the immediate neighborhood. We got as many opinions of the Lavals as they had neighbors. At 3.30 that afternoon, we visited with Miss Gertrude Langster, a 50-year-old maiden lady who lived almost directly across the street from the Laval house. She got out of town the first time we covered the neighborhood. The old saying goes, Sergeant, there's no fool like an old fool. Oh, say, if I told you the chances I had when I was a girl... Yeah, but we just... Oh, not w- truck drivers like that. Laval man, God rest his soul. But fine, wealthy men, bankers, well, you... lawyers. Templeton Grant, you remember him? No, Thank ma'am. I was engaged to him once. Mm-hmm. Butterfly waist, that's what he used to call me. Well, Miss... well, I was slim in those days. Would you like to see some pictures of me as a girl? No, no, thank you, ma'am. We'd just like to ask you a few questions, that's all. Could you tell us if the Lavals had many visitors to their house in the past six months or so? Oh, my no. Funny thing, I am the nosy type, Sergeant. I like to know everything that goes on around my neighborhood. And you can take my word for it, the Lavals never had visitors. You know, Sergeant Friday, you remind me of a young man I used to be engaged to just a few years ago. Yes, Miss Langston. Now, would you tell us, please... Uh, did you have any reason to think that there was something little out of the ordinary about the Laval? Oh, little out of the ordinary, he says. But my dear man, yes. Here he was, a truck driver, and there she was with a home furnished like the Astors. Why, I even used to see him cart some of the things home in that car. His beautiful things, rugs and glassware, bolts of fabric. Oh, gorgeous. And he'd bring these things home after work. Is that it, Miss oh, Lansky? Any time, any time. Day or night, weekends, any time. Mm-hmm. After four, Joe, we better call office. Yeah. Are you sure of all that you've told us, Miss Langston? Sure. Oh, my dear man, of course I'm sure. I watched him week after week. Well, 
Thank well, you. Uh, won't you stay for a cup of tea? I'll have Josephine fix it. Josephine? No, thank you, ma'am. Well, then, uh, perhaps a glass of sherry? Thank you, no. But there is something. Yes? I wonder if we could use your phone, please. Oh, uh, yes. In the hall, next to the umbrella stand. Thank you, ma'am. Two five two three. Two five two three. Thanks, Trent. Righty, Ed. Nothing much here. Well, there's something here. Barcy and Kaplan just called. Pete Garfield left his house half an hour ago. Then he picked up Morris. What's so unusual about that? Nothing except the guy driving the car is the little man in the gray suit, the nylon salesman. Barcy and Kaplan are tailing him. Where are they now? Headed north out Riverside Drive. There was nothing out there but a golf course and a lot of riding stables. I don't care what they do for recreation. Go get them. <laughs> With red light and siren, it took us 12 minutes to pick up Barcy and Kaplan on Riverside Drive. At 4.23 p.m., we pulled up in front of the Blue Pony Riding Stables. Barcy and Kaplan's car was overturned just beyond the driveway leading up to the Riding Academy. Kaplan's hurt. I called an ambulance. They rammed us. What kind of a car are they in? They Swiss. They're driving a 12-ton Bulldog semi. Which way'd they head? Going north. Got a three-minute lead on you. Pneumatic commercial. Adam 653. Let's go, Ben. Can you see him, Joe? No, not yet. Watch that crossing. Up ahead, Joe. That's a semi. Can you read it? Wait a minute. Adam 653. That's them. Took a ride on Lancashire. Don't lose them. They're pushing that semi too hard. Look at that trailer sway. They'll have to stay on Lancashire. They're going too fast to turn now. Traffic's closing in up ahead of them. They better not turn. That's what they're doing. Look at that trailer whip. They're going over. Look at that stop front. <laughs> Come on, Ben. They're all right? Wait a minute. Let me see. Yeah, they're banged up, but they're alive. Well, there they are, Joe. Yeah. Garfield, Morris, little man in the gray suit. It's funny, isn't it? What's that? Garfield's going to swear we pushed that truck through that window. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Peter Garfield, Jack Morris, and John Dolfo, the stocking salesman, were hospitalized and later brought to trial. They were convicted on charges of grand theft and received sentences as prescribed by law. They are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 18th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Acting Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to motorcycle officer Elmer Forsman of the Fresno, California Police Department, who on the afternoon of October 6, 1946, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Remember, starting next Thursday night, October 6th, Fatima Cigarettes invite you to listen to Dragnet immediately following the Supper Club. That's 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over most of these same NBC stations. Check your newspaper for local release time. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. Judy Canova joins the star lineup of Saturday shows tonight on NBC. NBC.